welcome to day two of the MariaDB ServerFest 2021 edition. This is our second yearly MariaDB ServerFest, and on top of it, we have smaller server minifest on specific topics. Today, we have seven talks by six presenters, followed by Q&A sessions where the presenters are being interviewed. The presentations and the Q&As are prepared, so we could make the most of your attending your time attending them and so that we can free up the presenter to interact with you over Zulip chat while presenting so do take advantage of that today's first presenter is peter zaitsev the ceo of percona he comes with a brilliant comparison of mariadb 10.6 to mysql 8 and at the qa he and i will talk about what other databases to compare mariadb to then we have the eloquent steve shaw from Intel talking about benchmarking and being Q&A'd by Daniel Black of MariaDB Foundation. Very popular is also Marco Mackela with two in-depth technical presentations on locking and on crash safe DDL in InnoDB. Seth Shelnut will describe TileDB and its incarnation MyTile, a storage engine which for its use cases can deliver great response times. Jorge Torres will then give the latest on machine learning integration with MariaDB in MindsDB. The day will be concluded with a long and deep presentation on tracing. It's not the first BPF trace presentation by Valery Kravchuk of MariaDB Corporation, and it's likely not the last. It's a great way of understanding what's going on in highly complex troubleshooting scenarios. But now, let's start the day. Please go ahead, Peter Zaitsev. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or maybe even uh, good night. In those online conferences, you never know what time zone you folks are turning in. Today, I'm going to talk to you about MySQL 8 and MariaDB 10.6 and provide a comparison between those two wonderful databases. Now, this is going to be mostly high-level uh, comparison. And also, as a bonus, I am going to uh, uh, provide a little bit insight in the MariaDB 10.7, which just recently became available as a first preview release. Now, I think what is important uh, to note what uh, the MariaDB is not MySQL, at least not anymore. MariaDB started as a fork of MySQL, but that was quite a few years ago right now. And through that, MySQL and MariaDB have pursued uh, the different uh, paths and focused on the different things, as uh, I would show. And I think they are both very different, but both wonderful databases. Both of those have a very uh, loyal community and uh, customer base and uh, doing uh, quite great. Now, in this case, I also am going to frankly poke holes at uh, both those uh, technologies. From my personal opinions, I think they are both doing some things which are great and some things which, in my opinion, could be uh, done better. And if I'm successful, wherever you are MySQL, lover or MariaDB enthusiast, probably there will be certain things you disagree with, and that is mm, intention. With that, let me get started. So if you think about the development model, right, how are those databases are different? MySQL is owned and developed uh, by Oracle Co Corporation at this point. MySQL team, though, has a fair amount of independence uh, inside the Oracle. With that, the contributions are accepted, but I don't think they are as easy or sought uh, after as in some other open source uh, 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 technologies. And this is also uh, the open source, but more like a dropship open source. When there is a time for a new release, you will have the source code and uh, their uh, binaries 
are made available at uh, approximately the same time, but you cannot really see in the real time how their uh, sausage is made. And Oracle rationalizes that with what their big uh, uh, public company, there's a lot of uh, policies, they have to deal uh, with uh, security bugs or uh, critical crashing bugs and so on and so forth in a certain way, which, well, frankly, uh, is not quite uh, maybe compatible with the open source uh, approaches. MariaDB server is uh, released uh, and maintained by MariaDB Foundation. At the same time, development and roadmap is mostly driven by uh, MariaDB Corporation. There are also other major contributors in, uh, in MariaDB, but it's worth to note what MariaDB Foundation does not employ very large team of developers to drive independent uh, uh, roadmap. Contributions of that are very much encouraged. And that is what MariaDB is very much focused. MariaDB Foundation is very much focused on supporting those contributions and kind of chaperoning them into MariaDB. And development is done much more in public with a lot of uh, uh, discussions going uh, publicly, right? Uh, where you can attend a number of uh, Developers meeting uh, uh, with MariaDB. Well, at least you could until the <laughs> pandemic uh, hit. But there is, I think, important uh, difference in this case. So I was uh, mentioning uh, the MariaDB Foundation uh, yet, uh, and this is uh, something I took from MariaDB uh, Foundation website just recently, which highlights what MariaDB Foundation is and what is, uh, its, uh, uh, its uh, goals are. Now, I think for you, it may be important to uh, understand that there are two entities in two kind of big important entities in the MySQL ecosystem, MariaDB Foundation and MariaDB uh, Corporation. And why would you really uh, care? Well, MariaDB Foundation, as you could see from a previous page, is all about serving uh, MariaDB uh, community, and it really develops open source software, server, and some other surrounding utilities around, uh, around MariaDB with all that development done as an open source and in the uh, open. MariaDB Corporation, though, is a venture-funded for-profit business which uh, monetizes MariaDB, right? And they release some of their stuff as open source, but also have a lot of proprietary solutions around MariaDB. Software, as well uh, as uh, SaaS, like database uh, as, a, as a service, right? And I think you need to really understand uh, what when software you're using uh, from come from because that's where you will uh, see the difference in terms of how it's uh, licensed and, uh, and other stuff are. Now, I personally find the relationship details with Maridi Corporation Foundations are uh, somewhat mm, convoluted and complicated sometimes. Like, for example, we'll find MariaDB Foundation responsible for MariaDB server, while you will find what are some other components which are important for you running uh, MariaDB successfully, such as connections or uh, max scale are often uh, owned by MariaDB Corporation, and uh, things as max scale, for example, are not open source. Docker is also quite complicated, right? If you look at the MariaDB Docker build, they are provided by MariaDB Corporation, but then there are kind of Docker library, sort of like a, mm, uh, uh, right, the general the, uh, Docker uh, library builds are maintained by MariaDB uh, uh, Foundation. MariaDB knowledge base is also something which is interesting, right? Because on one extent, this is, kind of community run uh, uh, projects, right? Where MariaDB community is encouraged to contribute, but at the same time, it's hosted by uh, MariaDB, uh, MariaDB Corporation on the com uh, domain name, which is kind of 
uh, I find kind of confusing. Here are another things which I find uh, some kind of strange entanglement, right? If you go to download MariaDB on MariaDB.org, then your download completes, you will be redirected to the knowledge base at MariaDB.com uh, and even more so uh, uh, compelled to create MariaDB ID and give it permission to MariaDB uh, Corporation, right? To get that information to the uh, MariaDB Corporation, which uh, I would only assume can be used for uh, the marketing, uh, marketing reasons. Now, some of you may say, well, Peter, do you consider that uh, unfair? Well, frankly, I don't. I just consider that is something which you guys uh, should be uh, aware uh, about. With uh, MariaDB Corporation is uh, uh, the company which carries largest weight in development and promoting MariaDB and supporting MariaDB uh, Foundation. Let's face it, without MariaDB Corporation efforts, MariaDB would not be as successful as it is right now. And in return, uh, MariaDB Foundation efforts benefit MariaDB corporations more than other parties, which uh, can be spawn also sponsors of MariaDB Foundation. That is how things work uh, at uh, this point. Okay, in fact, let's look at what is open source and not in uh, this MariaDB mm, ecosystem. In case of uh, MySQL, it follows the simple open core model. What that means is there is a community version, which is 100% open source, and then there is an enterprise version, which is a uh, proprietary available to the subscriptions only. What is interesting in this case is what that community and open source is uh, the uh, whole of the platform which needed to run MySQL uh, uh, successfully. Like they include the tooling for high availability, proxies such as MySQL, router, and so on and so forth. There with Enterprise, you get commercially licensed plugins and also the uh, tooling like backup uh, and uh, Mm, uh, and uh, things like monitoring with MySQL enterprise monitors. With MySQL, and I think uh, Oracle actually have been doing a pretty good job in terms of what they did not ever take any components of MySQL, which were open source, and say, no, 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 that's not going to be proper, right? And that is, I think, that is one of the big fears of what we can see in the modern open source ecosystem. Right, like some of you may follow the Elastic drama where they have uh, had the whole server which was licensed as a very liberal open source license. Then, boom, one day they, they switch it to their uh, property license called mm, SSPL. MySQL never did uh, anything like that. If MariaDB server, it is a, a completely open source, and even some components which will be proprietary in MySQL like systems are open source and uh, uh, MariaDB, though some things are only available for, uh, um, uh, from MariaDB Corporation and not open source. For example, if you would find the MySQL router equivalent right, for traffic management, well, you have to pick a max scale, which is uh, proprietary. Uh, license uh, uh, solution. MariaDB Enterprise Server is also particularly interested uh, interesting uh, thing of uh, uh, open uh, source. Their MariaDB server has to be GPL, obviously because it is largely based on uh, Oracle's MySQL, which is uh, GPL-based software but it's only distributed to the customer. So you cannot go and find the uh, MySQL enterprise server sources, right, downloadable um, uh, easily, right, unless some of the customers choose to share, which 
Uh, well, obviously, they typically don't. You also find what some of the uh, things which I can find particularly cool in MariaDB commercial ecosystems are commercial only. For example, uh, for Expand Storage Engine, which is previously was known as Clustrix, is a very cool shredded storage engine for scalability, but it's only available to mm, commercial customers of MariaDB Corporation. Now, there is also a difference between the open, how the open source and subscription versions are managed. In a MySQL enterprise, it's still a superset of MySQL community. Nothing what is in a, their enter, uh, in a community version is not available in the enterprise, and the release schedule is completely aligned. With a MIS uh, MariaDB Enterprise uh, server, it's kind of extended subset of what community or like a normal MariaDB server is. There are some servers, uh, features which are available in community server are not considered to be enterprise grade yet and not available in the MariaDB Enterprise server. And also there, there is a different uh, separate life cycle for releases between the uh, enterprise server and uh, in community. Now, the other uh, interesting difference is uh, how the cloud native or Kubernetes mm, ecosystem is uh, approached. And uh, in both cases, uh, I don't think the companies jumped on that ecosystem very, uh, very quickly. Oracle for years had uh, like some very early stage alpha version of operator for Kubernetes, which was kind of, I think, never finished, abandoned. And then uh, just a few months ago, the beta version of new MySQL operator was released, which is still not GA yet. And that void was filled uh, by a number of customers, uh, by a number of third party companies. So, like you can find Kubernetes uh, operators for MySQL from uh, Bitpoke or from uh, uh, Pircona. MariaDB uh, operator, uh, as an open source operator done by MariaDB Corporation was initially announced to give a red hat on operator hub launch, but then it's kind of uh, it disappeared. And then last time I did uh, this uh, presentation, the MariaDB Enterprise operator was uh, available for MariaDB Corporation, uh, where I was not really find any details about uh, uh, about that uh, right now. And it seems to me, uh, right, unless I'm uh, uh, missing something in here, is what uh, uh, MariaDB's approach in this case, in, in this kind of cloud and cloud native is encouraging people to use uh, SkySQL as a database, as a service, rather than uh, trying to roll out the uh, operator on Kubernetes. Having said that, there is a large number of third-party MariaDB and Helm, um, MariaDB Helm and operator projects for Kubernetes exist. In terms of the cloud, MariaDB and MySQL are pretty uh, ubiquitous as a database, as a service, at least in their community edition forms. Wherever you go to, my, to Amazon, Azure, Google, you'll find MySQL and MariaDB offered out there as their community mm. editions. In MySQL, you could also uh, have a, see this heavily modified version as Amazon Aurora, where there is no Aurora for MariaDB yet. Now, both MariaDB Corporation and Oracle, they also offer database as a service for their enterprise version. Right, which includes all the enterprise features, not just the uh, community. And also Alibaba Cloud offers enterprise cast, uh, version of MariaDB uh, through um, uh, partnership. Both companies, they have also different approaches to analytics. With MariaDB, uh, 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 the specific solution for analytics is the Comolum store storage engine. The column store storage engine is something which uh, was known as, 
the InfiniDB, right? And the assets of that company were later acquired by MariaDB Corporation and they kind of significantly uh, rewrote the code and rebranded that as a column store. There is the community edition of column store, which is included in uh, MariaDB 10.5 plus, and there is an enterprise uh, column store, which is part of MariaDB enterprise uh, subscription. In terms of MySQL, there is no special open source analytics focused storage engine. What Oracle uh, has done is they built uh, the Heatwave uh, technology, which is kind of uh, acceleration for analytics, which is only available in the Oracle uh, in the Oracle Cloud, at least at this point. I think what MariaDB and MySQL are focused on uh, the slightly different uh, uh, different use cases. If you look at the early MariaDB uh, days, I think they initially competed with MySQL on features, but then it's kind of not very good uh, in uh, investment, right? Because Oracle implements a lot of the similar um, things uh, as well. Now, MariaDB have been focusing on the areas where Oracle doesn't want to invest uh, as much. Like, uh, uh, for example, migration from Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server. Uh, I think uh, things like uh, usability for sysadmin DBA, right? Like the small low hanging fruits have been also very uh, particular and great focus of MariaDB, as well as a cloud integration. And specifically, I think the uh, S3 storage engine is, uh, is very cool uh, innovation in MariaDB, which uh, we don't have uh, Oracle focusing uh, on that. MySQL continue focused on their, uh, I would say, traditional MySQL use case. And where they try to go is more of usability for uh, developers, right? Think about the Doc Store and the, a lot of investment in JSON. Uh, support MySQL Shell, which is kind of uh, the, uh, uh, has some development uh, functions. And they also did a lot of focus uh, on uh, availability at the Oracle uh, crowd. Now, they are not also focused on uh, advanced Oracle features, right? Now, there is a lot of discussion in this case as well. Uh, what is exactly here? Uh, is it uh, something what the customers they serve are not asking about that? Or is it something what they are forbidden to do by their corporate overlords uh, at uh, Oracle? Well, I am not privy to uh, that discussion, but uh, chances are there is some mixture of those uh, things. From architectural standpoint, they also took a lot uh, different approach. MySQL specifically with MySQL uh, 8, did a very big re-architecture of the old code base, right? Those things like a you know, data dictionary, uh, Vulkan optimizer, uh, like uh, really limit a lot of choices, focus just on the DB storage uh, engine and so on and so forth, right? It was a kind of very uh, big changes and sometimes uh, uh, painful, right? I also think what there are uh, some decisions which have been needlessly complex and kind of uh, not as uh, practical, right? Looks like they're sometimes designed by uh, in the uh, ivory, uh, ivory tower, not some... Uh, very practical, uh, simple decisions which uh, Maridi focuses on. A lot of focus has been done on may, uh, making InnoDB better for many uh, use cases. If you look at MariaDB, they did not follow the same MySQL 8 stuff, right? Uh, but they have been uh, iterating and pushing this kind of older code base further and prioritize choice and flexibility, including supporting for uh, uh, for multiple storage engines. MariaDB 
now also have been investing uh, specifically in making NADB better and they have their own philosophy for that, right? And that's kind of very interesting for me as you talk to MySQL uh, and uh, MariaDB in the DB team, right? All of they can say what that is their approach about how they see uh, in the DB should be optimized and improved is uh, is better. And I think that is great, right? You'll probably see the competition between those approaches. I would say there are some use cases and benchmarks where one or another will win and the team will learn from each other and in the DB will be better off in both products uh, because of that. I also think for the development team in MariaDB, because development is so much more uh, open, they are much uh, closer to, uh, to the customers and have a great insight in the practical, uh, uh, practical operations, which is uh, important. Now let's look at the uh, release frequency. We can see what uh, release frequency has been quite different between those databases where MySQL 8 uh, released now what? Three and a half years ago, uh, where we have uh, MariaDB uh, releasing their uh, major releases almost like a, a clockwork uh, uh, once a year. Differences between the MariaDB major releases are not as massive as for example, between MySQL 5, 7, and 8, uh, but uh, they're still uh, uh, significant and the pace of innovation is quite good. So you can see in this case from release philosophy, MariaDB continues that kind of classic my, MySQL policy of relatively frequent major releases and no major changes in minor releases. That means if in the major release, you can, uh, do the minor downgrades, keeping data center intact. The MySQL 8 is something like your evergreen uh, release, right? Where you can see features introduced in the minor releases to the point what you may not be able to agree uh, to move between them. It's kind of you are only moving forward. And if shit happened, well, guess what? You may need to, uh, to recover from backup. With that, let's look at uh, some, uh, uh, some specifics between those uh, technologies. For a client protocol, MySQL supports obviously classic MySQL protocol. Uh, uh, it also now supports SRV DNS records, which I think is quite, uh, 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 quite cool to be able to uh, really connect to different service points within a single uh, uh, the right for a single uh, record. It also supports the X protocol, which is kind of a newer protocol, supposed to be better, you know, faster, whatever. Uh, I wouldn't say it has a super uh, huge uptick yet, and it's not even supported by many cloud vendors, but it's there. Uh, with MariaDB, you have a classic MySQL protocol and various extensions such as for, uh, for the uh, uh, reporting, uh, progress reporting. In terms of an interface, MySQL supports uh, uh, interface. It has a document store where you can uh, you know, talk to that using X uh, you know, protocol and have like MongoDB-like interface. And it is all, has also memcached interface. So that is kind of legacy and gradually being depreciated. MariaDB is around uh, SQL. It also have a handler socket support, but that again, I would say it's there, but I haven't seen anybody really using that in uh, many years. MySQL focused a lot on the JSON support. I think both in terms of uh, uh, what developers want, but also it's it's uh, attempt uh, to compete with MongoDB, which well was uh, eating a lot of uh, uh, easy to use kind of MySQL market in the uh, last uh, few years. It support for native uh, JSON data type. Uh, they invest in having like very efficient partial updates, and has a lot of cool things like uh, JSON shortcut, JSON table, and so on and so forth. MariaDB takes alternative approach. It stores JSON as text, but it has a very, very efficient 
uh, JSON parser. So that is not as a big overhead. And what I think is important here is in MariaDB 10.6, uh, JSON table feature was also added. So MariaDB is really catching up with MySQL uh, when it comes to JSON support mm, very well. In terms of replication, that is very significant. Uh, uh, things are sig significantly different. MySQL has uh, its own GTID. It has a group replication, which is not supported by MariaDB. Now it has this pretty cool feature of a clone plugin for efficient uh, uh, node provision, right? which is integrated in the group replication, which is also uh, pretty, uh, pretty cool. MariaDB has Galera replication instead of a group replication. And it has its own, not comparable, but I think in many cases better and kind of simpler uh, GTID implementation. If you look at SQL standards and comparability, uh, that is where a lot of improvements happen over the last uh, few years. And uh, I think MySQL uh, here now doesn't really offer at least kind of a big stuff which MariaDB doesn't cover. There, MariaDB has uh, a lot of support, not just by standard things, but also something which exists in some of the other proprietary databases. Like you can have a SQL mode Oracle, system version tables, you have support for sequences, you have support for packages uh, in, uh, in storage engine. So uh, a lot of focus uh, on that. Now, security. Uh, is uh, also something which uh, those technologies take a lot of different uh, approach. And I would just say what there is a significant difference in security and user account management, right? It's just you know, too much of material for me to uh, get in uh, here. So I would suggest you to check it out uh, independently. Uh, one thing I want to highlight here is some of the recent changes which came in MySQL 8 over last year or so, right? So these are the things which came out well after its release. One cool thing is a dual passwords, which really simplifies uh, password rotation at scale, right? That means uh, you can uh, have an application which only can connect with a single password, right? And, uh, you, and you can still rotate it faster even if it has to done through many, many instances. Reloading TLS context, like updating certificate without needing to restart the server quite too cool. Dynamic privileges, right? Where plugins can define their own privileges, right? For certain things, I think is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, important in the innovation in MySQL 8. And also password policies. You know, password policies in the database, you may find that kind of, you know, bizarre, right? So why would you need that? But that uh, is needed for a lot of corporate users for compliance reasons, you know, such as enforced password complexity, password rotation, and so on and so forth. Optimizer, that is another thing where there are huge differences. And that is something I would not would try to understand that in every kind of detail because, well, uh, optimizer is a very complex beast. I don't think anybody understands optimizer and all of its details. I would just prepare for that to be different than what, especially for complicated queries, how the query is executed on MySQL versus MariaDB uh, can be uh, quite different. I think uh, for uh, a while, MariaDB uh, was uh, kind of uh, not following some of the new innovations uh, there, um, uh, what happened in uh, in my uh, in the, in my SQL, right? And I saw the statements like, well, you know, can, you know, being compatible with my SQL five five is only what matters. But that changed recently, right? I see that there is a lot of uh, features uh, which appeared first in my SQL have been picked up by MariaDB, right? Like a lot of the new features uh, in performance schema have been included in MariaDB 10.6. Ignored slash invisible indexes also have been added with MariaDB, right? Uh, 
I think there is a kind of a syntax differences, right? And this is something that I wish uh, there would be kind of less ego place than that. And team would just say, well, you know what? Oracle got there first. Let us use their syntax. Or, hey, MariaDB got there first. Let the team at Oracle use their syntax. But sometimes uh, there seems to be uh, picking a different syntax while, you know, frankly, it doesn't matter and just would be so easier for people to go back and forth if that would be the uh, same. Atomic DDLs were added uh, without requiring uh, their whole wholesale data dictionary change, things like skip, skip blocked or including uh, C schema in, uh, in, in the DB. So where I also wanted to end is uh, some of the things I find exciting in uh, MariaDB 10.7. So MariaDB 10.7 right now is in early preview. Right, and it looks to me uh, it, like if we expect sort of a similar once a year release, right? There is still quite a few uh, development uh, uh, which is to be done by MariaDB 10.7, but uh, the team has started to show uh, the progress early on. One exciting thing which is available in MariaDB 10.7 is now UUID data type, right? Which allows you to uh, store UUID efficiently without all the kind of hats that are uh, required to do that in, in MySQL or, or something, which is uh, fantastic. We also have uh, continuing work on the JSON improvements. More functions for JSON support, right? And I am glad to see what MariaDB team uh, recognized what JSON is important in the modern world, and uh, it is important for a project to have uh, JSON kind of on par, not only with MySQL, but with other uh, relational databases technologies like Postgres and uh, SQLite. And we also have see the same JSON uh, being available uh, in things like um, uh, histograms for, uh, uh, for table statistics. So these are kind of just some of the highlights in uh, MariaDB 10.7. I would uh, encourage you to check it out. And another thing what I uh, like about uh, MariaDB 10.7, which I think is a new thing which uh, got started, is uh, there is integration with Jupyter Notebooks and others, uh, ways to really be able to check out some of those cool new MariaDB features without having to install it on your own server. I think that is a very uh, smart step by uh, MariaDB team, and I think that will allow to get, uh, get more, uh, more feedback early and uh, get a product, better product faster. Well, with that, so that's uh, all uh, I have to say. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. So, Peter, congratulations on a great presentation. You claim to be an equal opportunity offender, but I have to say I did not feel offended on behalf of MariaDB server. I think your presentation was done with a great attitude, highlighting the good and the questionable in both products. Thank you, Kai. That's uh, great. Uh, great to hear that. Yes, yeah, so I have an observation and a question on that. So I'm comparing you to Monty, specifically to Monty's presentation on this service. You probably haven't heard it yet, but his talk is on migration. And he manages to give a fairly neutral presentation of why closed source started. It's not full of sarcasm or semi-extremist views like it used to be in his speeches. And I'll say yes. with you, earlier presentations of yours would often consist of phrases like, I find it strange or peculiar, and other wordings that could have been seen as provocative. Now, I might not be very easy to provoke, but I think your view in your presentation today was quite a neutral, Solomonic one. Why is that? Older and wiser. Oh, yes, yes, uh, older. Well, I cannot claim much of a great hair, great hair yet, but I think, well, uh, you know, I think being in 
in a business as an entrepreneur now for what, 15 years, right? To uh, learn a thing or two, right? And I think that is a, a diplomatic, uh, the diplomacy is uh, one of them. And I also think there is a uh, name a place for uh, different things, right? There are one things you can be, you know, having a discussion over beers, right? And there are certain things you would say in that audience and the other uh, would be doing that on a kind of a more uh, more global uh, conference, mm-hmm. uh, uh, if you will. Yeah, so, so content-wise, you talk about two different wonderful databases and you describe the differences in a way, I think it's, it's very educational for the user base. So there's not much point in me or you reiterating that you did a great job. Instead, I will ask you about the user base. So how, how aware is the user base about those differences? You talk about the loyal community and the loyal customer base. Does that loyalty go too far uh, where users don't open their eyes for the other database? Yeah, well, I think that is a, uh, that is a challenge uh, overall, uh, right? Uh, uh, in this case. And I think uh, if you look at um, the technology landscape, especially as it goes to compared to open source uh, databases, uh, then we were uh, starting with MySQL, right? What is like uh, late 90s, early 2000s, right? Uh, I think the IT and especially the open source community was much, uh, much smaller. And a lot of people who would engage with that were, were really people with a lot of attitude, aptitude, passion, right? That's the open source was life more than a job, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if you look in this case, the open source has become so ubiquitous and so successful, then it also becomes like a career for many and people, uh, you know, are with a low average, right? That means your average open source, the average person using open source software right now is probably not going to be as um, passionate, right? As skill understanding. Uh, uh, as you know, two decades, uh, decades before, right? And uh, uh, many people just, you know, start to use what uh, they learned somewhere, what they heard, right? Not really uh, appreciate the differences. Now, I would say, in certain cases, it did benefit actually MariaDB, right? In some cases, because uh, there are a number of of Linux distributions where users would get MariaDB and not MySQL, then install MySQL, and they would just be quite, you know, happy with that. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, the other users, right, they may just heard MySQL and, you know, pick the MySQL book uh, uh, from that, uh, uh, you know, for, from a shelf, and read about that, not recognizing what MariaDB may be a better choice for them, right? Mm-hmm. So that is a challenge, right? And I think that is something where we all can uh, do better Mm, uh, continue to uh, educate uh, mm-hmm. the community. So, which is what you did in your presentation. Um, I, I could make it easy for myself and highlight only stuff where you pick on my scale or Oracle, and I won't resist that temptation completely. So, uh, migrations, you talk about Oracle perhaps having uh, overlords that prevent my scale from developing something like the Oracle compatibility layer in MariaDB, I would suspect the same. Why would they uh, allow such a thing, right? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, you're right uh, in, uh, uh, in this regard, right? That is a very, uh, 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 that's very likely uh, possibility, uh, right? What that uh, uh, exists. But I think in uh, uh, this case, I also, as you say, maybe we've kind of, non-existing gray hairs, right? And the uh, wisdom which comes with this, I'm managing my expectation. And what I like to talk about the team about, about Oracle is what you should not expect Tiger to become vegetarian. Mm-hmm. That is not going to happen. The, the best thing you can expect from a trader is to, to uh, not to snack on your sheep, right? If you have a, a farmer, right? Or, or, or whatever, right? Uh, and my point in this case, if you think about the Oracle and MySQL, I uh, think when Oracle acquired MySQL, our expectations of what they may do with MySQL were much worse. Yes, yeah, so that, what was, actually, uh, that was so, uh, actually. 
that was going to be my, my, my next point. So I was saying, instead of picking on them, I will ask about something which Oracle did good. They never closed source an open source pro uh, product, which you pointed out. So in hindsight, now given the past over 10 years, uh, you were probably surprised by that. I mean, I was, w were you? I mean, I'm not uh, so much uh, subscri uh, uh, surprised about this, right? Because I think that is also uh, in the interest of Oracle to, um, uh, to do it this way. I think MariaDB already had dent, uh, made a significant dent in the MySQL uh, community. But if Oracle would go ahead and say, hey, MySQL is going SSPL or proprietary, uh, right? Well, uh, that would be really the step to push a lot of users uh, down to, uh, to MariaDB hands, right? And they don't, uh, I mean, I don't think that really helps, uh, uh, helps Oracle in, uh, in this regard. Right. So, so you were not so much surprised about that, but have there been areas where either Oracle, MySQL, or MariaDB did take you by surprise, either good or, or bad, over the last 10 years or so? Well, um, uh, in this case, I mean, I think there's obviously have been, a, a, you know, number of, uh, number of surprises, especially if you look at the uh, longer period of time. I think the whole evolution of MariaDB uh, was interesting, right? If the history of a multi programming ID and kind of sky squirrel, then, uh, uh, you know, merging together. Frankly, I did not quite understand the point of that, uh, uh, you know, separation, uh, uh, to, you know, to, to begin with that, I think that was kind of, uh, a little bit, uh, um, a little bit, uh, uh, confusing, right? Um, the, I think, uh, some of the steps about if you look at like what uh, MariaDB Corporation, right, not the foundation, chooses to uh, to pursue, right, as a proprietary project or not, that was uh, uh, you know surprise to me in in certain cases. I think what was interesting and and that I would say like actually the uh, successful uh, for MariaDB Corporation to pick up those sort of semi abandoned uh, technologies in the MySQL space, namely kind of Clastics and uh, InfiniDB and bring them back uh, together mm -hmm. as a useful product, right? And give them a, uh, a new life, right? I think that uh, was a quite interesting thing, which that doesn't happen that often. Mm. So, okay, yeah, I would mention that. So, um... You talk about MySQL doing a bit of strange uh, refactoring and ivory tower development a bit far away from the customer base. Um, so does MariaDB do similar quote-unquote stupid things? I'm talking technical things here. I know you highlighted licensing choices by MariaDB mm -hmm. Corporation where you would have preferred more open solutions. I get that. But this is MariaDB mm -hmm. Foundation. So I'm interested in, in technical choices that you find, shall we say, questionable. Well, I would say, I think in, uh, in MariaDB, from a technical standpoint, right, I think there is a little bit of uh, that um, not invented here, uh, the syndrome, right? And in certain cases, right, I would, uh, would like to see more from uh, MariaDB to, uh, to look uh, uh, into that and uh, uh, if, let's say, what. Oracle is doing first, uh, right? If that syntax is acceptable, right? For example, maybe adopt that to make it easy for a user, not just making, you know, distinction for sake of distinction, which I think uh, had, you know, happened in a couple of cases, right? Like, yes. yeah, explain you, you, for connection, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, you were saying that we had some ego development there and, and, and you were asking for less of an ego, technical ego from, from both parties. So I think we will need to catch up offline on, on, on what those Yeah, Yeah, but, but I think in this case, like, uh, uh, to be uh, honest, uh, the, in this case, I think uh, uh, Oracle does a lot of that, uh, more of that. And I think the, from Oracle side, there may be more non-technical, but even like a legal reasons what they kind of often invent saying, well, you know what, you want to make things slightly different to make sure we are not said as what we are 
copy in the interface, right? Which makes sense because of those kind of super supreme court battle or Oracle had until recently, right? They probably did not want to be said, well, you know what? You're okay copying your competition interfaces too, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, well, um, so, mm, uh, so that is. Now, I think I would say I like her seeing some of the changes, uh, right? Which are for, uh, for good, right? I remember on uh, one of uh, MariaDB developers in my meeting, Monty was saying what, well, what the hell is Docker? I mean, Docker is no different from a TARG zip, right? Just gives you exactly the same stuff, so why bother? But I'm glad what MariaDB Foundation now took over maintaining official Docker builds, embracing, well, actually people uh, run Docker, right? And you know what? Monty doesn't have to use it if he doesn't want to, but the community, uh, community needs that. Uh, right, and uh, I, I think as I mentioned in my presentation, I think what another platform I would like MariaDB Foundation to give some love to is uh, uh, is a Kubernetes, right? Yes. Because that's uh, kind of the next frontier where a lot of users are starting to look at. Yeah, I, I noted that, and I was uh, for a long while when I was looking at your presentation, I was going to say, why aren't you mentioning uh, Jupiter or Jupiter kernel? But then you ended up mentioning it and, and also highlighting that, that that you can use the Jupiter kernel uh, with a binder interface to test features from uh, without having to install. So I think that that's one of the developments originating from the foundation itself lately. Yes, yeah, and I think uh, uh, that is uh, actually very cool, right? I would say I very much like how in the MariaDB 10.7, a preview presentation, you make it very easy for people to, you know, just drive new features out without downloading and installing uh, uh, the stuff. I think that is a very cool and that recognizes sort of like a impatience of a modern developer uh, very well. Thank you. So, um, MariaDB Foundation is, a, we have three key words for us, openness, adoption and continuity. Now, Looking at adoption specifically, how do you think, I'm asking for advice from you here, how can we increase adoption? We were talking about here that the, the loyal user bases of product A don't necessarily know about product B. So what should we do to increase this awareness? Are there other measures that you uh, recommend uh, re related to adoption? Yes, well, uh, what I think uh, in this case, it's uh, uh, interesting, right? If you look at development, right? Then you look at uh, late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of that was much more database centric, right? Right now, a lot of developers, they came in, they need to uh, get a job done and they do not really uh, understand what is uh, down the stream uh, very, very well. Like, for example, if you think about uh, MongoDB, which took a lot of market of those kind of like an easy to use developer, right? Their uh, focus, of course, was uh, on the simplicity and uh, integrating with, uh, with drivers, right? And really, and the frameworks, right? And really talking to developers in that, uh, in that space. I think for MariaDB to be uh, successful, that may be one of the paths. That's how you can provide to people more of a, uh, differentiating uh, reasons to use MariaDB when you are just starting development, right? Because a lot of the benefits, what you can talk about MariaDB, they may be kind of a operational in nature or, uh, you know, related to some complicated queries and so on and so forth, right? But they are not kind of difference on day one for developer who knows nothing. Where MySQL relation versus MongoDB non-relational, for example, is. So that is one thing I would uh, point out, right? And I uh, love uh, the, uh, the work MariaDB is doing with migration, right? Let's say from Oracle, migrate from Oracle, right? And that makes sense for large enterprises, right? That's probably is very helpful for a MariaDB corporation to drive some mm, multi-million dollar deals, right? I would imagine. But that is not what somebody who is a developer who is starting with his first building his first application is going to be really think about or need. Sure, sure. So um, given our focus on adoption, what you just mentioned about MongoDB and Oracle, so uh, do we 
at Maria to be focused too much on comparing ourselves to MySQL. So, I mean, that was the task of your presentation, and that was a great one. But should we, in general, do you think, compare ourselves more to Postgres or Mongo or Oracle or, or, or closed source databases like Oracle and, and Microsoft SQL Server? Well, uh, 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 probably yes, but I would even go further than that, right? I think that the, um, uh, MariaDB spends or what is now is uh, probably uh, a decade or so, right? More than that, kind of compare itself as a better, uh, better MySQL alternative, right? But I think uh, is uh, uh, the world kind of since that changed and moved on, right? I think in this case, you don't want to think about your competition. You want to be thinking about your user needs. And I think is a better position is not like, oh, they're better than Oracle in this, they're better than Postgres in that, uh, but really uh, help developers to show how they can solve their existing needs with, uh, with uh, MariaDB, because in many cases, they will choose that path, which is simple and clear, and not even do that kind of evaluation, right, of what alternatives exist and so on and so forth. Right, that is something which I would be, uh, be thinking about. Right? And I think that you mentioned uh, your work with um, Jupyter Kernel, right? I think that is a very, uh, like, well, good example uh, in this case. Okay, well, great. Those, I think, were good pieces of advice for us and good uh, concluding words for, you for our Q&A. So thank you very much, Peter. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kai.
Hi, I'm Steve Shaw of Intel, and I'm going to be talking about best practice benchmarking. So evaluating MariaDB performance on premise and in the cloud. So what I'll be looking at is initially some of the questions you should ask yourself before you start benchmarking. Then we'll have a look at an enterprise level benchmarking tool called HammerDB. We'll look at some of the, the, the workloads, so a simple walkthrough, and then example comparison. So a benchmark for comparing different systems. In this case, CPUs will be comparing some Intel processors gen to gen. We'll have a look at some advanced benchmarking, some cloud performance, and then finally some next steps on community contribution. So let's start with the uh, benchmarking considerations. So what sort of questions should you ask before you actually start to run some database benchmarks? Because quite often people will jump in, they'll run some benchmarks without having really considered what they actually want to measure and whether the workload is the right one to, to be able to get the, the insights in what you're looking to compare. So just an example, you know, are you looking to compare different database hardware and gain insights about that from your benchmark? Or maybe you're looking to compare different aspects of database software or the difference between, say, different software releases. You know, perhaps you want to look at cloud services and measure, say, the I.O. capabilities of one cloud service against another. And also then you have aspects such as regression testing of code changes. Or you might even want to be doing stress testing and see at what point when you want to vary a load when something will break. So overall, I encourage you to think of this on in terms of a, a benchmarking spectrum. So at one end, you know, we have very much the, the faster, cheaper, more generic workloads. But what you shouldn't do is then run some of these very simple workloads and then try and assume insights about something that the workload doesn't fully test. So, for example, some, running something very simple and drawing conclusions about the hardware, the software, you know, the cloud services, the whole range from something that doesn't really give you that full level of insight. On the other end, again, this is also a common error that somebody will assume that you need to run the most complex, high cost, you know, almost like a full production, you know, in some full production workload to try and get you the insights about one single, you know, application, which can have high levels of cost involved, but then is not necessarily transferable. So a real key question you need to ask yourself is, what are you really trying to prove from running these benchmarks before you start? Of course, when we're looking at MariaDB, you know, we can't really talk about benchmarking without talking about Sysbench. You know, clearly it's on the, the faster, sort of the, you know, the cheaper end of the workloads. You know, it's, it's very simple to run, but also gives the advantage of having both you know, generic and very transferable workloads. So you can run Sysbench anywhere. The downsides are that the schema you know, is quite clearly very basic. And the query is a very basic, so you might not necessarily be getting insights into, say, the locking and latching performance of the database software. Also, because you're running a lot of single queries, there's a very high CPU utilization from the round trip. And as CPUs, we get more cores, they get faster, then unfortunately, the benchmark is spending more and more time in the round trip and less time in the database. Now, overall, in terms of the applicability, you know, the question you have to ask, going back to the considerations, is this a workload profile which is very similar to something you want to run in production? If so, then it's absolutely perfect for you. However, you know, as we see in the graphic there, if we're looking to make an enterprise database comparison, you know, perhaps we should be looking for a workload that will actually run on all of these databases to then be able to give us a, a better insight. This is where HammerDB comes in. So HammerDB is an enterprise you know, and cloud database benchmarking tool. So from the name, it's the, the leading relational database ben benchmarking tool. It's open source. We'll mention so it's GitHub. You know, it's on GitHub. It's on a GPL v3 license. It's got contributions from a large number of CSPs. 
And it's also hosted by the TPC Council, so the Transaction Processing Council, who's the industry standard body for database benchmarks. So the TPC OSS subcommittee oversees all the changes that goes into this particular benchmark across all of the databases it supports. There's binary releases available on Linux and Windows, but you can test databases on any platform. So not just on those platforms, you can run your clients on Linux or Windows and test any database running on any platform. So what databases does it support? You know, as we can see from this graphic on DB engines, we can see rapid growth in the popularity of MariaDB. Unfortunately, HammerDB supports all of these most popular relational databases. So this is the way that you can get comparable results from one tool, but then used to compare and contrast across multiple different database, database software. So you can then take MariaDB you know, across the, the, this growth and use it then com to compare across running different data, enterprise databases. Also, in terms of the, the workloads, HammerDB supports two distinct workloads. So on one side, we have tProxy, which is OLTP, so a transactional workload. This is, you know, as you would expect, you know, it's read-write, high throughput, deliberately introduces contention into the database. So it deliberately encourages, you know, contention in terms of locking and latching. On the other hand, it also supports a workload called TProc H, which is your analytic decision support type workload. So you would use this, for example, for testing the MariaDB column store. As it says, both of these, so for OLTP, this is derived from the TPCC specification from the TPC, and the TProc H is derived from the TPCH specification. It's worth noting, though, that the, uh, the, because these are derived workloads, it's not actually permitted to use TPCC or TPCH in any non-fully audited benchmark because this is a trademark violation. It's also worth noting as well that we have, you know, in planning and HTAP workloads so very much combine the two. So to be able to combine both the transactional and the analytic on the, the same database that is called TProcCH, which is in planning. And hopefully that will be developed in sometime in 2022 for release. Now, one thing we have to look before we start, you know, benchmark is considering, you know, some of the, the key concepts when we're comparing tools. So, and arguably the most important key concept is when you have a benchmarking tool, you want that to be able to run in parallel. So you want the, the benchmarking software to be able to create multiple threads or virtual users as we turn them and have them running completely in parallel. So when you have a client with multiple cores, we want all of these virtual users running completely independently. So that means the concurrency control is taking place within the database. So we're testing the locking and latching within the database and not introducing artificial bottlenecks by having the concurrency control within the benchmarking client. This is something you know, that will enable us then to cross-reference workloads you know, across multiple database engines. And when we do this comparing and contrasting across different database engines, then it can give us high confidence levels of the sort of throughput that HammerDB can give us right across the, the overall range. So we can see what the overall throughput potential of a system would be. Also, with the programming languages of HammerDB, it's been designed from the ground up for high performance and scalability. So as you would expect, all the database commands are in SQL. You know, the interfaces uses the MariaDB connector in C, and the application logic is in stored procedures intentionally, so we're not spending all that time in the round trip time. And we can see this just by looking at the CPU utilization, we can actually see with 68 threads, the Sysbench has about 7x the system CPU utilization of HammerDB. And that's oh, the main reason for that is because of all of the additional time we're spending in the round trip rather than actually spending the time testing the database. HammerDB uses 
T Tickle or TCL as a, a glue language intentionally for this parallelism. So that is the reason why this language was chosen. So if we compare it to other languages such as Python or Lua, they have the limitation of a GIL or a global interpreter lock. So what that means is we're doing the concurrency control in the client and not so much in the database. And that means we've introduced serialization essentially within the benchmarking client. That's not something we want to do. So we really want the parallelism to take place within the benchmarking client. So then we're testing the concurrency control within the database. We can use coroutines when we're using event-driven scaling, and that's something that we'll refer to later. So we're using coroutines appropriately for when the workload needs it. Another important concept is the, the one of cached versus scaled benchmarks. And this is very much where we fit you know, on the benchmarking considerations and that overall spectrum of faster, cheaper, you know, more generic insights against the more complex, more in-depth and more expensive workloads to run. So with a cached-based workload, essentially what we're looking to do is stress components such as the CPU, have most of the data cached within memory, you know, within the, the buffer pool, and then we're going to have the, the log buffer, essentially, and the, the redo log disk is the highest component of the I.O. So once we've ramped up and we're running the workload, we're not going to really have that much I.O. to the data area. When we move more towards scaled benchmarks, what we're actually going to do then is introduce a lot more data into the workload. We're going to have very many, a lot more warehouses, which is the basic construct of the, the TProxy workload. We're going to introduce thousands of sessions, probably have middleware as well, but then we're going to be running something much closer to a production workload. Again, it depends on what component you're actually looking to test, depending on what's appropriate, whether it's a cached or a scale benchmark. By default, most people tend to run the cached workloads for the fastest and quickest insights. So let's have a, a walkthrough now of a TProxy workload for one of these cached workloads before we look at an example of comparing different CPUs from gen to gen. So HammerDB has interfaces. It has a graphical interface for Windows and Linux. It also has a, a command line and a REST HTTP interface. There's full compatibility, so it's exactly the same code that runs underneath all of these different interfaces. But what we'll use just in, in this example, we'll take the, the walkthrough using the GUI, and then we'll show the example using the command line to show how each different one works. So the first thing we want to do is define is to, to build a schema. So what we need to do is select those schema options. So as you can see, most of them should hopefully be fairly familiar. So we're going to choose a storage engine. We're going to choose like the, the, the connection the options that we have. And then the schema bill will create the tables, load the data, create the indexes and store procedures. And then it will create a defined number of warehouses. It will create, once it's created the stored procedures, it will gather the statistics and produce a final build schema ready for us to start running, running a test. From all of those options, probably the most important one or the, the most common question is how many warehouses do I create? So from the default cached workload, it's important to note that a, a virtual user will choose a home warehouse at random from the number of warehouses that you create. And then 90% of the workload is going to be satisfied from this home warehouse. And that is regardless of the number of overall warehouses that you create. So in this example, we've got two virtual users. So they will do 90% of the workload on two warehouses. So whether you create 10, 1,000, or 10,000, you're still going to see similar results because it's based on the number of virtual users within this default mode running 90% of the workload on this home, home warehouse. So it's an important consideration. You should really think of how many virtual users should am I planning to run? You know, and you should base that, for example, on the number of 
the number of cores and the number of the sockets in the server that you're testing and create enough warehouses so you don't expect contention from the maximum point that you're going to be able to run. You can create larger amounts, and we'll talk about that later you know, for, for features such as event-driven scaling. So if you have a look at the, the schema bill, once we've chosen the option, it, it's very much a, a one click. So you create, it will create virtual users for you, and then it will run. It depends on overall the number of CPU cores that you have because it's creating the data for you at the same time as it loads and also the overall IO throughput on, on the database. Once it's complete, you'll see the message that the schema is being created. You have the store procedures, the statistics, and then we're ready to go and head to start testing. An alternative, you know, especially if you're running in the cloud, we have this alternative data gen option where you can just generate and produce the flat files for uploading into the cloud, and then you can build your own, own schema based on the, the, the data that has been pre-generated. Once we've created the schema, and then we're going to have a look at the driver script options. So again, we have similar sort of connection options. There's a, a test-based driver script. This is really just to make sure that the schema build was correct, you know, your environment, everything can connect, and you're not going to start running workloads with, with errors. So this will show you the output from the virtual users. When you're comparing systems, probably the most important thing you want to run is the timed script. So this is a measured test. You're going to give it some ramp up time. So this is where we're going to load the data in memory. Then we're going to have a test duration. So a period of time where we're going to time the overall throughput and report out the, the metrics for that individual test. We also have some advanced options, which we'll discuss later. And then when you click OK, it will load a driver script based on the number of options that you've chosen. Then we click Start to run. We can start running the test. And this will run the transaction mix in our schema. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be calling that TProxy workload, which is based on the TPCC specification. We're going to have a transaction mix based on the number of new orders, payments, store procedures mostly, but also as we see their delivery stock level and order status. So we're mixing very much read writes, and then some more complex read only queries. So we're really going to test the concurrency within the database. And we're really going to put you know, the emphasis on how well the database can manage the overall locking and latching between the different sessions. The, the output will show you the, the status of the virtual users. So in this example, you know, the virtual users are running, and I'll show you when it's complete. And if you want to stop the test, you can just press the stop button to terminate the virtual users. When it's complete, as you can see, we get a, a, a result. So it will tell us the, the overall result in terms of new orders per minute and transactions per minute. So we get two metrics, which I'll explain later. You also have the option to, while the test is running, to view the overall level of the transaction. So we can see in this example, we saw slightly increasing level of transactions over the test. And there's also a CPU metrics as well. So we can see you know, the, the amount of user and system utilization as we're running the actual test. So what does the output actually Actually, how can we interpret this output when it tells us we get NOPM and TPM? So the important concept here is really to think of NOPM is how fast we're going. So this is the metric you're going to use to draw comparisons, and this is the different is this is the the metric where we can compare different databases. So this is the the key one that we use for the test, and it's a close relation to the official TPMC without being, of course, the official TP TPMC metric. So NOPM, exactly as it would suggest, is describing the number of new order transactions per minute. So just the new orders only out of that transactions that we do over that period of time. So in this example, 689,000 know, new orders per, per minute over that entire averaged over that period of the test. 
In terms of the transactions per minute, this is your database related metric. So this is something you can't compare from MariaDB to other databases, but this really shows you how hard the overall database engine is, is working. And this example, we're running at just over 2 million MariaDB transactions per minute, which is the handler commits and the handler rollbacks metric taken from out of the database. So now we've done a, a walkthrough, we've seen how the test works. Let's have a look at an actual comparison. So we're gonna compare system to system. I'm gonna do that on two different Intel systems, the, the current Ice Lake generation and the previous Cascade Lake generation. As we mentioned before, we have full scripting, Go you know, language support. So this is exactly the same workload as we ran previously, except within a command line except now we've run a, a for loop. So you can see we're running the same workload, but we're going to increase the number of virtual users over time. So then we can just start it running, leave it for three hours and come back and capture and analyze the, the log output. So we've run this test. Overall, this is an example of the sort of executive performance summary. That, that we would give. So this is very much the, the high level insights that we've got from running this workload. So on these systems, we can compare both generations have 28 cores and 56 threads. And we can see that the Ice Lake, so the Xeon Gold, so the 6348 has delivered 1.2x, so 20% higher throughput than the, the previous generation, which is the Cascade Lake system. We also have the insight, and we'll show where this comes from in a moment. The P95 response times are 0.77x on the Ice Lake system compared against the Cascade Lake system. So overall, you know, for exactly the same number of cores, we're getting 20% better throughput, and we're seeing an improved customer experience from faster response times. But looking just behind this sort of overall executive performance summary, you know, this is some of the insights that we can get from generating a performance profile. So moving left to right on the x-axis, x axis, when we have that for loop, what we can see now is each data point is that individual test. So we've captured the average throughput, in this case, over a five minute period of time. We've then increased the number of virtual users and we've plotted these data points so we can then compare the overall performance as we're increasing the number of virtual users and seeing the throughputs increase over time. Again, all completely unattended. So what we can see here is that MariaDB is giving us you know, very nice scalability. So we've got that near linear zone you know, where we're scaling the number of virtual users up to the number of CPUs and cores. Then we have an area where, don't forget, we have multiple sockets here. So we have the socket to socket scaling. Now, this is going to be very dependent on the hardware architecture and very dependent on the latency between server sockets. So this is very much something that you should do to get an overall insight into the capabilities of the server hardware you know, for running MariaDB. When we reach the higher point, that's very much the performance plateau. When we saw the executive summary, you know, this is where we're capturing that peak performance from. This is the point of the highest CPU utilization. And then beyond this point, we're starting to increase contention. So the overall throughput is starting to decline. So this is the way that you should compare different systems because different systems may show very different performance profiles. So this performance profile is really the key for gaining that analysis into overall hardware performance. We mentioned the response times as well, and HammerDB gives you a full response time report. So this is just the summary of the overall virtual users. It actually gives you a breakdown for all of the individual virtual users as well. So this is captured at peak. So this is based on 68 virtual users. And this shows you the summary at the end taken from all of those individual reports. So what we can see here is that the performance of the different store procedures. So we can see the new order store procedures at top because that's our primary metric. 
we're going to capture the P95 response times and use that to draw the comparison into the overall customer experience. And of course, a lower response time, but also more consistent response times are, are going to give us better, better insights. And that's what this data gives us. So max, min, standard deviation, and the overall you know, ratio that these different store procedures are running in. So now let's take a quick look. We've looked at some of these insights and comparing hardware platforms and the cached workloads. Let's take a quick look at some of the advanced benchmarking techniques. So first of all, you know, if you want to stress cloud I.O. capabilities, as an example, there's a feature called use all warehouses. So we mentioned within the default workload that each virtual user will run 90% of its work on one individual warehouse. Well, use all warehouses, as it would suggest, then takes all of those warehouses that you've created. So for example, if you've created 100,000, it will then divide those warehouses up between the individual virtual users, and they will then select a new warehouse at each transaction. So hopefully that should give you the insight that now we're gonna be doing a lot more IO to the data area because every transaction we're choosing a new warehouse, so there's a lot more potential that could be on cold data than rather than being already cached in memory as per the default workload. We also have a feature called you know, connect pooling for clusters. So if you wanna test the cluster environment, this then gives you much more control over connecting one instance of HammerDB to multiple instances of a related database. So you can point, for example, the read-only transactions just to go to a read-only secondary endpoint within your cluster and direct the direct the read-write transactions to the primary. You can also define different policies, for example, have multiple connections and round robin between them. Because some databases won't necessarily give you the overall the, the overall TPM from the entire cluster, this, this functionality also reports out the client side view of the transactions per minute. There's also a feature called event-driven scaling that we mentioned before. This is based on coroutines. This is where we want either fixed throughput and we're gonna create very high session counts now. So thousands and thousands of sessions, if you wish. So we create asynchronous clients per virtual users. And it manages the king and thinking time with these coroutines. So you're generating something much more closer to a full production workload that has many, many sessions. But for this, you want to be creating, for example, middleware, use multiple use multiple clients, you might want to have max scale. So again, this is much more in depth, moving more now towards the right of the, that benchmarking spectrum where you're, there's more complexity, but it's trying to give you more insights into something closer to a production workload if you're looking for this fixed throughput of very high session counts. Finally, for these advanced features, there's also, we mentioned testing scenarios where we're looking to simulate failures in the stack. If you want to vary the workload both up and down, HammerDB supports a primary and replica features so we can run multiple instances, define them to run at different points over the time. And we very much have this pyramid type of workload where the work is varying. And we'll be using this really to measure the response times of the workload as the test is running rather than looking at measuring the throughput clearly because the workload is varying as we run it. So in terms of some next steps, you know, there's a number of published benchmarks. So if you go to the HammerDB website, look under the benchmarks tab, you know, key question is, has somebody already done you know, some of the workloads I'm looking for insights for? And if you've done your workload, you know, can you publish it? You know, on a blog, you know, put the data on Twitter. You know, let's make database performance open and available, you know, to everyone so we can compare and contrast. You know, the more insights we share, you know, the more information is available for everybody to make the best decisions. Finally, you can contribute to our HammerDB on GitHub. 
you know, so all source code, you know, is GPL v3. So if you're looking to improve and enhance the MariaDB workload, you know, for HammerDB, then all the source code is right there. If you think you can improve the, the store procedures, you know, you've got insights in how you want to run different MariaDB workloads. Everything is there open source and available for you to, to add and contribute and be able to give back to overall the database benchmarking community and make database benchmarking and make all the performance completely open source. At that point, I'll say thank you very much for listening. Okay, uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, much appreciate that talk. Um, was a great talk on Hammond B benchmarking. So I want to actually first off just thank you for adding MariaDB support in HammerDB. I, um, I noticed you said that actually a while ago, but I didn't quite actually realize how how integrated you, you made it. So um, I'll just start up the questions with a, a quick thank you. Um, for first question, you were starting uh, your talk with talking about uh, differentiations and making sure when you do a benchmark, you, you know what objective you have. Um, so what do you normally see when people do this step wrong? I, that, that's a, a, a great question because I see this time and time again where people will just jump into benchmarking and start producing numbers, but then using it to make comparisons or insights that the numbers don't necessarily back up. So really, probably the, the biggest mistake is people not understanding the database engine, understanding how the database itself actually works, even understanding how a relational database works, <laughs> you know, understanding how you install and configure MariaDB correctly, understanding how you install the operating system, you know, setting up the, the CPU features such as Turbo Boost, you know, having the right disks, what you have configured for your redo log and your data area. You know, are you testing transactional workloads? Are you testing analytics? You know, those whole it's really based on very much experience. And you see people, you know, with a lack of experience really just jumping in, producing numbers, and then drawing insights that they don't really have, you know, either the, the background or the knowledge really to base those insights on. Mm, yeah. and, and then it gets more, doubly more complicated when they try to compare it to something else. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that, that's the, the big, big problem. There's so much that you need to, you know, there's, there's so much configuration you know, an, an expert, I always say, you know, an, an expert, you know, in any database will be able to produce, you know, by far, you know, the, the best numbers, you know, the best performance. But then it depends on what you're actually trying to, you know, configure, for example, in a production environment, that then that's where the real expertise coming comes in to be able to generate those numbers, but then to be able to apply those appropriately to then produce the gains, because ultimately it's your production you know, implementation, that, that, that's exactly what, what your, where your key database is. So the benchmark numbers are very much a tool to help you improve that production environment. Right, okay, sure. So that covers about three questions I had. <laughs> um, so if we go back a little bit, um, how did the TPC Council get involved in HammerDB? Well, HammerDB has been around for you know a, a number of years, so it's always been you know an open source within Intel. You know, Intel supported open source projects right from the start, so it was very much a personal open source project that has grown. You know, always by always by customer demand, by user demand, so people wanting to run benchmarks on different databases you know, with di different configurations. So the TPC, you know, saw that HammerDB was, you know, most importantly is the TPC Open Source Council, so the TPC OSS subcommittee, and they were looking for an open source tool that had the widest support of databases, the most closely applied workloads, which are derived from the TPCC and for transactional and TPCH, 
for analytic. And so it was very much HammerDB that, that fitted the bill. So that's when HammerDB, you know, being open source, then moved under the umbrella of the TPC. Okay. Um, so you mentioned um, that on the, the, the PROC uh, CH is actually coming, the TPROC CH, as a, uh, a conglomerate of the C and the H analytics benchmarks. Um, how did that start to form into uh, a requirement? So, so again, that's been very much from sort of user demand. And I, I think that's probably the biggest shift that we're seeing within relational database workloads today. So traditionally, you know, we've had that, you know, C for you know transactional, you know, and the support for H for, for for analytic, and they've been very much completely separate workloads, completely separate database instances. But customers are saying, you know, we're looking to run both transactional workloads and analytics together. So fortunately, we already have the, the CH specification. So that's already been written and some you know, sample workloads you know, have already been, been produced for that hybrid HTAP with your know, workload. So that the next step is really, and we already have the experience with HammerDB of the transactional analytic. So the next step is really just to work on producing that that hybrid, that CH specification, so then you'll have three options. You'll either have pure transactional, pure analytic, or that hybrid-based workload. And that's the, the real focus. That will be, the goal is for that to be in HammerDB version five. So the goal at least to start producing some of those, you know, next year when the development permits. <laughs> sure, it's just always a tough yeah. squeezing in development time, I know. Exactly. Um, uh, are there any other kind of um, benchmarks and standards that are, are being developed from user requirements? I mean, and that's the, I mean, again, that, that's a, the great question. I mean, the, there's always different, you know, areas like, you know, workloads we could explore, always different, you know, suggestions. But you know, at Anything the moment, I'm... General. Yeah, I mean, at least, but with, you know, the, the, the CH, that, that's the key one. So that's mainly the, you know, the focus on, you know, next on, on the horizon. But one thing about the, 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 for example, with transactional, the TPROC C workload or the TPC C workload, that's one that's very much stood there the test of time. You know, so that's always been the most widely used. It has that it sort of fits very much on that benchmarking spectrum of something that will really drive the, the database and very much test the locking and latching, but it's not overly complex then that needs more time you know, and more expense to implement a very sort of wide range of specification. But also most importantly, I think it's been proven to scale you know, from when it was first introduced right now, you can still, the workload, you can implement that specification with HammerDB. And as long as your database engine and your hardware, you know, as that's increasing in performance all the time with Moore's Law scales, then the specification scales. And that's really, you know, part of the, mo the most key important part of an actual workload to ensure that it's able to test the capabilities of both the hardware and the software combined together. So yeah, what we have is still very, very much robust and you know, still very much appropriate for the hardware and software we have today. But yeah, so next CH is the next one on the horizon. You know, who knows what's coming after that, but we certainly have yeah. enough that you know, can really put demanding workloads on MariaDB today. Sure, okay. Um... So you mentioned some at, at the first question you that some tuning of MariaDB and the OS is kind of needed. Um, what what are the, if there was like a list of four or five things that are commonly missed in tuning? What would they be? I would say that the top one is always the the redo log. So when people run the the TProc C workload in the default environment. So that the default is very much CPU and memory intensive. So historically it was designed, you know, for, you know, so you could do CPU comparisons, you know, with, with a 
for a particular da- database workload. So the, by always the, the top one that people miss is the redo log configuration. So when you're installing you know, and configuring MariaDB you know, for the first time, you're on the current version, you have the one you know, redo log, you know, to be able to size that appropriately, so then you can actually get, because we're going to be driving a lot of throughput here if you size. And then the next thing is very much is the, you know, the, the size of the buffer pool, you know, the buffer cache, how much memory, you know, how much memory you have available to actually cache the data. Because by default, we're going to have pretty much all the data as cached. So then all of the IO throughput will be going through the redo log. So by far the most common you know, error I see is you put the redo log, you know, or maybe a slow, you know, running hard drive, and then that becomes a, the biggest bottleneck. You know, so it, it's it's very much you know the, the basics of configuration, but that's also in understanding you know the workload that you're running. So by understanding that's that that default, it's CPU intensive. We're trying to get the fastest performance possible, it's and nice. then beyond there, you know, you have options mm-hmm. such as. You know, use all warehouses if you want to start adding in I.O., you know, throughput to the data area. But initially, it's that sizing memory, you know, redo log. And also make sure your OS is in, is tuned. So many people miss, you know, that aspect of the workload. Make sure your OS is in, is tuned. For, for CPUs, the most common thing I always see is people will have the CPUs set, for example, in power save mode. And they'll run the workload where you're throttling back the frequency deliberately to half of what the capabilities is. That's always a really common aspect with the, the OS tuning. So make sure that if you have Turbo Boost available, the CPUs are actually set to be able to use that. Okay. Uh, what we're talking about CPUs and frequencies, um, I noticed in your Ice Lake versus uh, uh, Cascade Lake comparison, the ice lake is actually a lower frequency um, core machine and it generates a faster throughput and it's only got slightly more cache on it. So uh, I think there's a, a very important lesson here on the comparison of hardware specs to benchmarks. Um, it's, he, he, exactly. I mean that that that's a, a great a great insight, and it, it's the micro architecture, you know, differences that are producing the higher levels of throughput. So exactly, you can't take different generations of micro architecture and then draw you know a generation to generation comparison, you know, just based on on the frequencies or, or the turbo boost frequencies, because you have different you know aspects, you know, such as you know the the IPC. You know, the instructions you know, per cycle that you're generating. And that, that involves much lower level sort of insights uh, looking at the CPU statistics where you can then actually see the differences in the levels of performance that you're getting. But then there's also the aspects of, you know, the, the scalability. You know, these, for those benchmarks, we're looking at two sockets. So that's very important, you know, to get those insights of how, you know, different CPU architectures may support different levels of scalability, you know, for, for MariaDB. So when you're comparing against, you know, different, di- different manufacturers, for example, of CPUs, you might see very, very different sc- levels of scalability, which will then translate into overall performance. So that's exactly the key reason why we do benchmarking. And then you can look at the statistics, you know, available from the, the systems right down to that, that CPU level, and then that helps you gain the, the insights overall while we're pushing the database, you know, for that aspect such as locking and latching those different instructions, they're going to be exercised. And then you can see the differences between the, the hardware that you're using. Okay. Um, we're probably really short on the end of Q&A time. So if one final question for uh, 30 seconds or so, um, what sort of community contributions would you love to see to HammondDB in the, in the next year or whenever? Uh, what, I mean, we're getting so many you know, sort of you know, contributions at, at the moment, you know, in particular from, from the, you know, the, the cloud vendors. So we've had some, for example, from AWS, you know, from Citus Data, you know, we, we're having so, you know, uh, 
wi a wide range of contributions overall. And it, I would just say that, yeah, the key aspects are really wherever somebody who uses a particular database, you know, such as, you know, such as MariaDB, what they want to see you know, from the, the community. So for example, if you're looking at, you know, on the, the TPROC H side for MariaDB, you know, with the analytics, you know, if you know how, for example, the column store works, you know, if you're looking at wide range of, you know, sort of like parallel queries, you know, that's exactly what we want to see. So very much, you know, a community you know, driven approach, what you want to see in the workload is very much what we want to see contributed. Because it's always been that level of, you know, demand, always that level of just sort of user demand that sets my time where to develop. But then, you know, my time is not necessarily able to cover absolutely everything. I always put in the top priorities. We want MariaDB. You know, that was the top priority to have that included. But now the option is to take that wherever the community wants to take it. Okay. Um... Thank you, Steve. Much appreciate those additional questions and answers. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot.
I'm Marco Mekele, lead developer in ODB at MariaDB Corporation. And now I would like to talk about some changes that uh, we made to the locking and latching primitives in InnoDB for the MariaDB 10.6 release. Heikki Turi, the creator of InnoDB, wanted to distinguish locks and latches. So he calls uh, locks something that are held by transactions maybe for up to hours until the transaction is committed. A locking read would acquire a record lock or a table lock and hold that until the commit or rollback. And latches would be something internal to the implementation, such as page latches. They would be held for maybe microseconds, nanoseconds, or even milliseconds if you are running on slow storage and uh, a page needs to be read into the buffer pool and we have to wait for the for the read operation to complete. Or we want to lock the page while it is being written to the file. We can allow concurrent reads but not concurrent writes to the page. There are also non-locking reads inside a transaction in a DB supports multi-version concurrency control and those non-locking reads wouldn't acquire any transactional locks but they would acquire page latches or if some page is not in the buffer pool they might even acquire the buffer pool mutex for the purpose of uh, ultimately reading the page into the buffer pool and accessing it. The first section of my talk is about improvements to the latches and to the use of latches that are acquired, actually required for correctness. In operating systems or even in the C++ standard library you will find mutexes, condition variables and read-write locks where they are called shared mutex in C++. A mutex is basically an exclusive lock typically acquired around a critical section while modifying some global state that needs to be consistent between multiple threads that might be accessing it. A read-write lock is similar but it allows a mode where multiple readers can access their resource while no, no thread is modifying it. Exclusive shared mutex or exclusive read-write lock would still prevent any other threat from accessing the resource. And uh, combined with mutexes there are condition variables. This can be used uh, to implement some kind of notification mechanism when some global state is protected by a mutex and threats want to be informed or woken up when some interesting change is made to the global state. For example, an in a DB thread uh, wants to signal uh, to wake up the buffer pool uh, cleaner thread, tell it that there is some new work to do, or we need to wait for the buffer pool cleaning batch to finish before something in the buffer pool becomes available. Before MariaDB 10.6, uh, there were some homebrew or custom implementation of synchronization primitives in InnoDB, mostly mutex and event. Mutex was a, a rather complex wrapper around a normal operating system mutex. There was a spin loop for attempting to acquire the mutex in case it is reserved. The spin loop would try to acquire the mutex for some time before going to sleep. And then there was this sync array which registered all waiting threads inside InnoDB so that the, you would see in the error log some long semaphore wait output. Or ultimately if, if the long wait was longer than the InnoDB fatal uh, threshold then the server would kill itself. There was also a something called event which I guess was emulating something that was available in older versions of 
Microsoft Windows. But since Microsoft Windows Vista condition variables are actually supported, so there is no really no real use of, of using these events. They were wrapping a mutex, a condition variable, and a boolean flag. So in MariaDB 10.6 we are using normal mutexes and uh, condition variables instead of using these homebrew mutexes and uh, events. Also, there were custom read-write locks. Uh, these uh, were used for all purposes, even though for many purposes it was an overkill. We could use plain read-write locks with no recursion or ownership passing for many things. But uh, we were actually using the same implementation for everything in, in ADB. Complex implementation was only needed for page latches and index latches, basically. So the page latches have some special requirements, especially because of uh, block operations. When a record is being inserted and doesn't fit into the page, then in a DB may create overflow pages for the long columns, so called blob pages, binary large object. And when we are writing those blobs, we actually allow the blob to be larger than the buffer pool. So we are not locking all the blob pages in the buffer pool at the same time. We are writing the blob one page at a time. Because it's done like that, uh, we must use several mini transactions for writing the blob pages. One, one sub mini transaction per written page. And that sub mini transaction may allocate more pages or will allocate more pages and it uh, may modify the blob pointer in the index leaf page that is pointing to the start of the blob. So for this uh, we must uh, share some page latches with the parent mini transaction that has already possibly already acquired uh, allocated some pages for, for the insert operation and is definitely holding uh, has already made modifications to the index page for inserting the record. So for this uh, ownership uh, sharing between two mini transactions we need recursion. If, if the thread has already acquired the page latch it may acquire the page latch again without waiting because it's the current holder. So we have a reference count for, for the page latches in this case. We also need to support ownership passing. When a page write is initiated, the thread that is initiating it must acquire a latch on the page to prevent concurrent modification of the page. But that latch would be released by another thread which is uh, going to be invoked when the page write completes. And we don't even know which thread that will be when we are initiating the write. So we are we must uh, acquire the latch in a kind of disowned mode so that uh, this uh, recursion logic must not kick in if the same thread happens to attempt to acquire that page latch again. It must wait until the latch has been released by the I.O. thread. Also one more special requirement is uh, this update mode. It's a special version of the exclusive mode which does not allow exclusive or other update logs to be existing concurrently but uh, it does allow concurrent readers. For example if the persistent auto increment uh, field in the index root page is being modified protected by this update log at the same time we can allow reads of other fields in the page. The persistent auto increment uh, field is not normally read by anything or only when opening the table. I said that uh, we are using normal mutexes instead of these homebrew ones, but that was actually a small lie. We are reinventing the mutex where needed. In a few cases it is better to have a smaller mutex than the default operating system mutex. For historical reasons, for example, with the GNU C library on a 64-bit system, the 
size of a mutex would be 48 bytes and with the performance schema instrumentation it would be uh, 8 bytes more for, for that pointer and we don't actually need that for some mutexes which are instantiated with small data objects for which there is no much, not much contention for example there is a mutex in the inner DB table object to protect auto increment counter and that one if we make it uh, smaller then we could have the auto increment counter in the same cache line with the mutex so when we are acquiring the mutex we are already reading the value to the processor cache and can access it quickly so it turns out that uh, we can implement a 4 byte mutex on Windows even we have uh, this uh, Linux Futex equivalent called wait on address. But on Windows we also have this slim read write lock. For this purpose we can use that one. There's no need to reinvent something that exists in the operating system. So this slim read write lock would be 4 or 8 bytes depending on the processor word size on Windows. These uh, small mutexes are only used in special cases where we really need to embed mutex in a frequently instantiated data structure and uh, we obviously will lose the ability to add performance schema instrumentation or a safe mutex with that. The read write locks we also have to reinvent the uh, original all purpose uh, read write lock logic was simplified for those cases where we actually can use a normal read write lock, no recursion, no ownership passing. And for that, uh, on Windows, we can use this slim read write lock just fine. On uh, Linux and on other systems where we have implemented Futex interface, we can use a Futex based uh, writer prioritizing read write lock. So it would comprise this uh, Futex based mutex, which was on the previous slide, with an extra block word for supporting the readers and because it's composed of uh, two, two fields, uh, four byte fields backed by Futex wait queue in the operating system kernel we have two wait queues we have one wait queue for the readers who are waiting for a writer to release a lock or a writer to acquire a lock that is waiting for and then release it and we have a separate waiting queue for the writer who is waiting for the last reader to release the lock so that uh, the writer can acquire it. On systems where we don't have a Futex interface, we can use the native read write lock, which I would guess is typically larger than this 8 bytes. Or we can, if there is no read write lock type, we can implement one with uh, a mutex and two condition variables and a state variable. The index and page touches we can implement based on the futex based uh, read write lock on the previous slide. Even on Windows we have to do this because we need some extra features. So uh, it turns out that uh, with this uh, futex based read write lock we can trivially implement an new variant of the exclusive mode, this update mode, which doesn't allow concurrent update mode or concurrent exclusive mode, but it does allow concurrent readers. And this mode, with this mode we can also easily support upgrade and downgrade between the update and exclusive modes. To support the recursion, recursive update and exclusive locks, we have to add two data fields. One is the thread identifier of the current update or exclusive lock holder so that we know that if we are holding the latch we don't have to wait, we just increment and for incrementing yes, we have this extra field uh, reference count which, uh, has, which is divided into two parts uh, for counting the update and uh, exclusive locks held by the current thread. There is also an implementation available that uses a mutex and two condition variables and some atomic operations. It's not really 
optimized well, but uh, it is there for those systems which do not support Futex. Currently we support Futex for Windows and uh, Linux and uh, OpenBSD. It's also available on on FreeBSD and uh, Dragonfly BSD and Mac OS X and uh, maybe some others, but we haven't implemented it yet. There are some benefits of this refactoring. I already mentioned the reduction of memory footprint. Uh, and actually I, uh, that leads to better locality of reference, that you can, can have the mutex or read write lock on the same cache line with the data that, it's, that it is protecting. So when you acquire the latch, you will also acquire the uh, you will also load the data to the cache or, or when, you, when you are publishing the data and releasing the lock uh, you are doing it in one single step with no extra cache line traffic. Apart from the auto increment uh, example that I already mentioned uh, this is also very useful for the rollback segments which are protecting transaction metadata so we can have transaction starts and commits more with less contention between between threads or new nodes. We lost uh, this uh, sync array and we also simplified uh, the record lock weights. We no longer have a dynamic allocation of a co condition variable for waiting for for a lock to be granted. The refactored lock weight function is simply waiting for a condition variable. And uh, memory for the best example of that is uh, that the buffer page descriptor, uh, si the size of it was uh, 384 bytes in MariaDB 10.2 on 64-bit systems and now we are about half that. And with this refactoring we also gained uh, some more flexibility because it's based on C++ templates we can easily determine what, what kind of features we use. For index latches, index tree latches, it doesn't make sense to use a spin loop because typically those latches would be held for a longer time in exclusive mode. But for Page latches, the spin loop does make sense because typically page latch conflicts occur on leaf pages and those conflicts or critical sections could be short duration most of the time. Also, we don't have any storage overhead for performance schema, for example, for, for the uh, page latches. It was never instrumented, there was no interface for it, but the memory was being allocated. Uh, in vain because it was using the common data type for that. Uh, even though this sync array was removed, uh, I implemented a special watch, watchdog for the dictionary system latch so that we will detect uh, some common cases of server hang, typically server hangs would involve the dictionary system mutex and uh, that is still instrumented even though we don't have this long semaphore weight instrumentation for anything else. The next section is about uh, improving the transactional locks, how we increase the scalability there. So we had a big scalability bottleneck uh, on the lock system mutex it protected uh, the inner DB explicit locks. Uh, inner DB transactional locks are used for anything that is locking records or, or going to modify data. For non-locking rigs, they are not being used. For non-locking rigs, only a shared metadata lock is being acquired to make sure that the concurrent DDL operations such as uh, drop table will not corrupt the data. So for uh, InnoDB locking, we have table locks, usually intention locks, signaling the intention to acquire a shared or exclusive record lock. Foreign key checks would acquire shared locks, but uh, basically any 
data modification would acquire an exclusive lock on a record. For inserts, we don't create explicit uh, record locks. Insert uh, can be detected simply by looking up the transaction ID on the record. If it refers to an active transaction, then that record is implicitly locked in exclusive mode by that transaction. But if there is a record a lock conflict, then explicit lock records will be created. And for update and believe, we currently always create explicit record lock objects. These explicit record lock objects uh, are stored in a hash table, locksys rec hash record hash, uh, indexed by a hash value ca compute from the table sp space identifier and the page number. Record locks are stored in a bitmap uh, which uh, include uh, which are indexed by, by a record heap number, which identifies the record in the page. If the page is reorganized, then the heap number will be renumbered. And if pages are split or merged, then page numbers will be changed as well, and the record blocks will be moved around in, in the hash table. So we wanted to improve scalability by by uh, doing something about the lock system mutex, and that something was that we replaced the mutex with a combination of uh, read-write lock and some lower level latches. So it's still possible to acquire the lock system latch in exclusive mode to lock everything. If we acquire the lock system latch and the transaction mutex that we are interested in, then the transaction cannot be committed and we can check the state of the transaction and determine if something is locked. That's a trivial way. But for best uh, uh, concurrency, we would acquire the lock system latch in shared mode so that multiple threads can get into the same code. And then we would uh, acquire whatever we are interested in. If we are interested in whether a table is locked, we would acquire the table lock mutex and then acquire the transaction mutex of, of the transaction that seems to hold the lock on the table. And if that transaction is still active, then we know that, okay, it's really locked by this, this uh, transaction. And similar for the record locks, we would uh, acquire a latch on a cache line in the record uh, hash table and uh, then access the bitmaps that are pointed by the hash table. And once we find an interesting lock, then we could uh, acquire the transaction mutex to check if the transaction is still in active state. So the basic idea is that we allow concurrent access uh, to logs on unrelated uh, tables or, or uh, records or pages. And also to improve the scalability, uh, the log weight logic was rewritten and uh, the latching order of uh, the logs of weight mutex was uh, change so that the whole time of, of that mutex would be shorter. There used to be a separate thread, a lock timeout thread that would wake up once per second and then that thread would uh, go through some InnoDB bookkeeping of uh, lock weights and then with one second granularity it would notice that okay this lock timeout has expired. Basically you would for a one second transaction timeout, you would mostly get a two second timeout because you would have this extra thread doing the wake up. Now, with the refactor logic, we are directly using a P thread cont time to wait inside this lock wait function. And the operating system knows which threads are waiting. We don't have to care about that. Uh, an, an analogy about this. Uh, lock system latch, this concurrent access, would be an apartment building. Previously this lock system mutex was a global lock on the front door of the building. Only one person can enter the building at a time. And once they lock the front door, 
they get in and they, then they are allowed to access any apartment, any room in any apartment. And then they get out and uh, release the lock and then the next guy can get into the building. Now we have this shared uh, lock on the front door. As long as somebody is inside the building, it's not allowed. They, they are holding a shared lock and it's not allowed uh, for anybody to get an exclusive access such as uh, for demolishing the house. When we are, uh, when we are resizing the NNB buffer pool, we are rebuilding the record lock hash table and that is similar to demolishing a house. So once we uh, have people inside the building, they have shared locks, uh, shared latch on the lock system, then they will acquire locks on the uh, then they will acquire locks on the apartment doors that they, they want to enter. And if they want to acquire enter two apartments, for example, for moving something between two cash lines of the hash table, then they will acquire this in a particular order to avoid deadlocks. And uh, uh, what else? Uh, an alternative might be that uh, instead of having these locks on the apartment doors, you would have a row of mailboxes somewhere else. You would first uh, put the notice on the front door of the building saying that I'm inside or I'm going to be inside and then you, you go somewhere else you compute a hash value of what you are going to lock, uh, 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 what you are going to access inside the building you go to s some row of mailboxes saying that I'm going to access one of these apartments or rooms and then you go in. That, that is the approach that was uh, chosen in uh, MySQL 8.0 but uh, in MariaDB we are using the locks near the data, so we avoid uh, such bad uh, locality of reference. When we acquire the lock, we are already load the data into the cache. So here is an example of that. Uh, an update on a page ID2, it will have to create a record lock on that index record. And for that, uh, we will acquire a shared latch on the lock system and then we will acquire an exclusive latch on, on the hash table chart where this hash value of the page ID is located and then we will follow the chain of pointers to get to our bitmap page or we will add a new new page if there is no bitmap and we register the lock and then we first release uh, this uh, hash uh, short latch and then we release the global latch so that other threads can enter. Another example is that an insert involves uh, splitting a page. The data doesn't fit in the current page ID 2 so some of the records will be moved uh, to page ID 3 and in this example it happens so that uh, the hash values of these page IDs are in the same shot of the hash table and we only have to acquire one batch on the one batch on one one shot of, of the record hash table and then we are free to move data between these record or bitmaps or create new objects or free old ones. Lock system batch acquisition when rebuilding the hash table while resizing the inner DB buffer pool. For this operation we will just have to acquire this exclusive latch and then we are free to move records and create a new hash table of a different size and uh, copy everything from the old hash table to the new one and then discard the old hash table and change the pointer. We actually got the race condition uh, which I already mentioned that if you optimistically in some other thread uh, released a shared lock system latch first and then released one of these uh, read while locks on, on, on the record hash bitmap. Then in that case we, we would actually get a case where this uh, buffer pool resizing has freed uh, the hash table and uh, and the uh, thread would uh, be releasing the latch on something that was already freed. 
So we catch that with the RR tool and with address sanitizer. One final example is transaction commit. It used to acquire the lock system latch, uh, the lock system mutex exclusively. So you couldn't have multiple transactions committing at the same time. But now, thanks to this shared latch, we can do the following. First, uh, the commit will acquire the transaction mutex and change the state of the transaction. That is what atomically marks the transaction committed. And then it will release that transaction mutex. And other threads can already observe the transaction as committed. But now we have some garbage. We have, we have some explicit locks uh, attached to the transaction. When other threads are visiting this, they might see this uh, lock here and uh, notice that it's uh, actually belonging to a committed transaction. They would have to acquire the transaction mutex and check the state and notice that, okay, it's committed, we will ignore this lock. So we would definitely have to re remove those locks to free up memory and to avoid extra processing in other threads. So the transaction commit uh, does it in an optimistic way. It will acquire a shared latch on the lock system and then it will acquire an exclusive mutex on the transaction again and uh, then because this is the wrong order of normally doing things. Normally the transaction mutex would have to be acquired last after first you acquire this uh, lock system latch then you acquire the hash table latch and then you acquire the transaction mutex but now we are violating the order. We are first acquiring the transaction mutex and then we are trying to acquire one of these uh, hash table latches. It is safe to do this if we don't uh, have a blocking weight for, for this mutex. If we do it with a trilog operation then it is fine uh, because uh, if some other thread is holding this one and waiting for the transaction mutex we will just skip this and uh, proceed to the next uh, record and, and next lock that protects it. And if we are lucky, then we will get rid of mo most of this garbage and we may run another round of, of this uh, optimistic operation. If uh, still after five rounds of this optimistic uh, discard batches, we have some objects left, then we will resort to acquiring an exclusive lock system latch and transaction mutex and then we free everything that is left. But that should be rather uncommon or rare. So was this uh, worth the trouble? Well, it of course depends on the benchmark or on the workload you are running. And here I did a, a simple benchmark with about 40 gigabytes of data that would fit into the buffer pool. And I let the sysbench read-write test run for 5 minutes on each thread count or concurrent connections count ranging from 10 uh, to 160 connections in uh, always dub doubling the number of connections in between and in this graph we can see that uh, here up to 40 concurrent connections there is a slight improvement it's barely visible on the slide but uh, you can see that both for the average throughput we have slightly better throughput on, on the 10.6 development snapshot that I was using versus the corresponding 10.5 development snapshot of that day. And for the average latency, same thing, we have a slightly lower latency on 10.6 than on 10.5, up to 40 connections. But after 40 connections, I measured at 80, I don't know where the actual pivot point is, but after that you can see that for this benchmark, 10.5 was actually delivering a little bit better throughput and uh, latency. But what is not shown in this uh, slide is that uh, the slow shutdown that I had at the end of the benchmark to uh, purge all the history of committed transactions at the end so that I have a clean starting point for the next round. That one would take much longer on 10.5 than on 10.6. Maybe it is th thanks to eliminating the dictionary system mutex in 10.6, it's coming up in 10.6.5.
But also that was not so simple. If you remove some global or big contention point, like if you are adding new lanes or removing some traffic lights on a major highway that is leading to a city, you might get uh, more congestion inside the city. And uh, we actually got that when removing the Dixie's mutex. We got some contention in the buffer pool for the purge threads. We got, uh, got a reduced performance. So for now I added a small workaround. Uh, the purge tasks are acquiring and releasing the exclusive Dixie's mutex just to alleviate this. But uh, of course we need, need to do more, more work to improve the purge, make it more adaptive so that uh, we can remove that uh, workaround. And it's of course not a guarantee that the workaround is uh, making things better for everybody. But uh, that's the nature of uh, performance fixes. You never know what is the next surprise. Finally, I would like to mention some future plans that we know about, uh, that we are planning to improve performance. One of the biggest uh, scalability bottlenecks is this uh, log system mutex, which is protecting the right ahead lock, the inner DB read lock file. Currently, we are holding that mutex when we are constructing a lock block and while we are computing a checksum on the entire block. With a different file format we could uh, compute log checksums up front for the mini transactions, uh, transaction logs, logs and uh, only for copying the log snippets to the log buffer we would have to hold the mitex. That, that should help a little bit. Also another idea is that uh, we could use asynchronous I.O. for writing the log like we do for data page writes. Currently we use synchronous I.O. for log writes. And we know that the synchronous writes can actually block in the file system with a F-sync or F-data sync operation. If we used uh, asynchronous write for the read log, we would uh, probably get a bit more write performance. Also in the log system, we could uh, reduce the amount of explicit record locking needed. If there is a operation that will lock the whole table uh, or lock all the rows in a table, like uh, an update without a where clause, then it would be better to just acquire an explicit, uh, exclusive table lock for that operation. Or if we have a select star lock for update or select star lock in share mode. We, we, we would uh, better just acquire a table lock instead of acquiring locks on the individual records. So that, that would be nice. Another one would be that we could uh, use implicit uh, record locking also for updates and deletes. Currently updates and deletes will first perform a locking read, then create an ex explicit record lock, then release the page latch and then reacquire the page latch when we are coming again to InnoDB with another uh, member function call. And then we have this uh, explicit record block that is protecting us. But if we didn't uh, release and reacquire the page latch for that short period, we wouldn't have to create that uh, explicit record block at all. We would also save some other trouble like, like the prefetch buffer that we currently have in InnoDB. For improving NUMA scalability, I guess we could still look at uh, whether we could improve our homebrew index implementation to be more NUMA friendly. But uh, other than that, I think we need to think about even bigger changes, which may be unfeasible or may require lots of effort. But uh, generally, to have better performance on non-uniform memory access systems, is uh, to avoid frequent cache invalidation between NUMA nodes or CPU sockets. So you don't want to have a situation where the ownership of some data is uh, frequently passing between NUMA nodes. We would 
have to make uh, data structures and uh, the thread pool somehow aware of, of these uh, processor sets or numerals or CPU sockets. That's probably something outside of InnoDB. So that is all I wanted to say in this talk. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marco, for the presentation. Um, can you tell us a bit about how you started to think about NADB locking and latches and improving them? Yeah, I think it started a couple of years ago when I was working on the 10.5 release and uh, simplifying the buffer pool. I got rid of the buffer pool mutex and uh, then it turned out that uh, something needs to be done also about the uh, so, sorry, I, I got rid of the block mutex, but not, not the buffer pool mutex. For the buffer pool mutex, one thing that had to be done was uh, uh, to introduce a smarter page hash. That uh, when you are looking up a page ID, table space ID, and page number, we are using a spin loop, a spin lock in 10.5 code already for that. That is a special case because uh, the critical sections are typically very short. So we use a spin lock type of uh, mutex for, for that hash table. And uh, then I thought that uh, it would be nice to have this uh, very small mutex or, or latch to be used elsewhere. And also, I, for a long time, I, I wasn't satisfied with uh, the InnoDB homebrew mutexes, which were too big and, uh, and there were various issues like uh, this uh, UT delay function consuming a lot of CPU cycles on useless spinning and so on. Yeah, I remember looking at that heaps of times going, what can we do? The, the problem is bigger than just this loop. So um, Yes, I, th I think that it was mostly a workaround for poorly written code. Like a, there used to be a contention on transaction system mutex and uh, on file system mutex and uh, different mutexes and for most of them but also in ten, uh, six, uh, the lock system mutex. Yeah, that that yeah, was so very important to fix because them all exclusively. That meant you had to actually spin more. Right uh, for for that one, uh, spinning was a good workaround. And as soon as we went to the native mutex, then we started to lose performance. So we definitely had to split that mutex. True. True. Okay. Um, you mentioned like the order increment was like in the, the same cache line now as its value, and that obviously provides the cache locality. Does that mean there's an opportunity to go further in to change some of these operations to atomic memory operations? Well, actually, for the auto increment uh, mutex, there is an old MDEV that we should uh, uh, remove this uh, auto increment locking all together and instead fix the problem in the replication layer. Problem is that for statement-based replication, we need this uh, special auto increment lock mode, whatever. Uh, that uh, that uh, auto increment lock needs to be reserved until the end of the statement. And that, that's exactly because of statement-based replication. For that one, I think the correct fix is to remove the code altogether. I, I don't think yeah. we, we can use atomic memory operations for that because we re really need to protect it no. uh, until the end of the statement. So just remove statement based replication then. <laughs> yeah, I'd no, say even better better for the cache when you don't have any uh, when you don't have the data. Yep, yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned the dic sys uh, latch. Um, what operations are covered under that one? Well, in the upcoming 10.6.5 uh, release, it was uh, simplified further. We don't have the Dictis mutex anymore. So the latch is uh, okay. the only one that is protecting the dictionary cache. And uh, the Dictis latch used to protect uh, the data dictionary tables so that any operation that is going to lock any InnoDB internal data dictionary table, it, it would uh, acquire this Dictis latch. But that, that okay. logic was removed. So okay. now, now, now we are relying on InnoDB 
table logs for those system tables and the Dixis latches more or less it's just protecting the cache so readers uh, like table lookups if, if the data is in the cache they will use a shared latch and uh, writers or, or lookup if it, it needs to be loaded to the cache they, they will use an exclusive latch so you're saying the data dictionary is effectively transformed into normal kind of tables is that an oversimplification well, it's a bit uh, simplified because uh, we still have a special recovery for, for the dictionary tables. But uh, other than that, yes, uh, we don't have that much uh, special logic around around the uh, dictionary tables as, as we used to. Okay. Um, how do you go about measuring uh, the cache locality improvements um, that you've done? Well, basic uh, sys bench benchmarks. Okay, at macroscopic level. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I made a uh, wrote a test program, and actually, I created a separate repository for for this uh, metaxis and uh, and read write logs. I, I would like to see them appear in some future C plus plus standard. So I did some benchmarking with that as well, but. Uh, of course, it's an artificial benchmark. You start a large number of threads, and uh, and then uh, all of them will bombard the same mutex. And uh, it turns out that, uh, of course, the more CPUs you have, the slower it will run. Like on a laptop with uh, four or eight uh, cores or, or threads, uh, it will run faster than on a Numa machine with two sockets and uh, 40 threads. Yeah. Uh, uh seen I guess the um, Linux kernel and uh, glibc folks um, waiting a number of years to try to um, refine and, and reinvent <laughs> locking so um, well done on getting something out the door and, and that works for NADB yeah I think uh, there is no ma magic bullet in locking you can do some things at the low level but uh, some things really need to be addressed at the high level. So if you have a contention on a metax, then it's your problem. You cannot, cannot blame the implementation. But there are also some implementation problems. One, one surprise that I just learned, maybe it was this week, that uh, this atomic fetch or fetch and and such operations, if they are operating on a sin single bit, then there would be a, an Intel 386 instruction lock bts lock btr and so on that could uh, do this single bit modification efficiently but the compiler is emitting a loop around a compare exchange which is uh, something that is recommended against so compilers have bugs as well and we have to work around them by by adding some inline assembler even though i don't like it but uh, i think i will do it yeah yeah plenty of comments saying delete this later when they catch up <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, is there any kind of uh, lock -ex escalation upwards? I mean, from row to page to chunk um, now? No, no, there is nothing like that. And uh, there is an op open... There is an open issue that uh, even, even for a table scan locking read or index scan lo locking read that is uh, going to access all the records. For that one, we are we are acquiring individual record locks and that's really not that's optimal we should lock the whole table yes okay that but there, there is definitely nothing dynamic like if we would notice that now we are going to lock lots of records then then we should escalate to page level or something like that. we don't have that the yes, only thing so that I is guess... kind of page level is that uh, that we have this bitmap uh, of all locks that belong to the same page so it's kind of page level, but there's a bit okay. for each record. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so um, I guess um, if uh, DBA start actually, um, once you get the table locking for, you know, bulk scans, um, that means even at the query planning layer, there should be an idea up front as to how much of a table you're actually going to be locking ahead of time. 
Yes, I think if, if we wanted to have more performance, then there should be some kind of smart uh, read ahead or some, some kind of hints to the storage engine that this query is going to access these uh, ranges and uh, the read ahead could start earlier or something like that. Also, one thing that is definitely missing is uh, is that uh, we don't have any any interface that would report how many pages of some range is in the buffer pool in some index. So the query planner doesn't make any decision that, okay, we already have this index in the buffer pool, we can we, we'd better use this one rather than load something else. Ah, right, yep, yep, yeah. But th those are really, uh, those things I think they are mostly outside the storage engine, it's uh, more the query optimizer and planner. Okay. You mentioned that um, changing to sequential um, log writes to something a bit more dynamic. Um, what kind of effects is that going to have on the locking system? Uh, the uh, lock, uh, re real lock uh, uh, framing change, you may, I mean the variable size uh, blocks for real lock. Or did, get, did I get the right word, word uh, log or lock? Yeah, so, so you redo undo logs. And if they change from sequential to something else, does, is that going to change some bottlenecks in some way? Well, I think that uh, this uh, circular redo log is probably easiest to deal with. Uh, I was at some point I was thinking that uh, we should have an append only log file and, and then invoke some special file system operation to to trim the start of the file. But uh, now, now I think uh, that that the circular write, write is easier. It uh, works everywhere and uh, can be pretty efficient and easy to map to persistent memory as well. But uh, what we can can do is uh, that uh, we can change the redo log block format to allow it uh, to support arbitrary block size, whatever the storage layer, whatever is optimal for the storage layer. Like on, on persistent memory, it would be 256 bytes and uh, on uh, on uh, anything else uh, on Linux, I, I guess it might be four kilobytes for, for yeah, the no. file system Sorry. layer. Yep. And for, and, uh, for that, uh, that kind of change, I hope that they, it will also reduce contention on the, on the log system mutex because uh, we would be able to uh, compute checksums while not holding the mutex. Currently, the checksum is on the whole block. We should do it on the individual records, I think. Makes sense. Yep. So, have you had any um, inspirational thoughts um, since you first recorded this talk? Since I first thought, I, I have a bit. Did... Since you recorded the the talk that you've thought of in the meantime. Well, not not really on, on this one. Uh, only so, there have been some some small improvements on, on this uh, atomic. Uh, Mutex primitives to, to make them perform better on Intel architecture, to make use of this lock BTS instruction and so on. But uh, nothing, nothing really has changed uh, in this uh, about one month. Okay, Marco, I think that's all we've got time for um, in Q&A. So um, thank you for all the work um, in improving it and thank you for presenting today. Yeah, thank you. It was great to be here. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Marco Mäkelä, lead developer in Adibi at MariaDB Corporation. Today I will talk about uh, how we made data definition language operations grass safe in the MariaDB server 10.6 release. So you may know that uh, MariaDB provides ACID transactions, atomic, consistent, isolated and durable. That only held for DML, data manipulation language operations such as uh, insert or delete, but not uh, to DDL until the 10.6 release. So in earlier versions with, uh, of MariaDB, if you, your server got killed at a critical moment while executing, executing alter table or create table or something like that, you could, uh, if you were unfortunate, you would get an inconsistent data dictionary or you would get corrupted tables. In the 10.6 release, we provide grass safe DDL operations and to achieve that we didn't change any of the existing file formats. We only introduced one new log file, DDL recovery log file, to make the, the provide recovery of uh, any, any in progress DDL operations during the crash. So there is an additional DDL recovery step and uh, during the execution of uh, DDL operations a file DDL underscore recovery that log will be updated. So this is an additional file in addition to the storage engine recovery log and, and the bin log. And for example if the server was killed during a rename table operation, if it was a partition table, then each partition would be re renamed separately inside InnoDB at least. But uh, this uh, recovery log would uh, guarantee that uh, either the rename will complete for all partitions of the table or it will be re uh, rolled back for all of them. And similar for drop table or create table. For native alter table, which is executed inside uh, the storage engine, there is uh, an additional internal interface. So during alter table, the, there are two table definitions in the .frm files, the old one and the new one. And the recovery must ask the storage engine which table version is the, the uh, correct one. That is, was, was it this alter table operation committed or not? And then it will rename the file back or will delete the extra file. It should be noted that the DDL is crash safe but it's not transactional yet and uh, it is not even atomic for some operations. For example, drop database is being logged as uh, individual atomic uh, drop table statements internally. So if the server is uh, killed during the execution of drop database, then you might end up with any number of the tables in that database dropped once the server is restarted. Now some bi basics how DDL operations are implemented or were implemented in the InnoDB storage engine. Uh, InnoDB was conceived as a standalone database. It was integrated in MySQL 3.23 release in 2000 or 2001. So the .frm files and, and the SQL layer of uh, MySQL was an extra layer. And uh, the InnoDB dictionary was not really changed. Uh, it, it was only extended with this extra layer of, of the .frm file. So in InnoDB there are four hard-coded tables in the system table space. Sys tables which contains table names and uh, some other data. Sys columns, which contains information about the, all columns in the table, one row per column. And then there is Sys indexes, which contains uh, information about the indexes on the table. And finally, Sys field, which contains the key uh, columns of each index. This is a subset of uh, what is stored in the .frm files. For example, 
we don't store the default value expressions for columns inside InnoDB. It's only kept in the .fm file. Then there are some additional tables. Sys foreign and sys foreign calls contain the foreign key constraint information. And uh, in MySQL 5.7 and uh, MariaDB 10.2, there was a new table added, sys virtual, which contains information about the base columns of virtual columns. And uh, also there were tables, sys table spaces and sys data files, which were added in the MySQL 5.6 release and the MariaDB 10.0 release. The intention of these uh, these uh, tables uh, was to provide uh, metadata for create table space and supporting table spaces inside InnoDB tables. But uh, this was not never implemented in MariaDB. It was implemented in MySQL 5.7, but not MariaDB for InnoDB tables. So it turns out that we can actually remove those two tables without any harm. It's actually easier that way because those tables were never updated in case of an upgrade from, from a 5.5 release. You wouldn't have metadata for those, those uh, old tables in those system tables. So now in MariaDB 10.6 we don't have these sys table spaces and sys data files tables anymore. They are not updated, not accessed, not, not created at startup. Uh, to provide ACID, we need locking and logging. And uh, for tables, an important locking mechanism is the metadata locks. It is a lock on the table name or on the database name. Generally, any operation on a table will acquire a shared metadata lock. And uh, it was this mechanism was also being used in some InnoDB internal operations, starting with the 10.2 release. For example, if a, if a table contains indexed virtual columns, then the purge of transaction history would have the access to table definition in, in the SQL layer, and for that it would acquire a metadata lock. In the 10.5 release, we always acquire a metadata lock in the purge of history. And uh, the, meta, the main use of the metadata lock is to provide uh, mutual exclusion of DDL operations. So if any operation is accessing a table, we do not allow DDL operations to execute at the same time. So any DDL operation would acquire an exclusive metadata lock to prevent concurrent execution of DDL on the same table, but also to prevent concurrent execution of any operation of that same on that same table during the critical phase. This uh, exclusive metadata lock may be downgraded and upgraded again. Is, uh, for example, during alter table, there's a prepare step, then there might be a data copying step, and then after the copying, we will upgrade to exclusive metadata lock again so that we can commit the alter operation. But during the copying, we can allow concrete access to the table. Mm. So the domain of, of the metadata lock is a table or a database. For example, in drop database, it will acquire exclusive metadata lock on, on all tables in the ta uh, database. Or it could be global if you are issue some backup stage command or flush tables with read lock, it will basically acquire a metadata lock on all tables. The scope or duration of a metadata lock is a statement, that is it's released at the end of the statement, or it, the, it is transaction released at transaction commit or rollback, or it is explicit, so that uh, there must be explicit calls for acquiring and releasing the metadata lock. InnoDB internal operations are always using these explicit locks. In InnoDB, we have some additional logging, uh, sorry, locking. Uh, there are some operations which do not acquire InnoDB table or index record locks. The purge of history and uh, the repeatable reads using multi-versioning concurrency control 
they never acquire any inodipy locks. They are only protected by the metadata lock. Then we have inodipy table locks. Typically during DML operations, we acquire an intention lock on the table, intention exclusive or intention shared, meaning that we are going to lock, uh, acquire ex uh, exclusive or shared locks on index records that we are accessing. And uh, on DL operations, uh, with the new refactoring, we are always acquiring an exclusive table lock. But uh, in the past it used to be so that uh, DDL operations are mostly protected by an exclusive, just uh, acquiring the data dictionary cache in exclusive mode. The dict system mutex and the dict system latch or dict operation lock. The index record locks, uh, before they can be acquired, there must exist a corresponding table lock. And if a table lock, uh, for example, if an exclusive table lock exists, then we don't have to acquire any index record locks because that would be covered by the exclusive table lock. And because there was not consistent uh, metadata lock, lock uh, acquisition inside InnoDB, Rollback and Birds used to acquire the dict system latch in shared mode just to prevent any concurrent uh, DDL operation from dropping the table or so. Originally in InnoDB there was a rather badly working DDL recovery. It was only implemented for create table and drop table and at most one table or partition could be covered in, in a DDL operation. So there was a header field, header field that was uh, stored in the unlock header identifying the table that is being created or dropped. And uh, in MySQL or MariaDB, if you have a partition table, then each partition is actually treated as a separate table in InnoDB. So you couldn't have atomic operation covering multiple partitions of a table, like creating a partition, partition table was never atomic inside InnoDB, couldn't be because of this limitation. So the recovery was that uh, we would normally roll back changes to the data dictionary tables, but then there would be an additional step that uh, if we see some table ID in the unlock header, then we will execute additional DDL operation to try to drop that table ID from the dictionary. And there were also some additional hacks needed for, for uh, the internal tables of full text index. So there was a step to drop any orphan tables, which uh, if, if there was a drop table that contained full text indexes, then the auxiliary tables belonging to that table were not being dropped atomically. So they have to be dropped separately on startup. Rename table was not really working. There was not proper redo logging for rename operations and there was no undo logging uh, for renaming the files. So if, if the server was killed during something that would rename a data file, typically you would you would get uh, the data file, a, a mismatch between the data file name and the table name. So in MariaDB 10.2.19 to have a proper backup of truncate operations, we, we had to implement better logging of rename operations. A new undo log record was uh, introduced uh, for rename table, but you could argue that it's uh, redundant because uh, we could uh, have passed uh, the undo lock records for the systables.name, the internal table. But unfortunately, this uh, the primary key of the systables table is not the table ID, which never changes. It is the table name. And in InnoDB, if a primary key is updated, it will be logged as a delete of the old primary key and insert of a record with the new primary key. So it would have been difficult to distinguish a rename operation from a create and drop operation. So this uh, new record made it easier. 
So I already mentioned this uh, problem that there was only one slot for storing this uh, table ID that uh, was subjected uh, to create table or drop table. Another severe problem with the old EnoDB DDL implementation was that uh, there was an internal trigger implemented for the sysindexes table. When EnoDB was executing a delete operation on the sysindexes table, it would immediately free the index tree that was associated with that record. And if the transaction was later rolled back or if the server was killed before the commit of the transaction was made durable, then you would uh, end up with uh, the sysindexes table pointing to something that is not a valid index anymore. And if you are unlucky, then these pages could be reused for something else and you would get serious corruption. You could get uh, several tables trying to access the same pages as if there were their own, own, own pages. So it could cor corrupt also other things than just this index. And uh, also back when InnoDB was integrated with uh, MySQL, I guess uh, at some point somebody noticed in internal testing that we have this problem that uh, the MySQL layer is trying to drop a table that is still being used or st still being locked. Instead of fixing that problem, uh, Heikki Turi added this hack background drop table queue. So if a drop table is attempted, then it will be in queued and it will be executed later. And this wasn't even crash safe. If the server was killed after something was added to the drop table queue, it would be forgotten on restart, you would, uh, that table would be, never be dropped. But that was fixed in the MariaDB 10.2.19 release. So there we have this uh, background uh, queue, but it's uh, persistent. It will be, uh, the tables will be dropped uh, after recovery because we will rename the tables to a hash SQL dash IB prefix so we can detect them. But anyway, this was not, uh, this is still not acid and uh, it's not acceptable for proper DDL implementation. Then we had uh, more trouble. InnoDB persistent statistics was introduced in MySQL 5.6. Uh, there are two system tables, InnoDB table stats and InnoDB index stats, and these are actually accessible to users. Users are actually supposed to be able to modify these tables so that they can change the persistent statistics of, of some table and uh, to, to have the optimizer, to, to make the optimizer aware of uh, these tweaked statistics. And there was not, not proper locking around this. No metadata locking inside the InnoDB internal operations that modify these tables. And also not proper locking or not atomic operation with DDL operations. For example, during an alter table uh, or uh, I guess alter table or drop table, we would uh, separately commit the DDL operation to finish the alter table or drop table and after that we would start separate transactions, not even single transaction but multiple transactions to update the statistics, to delete the statistics or to rename statistics when renaming table and, and so on. And uh, this would of course uh, lead to often entries or some inconsistency between the statistics tables and, and uh, the actual data dictionary. There were also hangs related to uh, background statistics auto recalculation. So how did we fix this? Uh, well, first let's look at the DML, data manipulation language. Why, why does that work? What is it doing right and could we learn something from it? So basic uh, primitives or the magic that makes ACID, atomic, consistent, isolated and durable work is locking and logging. And uh, for DML the basic locking and logging is actually page locks and redo log. Anything that is changed in InnoDB will be will be uh, implemented as uh, an atomic change 
to a single or multiple pages. And these changes are, are encapsulated in entities called mini transactions. So in a mini transaction, the pages that are going to be modified, they will be locked in exclusive mode. No other modification will be allowed at the same time. And uh, when that mini transaction is committed, then a log for those modifications will be written to the redo log buffer and the page logs will be released. There is no rollback of mini transactions. It's only commit. And once the log for that mini transaction from the global log buffer has been written to the relog files, then we do this write and this is the write ahead logging, then we are allowed to write those modified pages to the data files. But for durability, what counts is that the, the redo log was durably written. Even if the pages were never written and the server was killed, the server will be able to recover from that, that redo log. And to make recovery faster, we have this concept of log checkpoint. It means that uh, we are writing pages, modified pages back to the data files and uh, whenever the oldest uh, LSN of, of a modified page is moving forward, we may change the log LSN, the uh, log, uh, log checkpoint LSN to that. So we can logically discard the start of the redo log and the recovery could then start from that checkpoint LSN to the end of the log. So in, on a normal shutdown, the redo log would always be empty, logically. So how do these DML transactions work? Well, first of all, every access to tables is covered by MDL, shared MDL. And any modification of tables is covered by InnoDB table logs, typically intention exclusive or exclusive. A delete operation will not delete data immediately. It will also only schedule the data for future removal. It will delete mark the records. And the removal can happen after commit. When there is no old review that might want to see the old data review that was created before the transaction was committed, such reviews may still see the data, but once all those reviews are closed, then Perch is allowed to proceed and delete those delete mark records. And uh, like I said uh, for the previous slide, any uh, we have this right ahead logging, but uh, for transactions there is also this thing that uh, if some change is important, typically many tra mini transaction commits are not important. If you have a huge insert operation, it could uh, consist of uh, thousands or millions of mini transactions, but we don't really care if those are durable. We care whether the commit is durable. So once that huge insert is committed, then we must make sure that the redo lock up to the LSN that marks the transaction as committed is written, durably written to the redo lock. Then we can say that this was committed. So then let's compare this to DDL. It is very similar. Now with this revised design, every access to tables is covered by MDL, but that's exclusive MDL, not shared. And any modification of tables is always covered by exclusive InnoDB table lock. And a drop operation or any DDL that is uh, going to delete files, it will not remove anything immediately. It will only schedule that for future removal after the commit has been durably written to the redo lock. Of course, if, if the server, there is no multi-versioning for DDL, so if the server is not killed after that commit becomes durable, it will delete the .ibd file immediately after that. But if the server is killed, then this uh, IBD file removal would, would happen in the purge of history after the server restarts. It may, may take, take some time because uh, there could be many other changes waiting for purge first. But it will be done. And uh, last point uh, of durability is that there are some additional durability requirements around uh, file system operations. If we are going to rename a file, we must first durably write a rename log record to the redo log. Only after we have done f-sync or f -data sync of the redo log for that, we are allowed to rename the file. And similar for file deletion. 
And one more thing that we fixed, uh, I think it was necessary for this DDL to be crash safe in InnoDB was that uh, we removed some hack around file creation. It used to be so that uh, when an .ipd file was created, we would uh, write a dummy first file to that page and do an f-sync of that write so that the recovery would be able to read uh, something like the table space identifier from that first page. But that is actually violating write-ahead logging. Write-ahead logging means that uh, everything will be written to the log first and there is no redo log record for this uh, write the first page, this pseudo thing. So we removed that uh, that uh, additional initialization of, of a dummy first page and now InnoDB is able to recover just fine based on the redo log records. If, if it finds an empty data file or a data file that consists of only zero bytes, it will rem uh, remember that this is a special file, we need a special recovery for this and uh, later af after all the redo log has been scanned it will make sure that uh, it can recover that file from the redo log. If it can't, then it will flag an error and you can use the InnoDB force recovery to ignore this file. So how we made DDL more atomic? Well, it turns out that we didn't have to introduce any more undo log record types or redo log record types in InnoDB. We just had to improve the rollback and purge. I already mentioned that purge will remove .ibd files after commit, if the server was killed, and purge will do it after recovery, our server restart. Also rollback was improved. If a create table statement is being, or something that is creating a data file is being rolled back, then similar to insert, a rollback of insert will delete the inserted record immediately, and a rollback of uh, create will delete the .ibd file immediately. And now with this new uh, setup we don't update this uh, header field, the table ID header field in, in the undulog header anymore. We leave it at zero just like uh, DML transactions would. So we may easily modify multiple tables or partitions just fine in a single DDL transaction. And not only that, we can modify the statistics tables atomically in the same transaction. So if you drop a table, we will be able to delete the statistics for that table. No problem anymore. Same with rename table. And uh, it gets even better than that. Because we are protecting everything with metadata locks or exclusively in ADB table locks, we don't have to hold these dict system latches in rollback or purge to prevent concurrent DDL. And uh, in fact, we removed the dict system mutex altogether in uh, the 10.6.5 release. So there is more concurrency. Tables can be looked up uh, concurrently if they are in present in the InnoDB table cache. So we got uh, much better throughput for some cases. So how does this uh, DDL recovery work? Well, just like DML recovery, we will recover data from based on redo log records and uh, we will roll back incomplete transactions that were recovered from the undo log pages that were covered by the redo log. For DDL we always did uh, synchronous rollback at InnoDB startup. For DML we do that uh, in the background while the server is already accepting connections. Around native outer table there is some extra logic needed because uh, to be able to implement this uh, DDL log recovery step the DDL recovery will ask InnoDB whether the alter table was committed or whether this definition of the table is the latest one or if it if it is the if if the other dot frm file is the latest one. So for that, the InnoDB needs to know the transaction ID in the data dictionary tables, and uh, to guarantee that during a critical section of uh, 
committing out our table inside InnoDB we will disable the purge of any history, then the DDR, log, DDR recovery log will be updated and then purge can resume again. Or, or the DDL operation will be finished in the SQL layer and then purge will resume again. If the server was killed at that point, then we will not start purge of history before the DDL log recovery has been executed. And the log recovery will ask InnoDB for the transaction IDs. And after that recovery has been finished, we can resume purge and we can reset the transaction IDs in the dictionary tables. Also, uh, worth men mentioning is that there is no drop table queue anymore. We removed it. We still use this uh, special file name prefix hash SQL dash IB during operations that are going to delete files. Those those operations will first internally in SadinoDB dictionary tables rename the table to that file name and then delete the record from, from this tables and the dictionary tables. And after commit this uh, hash SQL dash IB file will be removed. So that, that, that guarantees that uh, we, we don't have a problem with those. And of course we fixed something something main reason for for this background drop table queue was that uh, the error handling of create table select was attempting drop table if it encountered a duplicate key error or a timeout during the execution. It would try to execute the drop table on the table while another transaction was still open doing this insert into that table in the same thread but a different transaction. So we fixed that inside InnoDB so that uh, we allow this uh, operation to drop the table and then we don't need this background queue hack. For statistics tables uh, we did some fixes as well and uh, one more fix in the 10.6.5 release is that uh, the background tasks that will modify these tables they will acquire proper metadata log not only on the actual user table but also on the statistics tables and then then they will acquire exclusive lock on the statistics tables and finally acquire the data dictionary cache latch for ex execution, executing the internal InnoDB SQL code to modify the tables. So I believe that now there shouldn't be any more hangs or caches even if there was a concurrent DDL on that user table or the statistic tables. Finally, what can we still do? What is left to be done? Well, one thing is, I think that uh, the foreign key metadata needs to be stored outside of storage engines. So instead of having these inner internal tables, sys foreign and sys foreign calls, we should store that metadata in the SQL layer. For example, in .frm files. That is, we should store not only the references constraints, but also child table names. Like if a different another table is referring to a parent table with a references core, a clause, then the parent table must somehow be aware of this child table. So maybe we should store the child table name in the parent table .frm file. And to achieve this, of course, we would have to update the metadata for multiple tables atomically. So if that is multiple .frm files, then we have to do that. And that could be done by extending the DDL recovery log file. There are some challenges around uh, updating. We would have to still support uh, the old metadata tables. If we find those tables inside InnoDB, we would have to read the metadata, the foreign key constraints from, from those tables. And on DDL, we would have to delete the metadata and finally drop those tables. So both the old and new met the metadata formats would have to be supported. And this would still not remove foreign key processing itself from InnoDB. That would be a separate task to move the foreign key like on update cascade, that kind of processing to the SQL layer. After atomic DDL, 
if we wanted to aim higher, we could go for transactional DDL. One example of that would be to have this create table select executing in a single transaction. Of course, we don't want to lock the dictionary tables for the entire duration of the operation. That is a challenge, and maybe it needs to be split in some way, or we would have to defer the changes of the dictionary metadata until the commit or, or something like that. If, if we even want to implement that. And uh, one thing that I have been wanting to do for a long time is removing all the InnoDB dictionary tables and the InnoDB system table space. Of course, that's a big project. And uh, now, with uh, after some experience from this task, making the DDL grass safe in InnoDB, or even, I would say, transactional inside InnoDB, but not in the whole server, I think that it's not that bad design, this uh, InnoDB dictionary tables. It was only misused by incorrect uh, locking and logging around it. But if we removed uh, the InnoDB dictionary tables, then we would have to introduce, to make this uh, rename and drop operations explicit in the undo log. So we would have to some, uh, we would need some undo log record types to cover these operations. Now we get it by monitoring changes to the dictionary tables. And uh, a bit related to that, uh, I think we must add some metadata into .ipd files anyway. For example, the index root page numbers are missing from there. So it could be useful to to remove the dictionary tables altogether from InnoDB or to have some SQL layer cache table that contains all the table definitions so that you don't have to read all small .fm files on startup. But that's definitely something in the far future. Also, something for the far future would be a multi-version dictionary cache and uh, combined DDL DM, and DML transactions. For example, if some transaction started and rename, re, uh, rename the table, then other transactions should still see the table with the old name. That would require a multi-version dictionary cache. There is also some challenge how to store the metadata for the internal tables that the InnoDB full text index is using, but I guess we could cover that by storing some more metadata in .ibd files. So, that is all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Marco. A very clear and very detailed explanation, as always. Uh, so, the first question is on the performance impact. So, 10.5, the focus was on performance improvements, and in 10.6, there's been a couple of changes. There's a, a new log file, the DDL uh, recovery log. But at the same time, you did a few, uh, a few improvements. You removed the Xs mutex. You, you talked about removing the drop table queue hack. Uh, what, what is the impact um, of the uh, crash safe uh, uh, in 10.6 on performance overall? Crash well, safe DDL. I, I haven't measured that. Uh... Maybe I should have, but I think that there might actually be a performance improvement in this area as well, because because uh, we uh, when we we are creating a new data file, like create table or an alter table, optimize table that is rebuilding the table, or even truncate table. If we used to do it so that uh, that we write and synchronize the first page, a dummy first page for the .ibd file. And we are not doing that anymore because we are using this uh, pure write-ahead logging. So we are only writing the redo log that uh, we, are we have created this file and, and recovery may find that file as being an empty file or, or fit with zero bytes and uh, it will do its trick based on the redo log records. So it might actually be faster. Of course, there is some extra overhead uh, because we now have this uh, atomic DDL log that needs to be 
durability, durability written. So if you are running on a hard disk, then probably your your uh, DDL operations will see one more F-sync. But, but on the other hand, we don't have these F-syncs uh, when creating the files. So it's difficult to say, I, I, I didn't measure the performance. Okay, then talking about metadata logs, one thing I noticed almost as an aside is that um, the variable lock weight timeouts. So that uh, the, the, the default reduced from one year to one day. I think it was 10.6, I can't remember the, the, uh, the version. One year seems a kind of infeasibly long period. What was the thinking behind changing the default there? I don't know. I, I wasn't involved with that. I only remember that the default used to be one year back in MySQL 5.5 or, or 5.6. I, I didn't follow when, when it was changed in, in MariaDB. Okay, so it doesn't seem to have any notable impact on, on INRDB at least. Yeah, in any case, uh, there is uh, regarding timeouts uh, on the InnoDB side, uh, we now have this variable InnoDB lock weight timeout, which is uh, being enforced a bit uh, quicker than it used to be. But that's a topic of my other talk. We, we have a cleaner lock weights there. Okay, then you, you talked about um, sys table spaces and sys data files, and those are were both removed. Then of the corresponding information schema, INDB sys table spaces and INDB sys data files. So sys data files was removed, um, but sys table spaces now just reflects the, the file system from 10.6. Can you talk about a bit about the relationship between the, the internal INDB tables and the information schema tables and why in particular sys table spaces was retained? Well, I wanted to make it keep it simple for, for users. So I wanted to reduce the impact, uh, to re reduce any surprises. That, that was basically the reasoning. Uh, I, I'm not particularly happy with these uh, system tables and uh, exposing them in the, to the user. It, it, users shouldn't really rely on, on that information, but it was easy to preserve this one and it wasn't a pure view of, of the system tables in the first place. It, it did uh, show some extra information already. So I thought that it's uh, the least amount of surprise if we just keep it as is, or only delete the underlying persistent table, which was kind of redundant, only causing potential inconsistencies. Then you, you talked about the sys tables that the, the problem caused by the primary key um, uh, not being the table ID, but being the table name. So that, that um, required a new uh, undo log record for, for rename table. What would the consequences have been if you simply changed the primary key? Why was that not an option? Well, it, uh, this is uh, something that uh, already was done in, uh, I think, uh, version uh, uh, 10.2.19. A couple of years ago, this undo log record was added. So it's... Uh, not something that uh, happened recently. But back then, I wasn't, didn't even realize all these things, and I, I didn't realize that we can actually do crash safe DDL without changing any undo lock formats, any further undo lock format changes. But uh, I guess it would have been possible to to detect the rename table operation by somehow buffering multiple undo lock records, both the delete mark and, and the insert record for changing the name. It would have been possible, but it was much easier when we had just one record that reflected the rename. Okay. Then you talked about transactional DDL, and you used the phrase, if we even want to, to implement that. So it seems to be one of the more commonly requested features on JIRA. It's, it's got quite a lot of votes. Um, and I quite often see blogs or, or articles about it. So I think the answer seems to be to be yes. You spoke about some of the the, the requirements for that, like um, metadata being written into the IBD files. And then you also mentioned that specifically, if you want to do if you want to do combined DDL and DML transactions, that has other requirements like a multi-version dictionary cache. What um, can you talk a bit more about that and why that? relegates that um, into the far future? Well, that's uh, 
something that is not really my area of expertise. Those changes would have to be done mostly outside the storage engine. Uh, only this, uh, if, if we replace the InnoDB system tables with something else, then we would have to write that extra information into the InnoDB data files to make them kind of self-contained. But uh, the rest, uh, this uh, atomic DDL, I think uh, we will have to discuss that uh, with Monty and others who are more familiar with, with the SQL layer table definition cache and so on. And I, I don't know if it's even feasible to have this multi-version uh, dictionary cache. Maybe it's a reasonable limitation that, that we don't, don't allow, uh, that, that we do some kind of uh, locking like we, like we currently do for, for these DDL operations. But still, you, you might want to have it so that uh, if you have combined DDL and DML transaction, you would want to keep them atomic so that if you roll back, then all your drop table, create table, and update, insert, delete will be rolled back atomically. For that, we don't need a multi-version uh, dictionary cache. We can do that with locking. But obviously, if, if, if you then would have a, a large uh, transaction, which would uh, at the same time be blocking some popular table that other transactions are using, it, it wouldn't be a good idea to have such a huge DDL, DML transaction blocking everybody else. But that's a kind of a, how users are, are using it. Okay. Then, then final question. You mentioned um, some of the challenges with uh, internal tables that full text index is using. And I know elsewhere you've mentioned the problems caused by, by full text index and that at some point you would like to replace full text index with um, some sort of cross engine full text search functionality. Can you speak a little bit more about, about that and some of the issues that full text indexes cause and what you would like to do with it? Well, that's um, mostly just uh, venting out some frustration or, or it's only at the hand waving level. I don't have any specific plans and it might be that uh, when I start to look at some replacement, then I notice that, okay, it's green, uh, the grass is not greener on the other side of the fence either. I don't know, but ba basically uh, problem one problem with the full text index implementation is that it it uses uh, the InnoDB internal SQL parser. We have such a thing. I, I would like to remove it, but maybe we can even if if we remove the, the InnoDB internal dictionary tables, maybe it would be possible to rewrite the the refactor the InnoDB internal parser to somehow get the metadata of these uh, internal full text tables uh, fr from the IBD file metadata, which we would have to add, add there. It's, it's not really necessary to, uh, to, re to remove or replace the full text index implementation, but it, uh, it's just uh, something that would be convenient if we could uh, just have something easy that works and is efficient and cross engine. I don't know if such a thing exists. I have, haven't uh, spent time on researching that. Well, I think that's all we have time for for now. So thanks very much for being here with us. Till next time. Okay, thank you. It was very nice to be here. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to the talk on MyTile, a storage engine built on top of TileDB and the advanced pushdown we offer through the storage engine APIs. Before we talk about the pushdown, let me summarize a little bit about who we are and what TileDB is and how it facilitates the advanced pushdown capabilities um, that we take advantage of in MariaDB. So TileDB was spun out of MIT and Intel Labs in 2017. Stavros, our founder, was working uh, at Intel dealing with high performance computing and the database gurus of MIT uh, and a lot of the data science uh, aspects that were around the Cambridge area. We've raised over $20 million so far, so we're very well capitalized. We've got uh, about 40 employees with domain experts all across the field. Um, traction with telecoms, pharmacies, hospitals, uh, geospatial areas, and other scientific organizations. So we've got quite a, quite a diverse use case. So what is TileDB? Well, the secret behind TileDB, the secret sauce, so to speak, is the data model. Everything in TileDB is modeled as a multidimensional array. So we're in array storage that allows you to have either dense arrays or sparse arrays. A dense array, as we see on the, the left-hand diagram here, is an array which has every single cell filled in. So every cell has a value. Um, a sparse array, on the other hand, has missing values, and those missing values are not materialized on disk. So those cells are not stored as nulls. They're, they're, they're not stored at all. They're completely not materialized. Um, inside any, every cell, you can have a tuple of values. So we call those attributes. So every cell can have any d different data types, um, integers, strings, date times, with var variable length, list, or fixed length attributes there. So a wide variety of data can be captured by these models. A sparse array also allows you to have multiplicities or duplicates. So every single data type, more or less that's structured, can be captured under the array model. For instance, if we talk about a data frame or a traditional table from a SQL database, every column or row uh, can easily be modeled in one of two ways. The first is a dense vector where the single dimension value is basically the row ID. This works really well if you have like a traditional auto increment style where you just in indicate the row ID. And then every single cell, again, contains the tuple of attributes or the, the columns that exist. This allows super fast slicing based off the row IDs. You could also mar model a table as a sparse array. So if you had a primary key or an index uh, that had multiple fields in it, you could model it as a sparse array. So instead of a row ID form, you could actually have the dimensions as different fields in the sparse array. This allows super fast column uh, slicing based off that. We can also support duplicates in the sparse array if, uh, if you don't have unique primary keys. What else can be modeled as arrays besides tables? We can have 3D LiDAR point cloud data. You can have imaging data like SAR. You can have uh, genomics data um, like VCF, uh, uh, BAM files, 3D sparse arrays, single cell genomics, uh, biomedical imaging. Any type of imaging could be 2D or 3D. Uh, Two-dimensional XY, three-dimensional would include time. Um, any type of time series data, it can be modeled as uh, dense or sparse arrays, weather data, graphs, videos, key values, simply using uh, strings as one of your dimensions, um, and, and even flat files. So we actually are able to, uh, to store any type of file as a one-dimensional dense, uh, dense array also. For instance, we have an integration with JupyterLab where we actually store Jupyter notebooks, um, which are JSON files, as one-dimensional dense arrays. So we're truly universal here. So what are some of the features of TileDB Embedded that facilitate all of this uh, and, <laughs> and allow some of the, uh, the awesome pushdown that we're going to talk about in just a moment? Well, first off, um, TileDB is built in C++. Um, modern C++ taking advantage of C++17, so we have a lot of, uh, 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 of optimizations there. It's fully parallelized. It's a columnar format. We support a multitude of compressors, and every attribute or dimension, so basically every field, can have its own compressor, uh, such as run length encoding, ZSTD, uh, double deltas, um, multitude of uh, filter and compression options there. For sparse arrays, we use R trees uh, to catalog the non-empty uh, cells. We also support rapid updates and data versioning, so every write that occurs is immutable. It writes to what we call a fragment. We'll talk a little bit about the fragment architecture in just a moment because that's also part of our pushdown capabilities. Um, but because of the immutable writes, it's lock-free. This allows for parallel readers, parallel writers, because we never update any file once it's uh, finalized. Um, you can have simultaneous readers and writers with zero locking. This also enables time traveling capabilities, so you can look at what the array is over time. This allows a lot of flexibility, especially in MariaDB, for you to query an array, see what uh, the data is today, see what the data was like a week ago, a month ago, any arbitrary times. Um, 
provides incredible auditing capabilities. So we have a, a lot of interoperability. We have a number of APIs, Python, R, Java, C++, um, and a number of integrations um, in the domain-specific tools like GDAL and Poodle, uh, more generic tools like Presto and Spark, and of course, MariaDB, which we're here to talk about today. We also support a large number of backends, for instance, uh, Postix file systems, object stores like S3 or uh, Azure Blob Store, could even be shared file systems like L LustreFS or, or NFS mounts. And, and important thing too is because of the immutable rights that we do, we're completely optimized for the cloud. So the, the LSM-like tree structure that we have works very well for cloud object stores where immutability is key. And we uh, optimized for parallel I.O. and to minimize requests because object stores are not local file systems. There's latency involved um, with some operations such as listing. Um, there's minimum uh, boundaries for uh, requests that can come in. And we do a lot of work to optimize for those cases. So let's take a little, let's take an overview of my tile. Now that we have uh, kind of a foundation of how TileDB is, the multi-dimensional aspects and, and features it offers, let's talk a little bit about the storage engine itself. So my tile is built on top of TileDB Embedded. So all the features that we just talked about are included in the my tile storage engine. Some of these key features include the ability to query TileDB arrays on remote object stores. So you can actually query directly from S3 or Google Cloud or Azure right through MariaDB. We have full dynamic discovery of existing arrays, so you don't need to create the arrays through through MariaDB. You can have an existing array on S3 and query it live. So a select star just works um, with giving it an S3 path. We have complete interoperability with existing arrays and all of our other APIs. So the MyTile storage engine doesn't do anything specific with TileDB. Uh, it's not a custom schema. There's not custom um, uh, metadata stored or anything like that. Any arbitrary array can be read through um, MyTile. You want to read an image? You could simply you could do that. Um, this is in contrast to say MyRox, which has a custom schema for how it works with MariaDB. As we mentioned, MariaDB um, MyTile. Uh, is built on top of TileDB. TileDB has a lock-free structure, so we inherit all of that in MariaDB here with MyTile. No need for row-level locks, no gap locking, no even table locks, full multi-reader, multi-writer for maximum parallelization. And of course, one of the big features is condition pushdown, which we're here to talk about today, and how we take predicates in um, other conditions and push them from MariaDB through the storage engine to the TileDB library directly. So we can actually push conditions on both dimensions, which are indexed fields, or attributes, which are non-indexed fields. We'll talk a little bit about the differences uh, coming up shortly. So let's go to an overview of how the condition pushdown works, because MariaDB offers a number of ways for us to perform these type of pushdowns. The first and most simple way is index lookups. So we can expose things through indexing um, in MariaDB. This also facilitates the multi-range reads, which also work on top of uh, indexes. We'll talk a little bit uh, about that in just a moment. Lastly, and probably most importantly, is the condition pushdown API, which allows us to push conditions on dimensions or attributes. They can be uh, a number of different um, predicates, and they don't rely on index uh, style scanning. So a dimension in TileDB is similar to a primary key or an index. So when you create your array in TileDB form, you specify the dimensions, um, and you specify the order and the data types. And these can be most... Um, similar thought of like a primary key. For sparse arrays, we use R trees uh, as the underlying lookup for the non-empty cells. Dense arrays, however, do not need any additional indexing. Because the dense array is based off integral values and every single cell is populated, any location can easily be computed. Uh, the dimensions plus the layout structure define the sort order on disk. So this translates from the multidimensional space of an array to the one-dimensional linear storage medium uh, that is an object store or a local file system. Um, this can be thought of similar to a clustering index. So a clustering index defines you know, a list of, uh, uh, of fields, which will be the sort order. The dimensions define your sort order, and the layout also defines the sort order. So you can have row major layout, you can have column major, you can have Hilbert uh, order if you, uh, if you want to give uh, no preference to any special dimension. So those fields uh, and options combined are defined what the actual sort order on disk is. Attributes uh, are 
fields that are not indexed. They are stored as separate files because we're a columnar format, but they can be considered uh, as part of the tuple of an individual cell. And we actually do offer filtering on these non-indexed fields through what we call the query condition API. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. The most important thing to understand, though, is that the predicates, even for uh, attributes, can be applied completely in parallel. So we have massive performance um, capabilities by the, the, the parallelization that we do as we read the tiles um, from the individual storage. We'll go over the specifics next. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the query magic. How does how does the TileDB query work? How does it plug in with MariaDB and my tile? And how do does all this push down um, actually be facilitated? So it's important to understand the foundations first of TileDB queries because that this is the the magic behind the push down. So an array is made up of immutable fragments. A fragment can be considered uh, as a folder or a prefix on an object store, which contains the actual data uh, that's written. Uh, this data is stored in tiles. And there's also some metadata about the fragment itself. Every fragment has the details of its non-empty domain. That is, for every dimension, we have the bounding box of what, what, uh, what the dimension contains. And then inside every fragment is one or more tiles. Tiles are the physical grouping of data on disk. And the tiles are broken into 64 kilobyte chunks. So if we take a look at uh, this diagram, we can see that the basic folder structure here is we have a we have a, a high-level folder for the array, my2d sparse array. Inside of that, we have the array schema, and then we have a fragment, t1, a uuid1. Inside that fragment is the metadata, which is a very small file, usually kilobytes in size, that contains uh, contains this basic information. Um, and then we have the actual data files themselves, um, a1 for the first attribute, a2 for the second attribute, and so on. And as you write the data, ev um, in TileDB, we create fragments for every single write. Um, so you can write in bulk, you can write individual cells, we support a number of, uh, of parameters there, but once a write is complete, uh, that fragment is immutable and we'll never touch it again. So this facilitates a lot of the querying mechanisms that we have. So we apply ranges on dimensions in several ways. So when you push down uh, the conditions and push down a range, TileDB is a range-based uh, query system, there's a multitude of ways that this filter is, is applied to get the performance um, that we'll show shortly. First is we prune these fragments based off the non-empty domain. So every single fragment that's written, again, is immutable and contains its non-empty domain. So right off the bat, we can prune uh, which fragments overlap with the query that's being issued. Next, inside of fragment, we have the tile, um, we know the tiles, and we have the minimum bounding rectangles of each tile, so we can prune those tiles, uh, again, based off the ranges without comparing individual cells. And then finally, after we know the tiles that, it, that overlap, we'll go through and we'll match the individual cells in those tiles to the conditions that were applied. Every single stage here, all three of these stages are done in, uh, in parallel to maximize performance. So the fragment pruning is in parallel. We loop over the fragments uh, in a parallel for loop to figure out which fragments uh, uh, line up. Next, we read the tiles in parallel um, to allow you to, um, sorry, we, we read the tiles in parallel to allow for um, the pruning to happen again in parallel. What are, the non, what are the MBRs of the tiles? Which ones line up? And then we fetch those from disk in parallel and then do the individual cell filtering in parallel. Now, of course, we offer memory budget parameters to control all of this parallelization. So you have ultimate flexibility to maximize performance versus uh, memory usage uh, in the different environments. Tile to be attribute filters, so filters again on the non-index fields, uh, work via a query condition API, and we apply them in parallel at the tile level. So after we prune a fragment and we're looking at the tiles and we're comparing the, the actual cells on a tile, we can then apply the, uh, the conditions. We have special care that's given to the code as we develop this feature to ensure that we vectorize all of these um, conditions and they, they are applied you know, in parallel and completely vectorized with vectorized instruction sets. Pushing the filters, um, either on the dimensions or the attributes like this and the predicates, to the storage engine and to TileDB allows us to return less data to MariaDB. This facilitates a, a large amount of the performance improvements that we have because we can prune the data, re ha reduce the I.O., and return less data into MariaDB so MariaDB has to process and then potentially discard less rows. Um, and this is most beneficial when you have nice scanning, and especially if you have like aggregations, uh, we can do a lot of the pruning um, to return the data, and so that the aggregations can be performed much faster. 
So let's talk a little bit about how index lookups work. Um, this is the most uh, basic pushdown that happens is with an index scan. Dimensions in TileDB are exposed to MariaDB as either an index or a primary key. We use an index if it's a sparse array that allows duplicates, else we use a primary key uh, to indicate uh, the dimensions. Um, an index condition is translated into the TileDB query range and query uh, uh, syntax. TileDB, again, uses range-based queries, so we expect a start and an end range for every single dimension. Um, and so we translate the index usage uh, from MariaDB and the key uh, values into the TileDB syntax to perform these. And so we support every single operation, greater than, less than, equal to, not equal to, and all the different permutations on the, uh, the R key function. So uh, next after, next before, exact equals, all the different permutations are supported and we can handle for all the different date type, data types, strings, integers, date times, um, all of that can be supported with integer lookups. Now, besides integers, um, I'm sorry, besides indexes, we can use multi-range reads. What is a multi-range read? Some of you might not be familiar. Um, multi-range read is an optimized uh, optimization aimed at improving performance of I/O bound queries that need to scan lots of rows. Um, this is pulled from the MariaDB wiki. TileDB is most performant when we do large bulk access, not repeated single access. Um, this is mostly an artifact of cloud object stores. If you're on a local file system, you have a lot more freedom with, uh, with reads. But object stores are designed for high throughput, um, but they also have high latency. So single individual record request from, it, from an object store uh, is not optimal. You want to fetch large contiguous chunks of, of the data from S3 or other object stores. Multi-range reads allow TileDB to efficiently fetch this data at scale because an index scan might ask for a small subset of the data, but a multi-range read allows us to get the predicates up ahead of time to know that there's a large read that's happening and we can optimize that at the storage engine level. TileDB supports the concept of incomplete queries, and so does MyTile, which allows us to do this batch-style access for out-of-core operations. So if a multi-range read comes in that wants to fetch records, uh, you know, uh, a million records, but we only have the memory space or, or um, for, you know, 100,000 records, TileDB can still handle this, and it handles it very efficiently. And on the MariaDB side, we take the the original request for the million records, we push that to TileDB, and we let TileDB facilitate how many records that it can fetch at a time. This allows TileDB to be optimal with the access to the object store, because it knows what the tiles are that are going to be read, it knows where the overlaps are, it knows uh, where best to split a, uh, a query um, for optimal um, usage. Now, depending on your uh, MariaDB instance and configuration, multi-range reads are typically not enabled by default. Um, we recommend for my tile usage that everyone always enables this um, for our users. Uh, now, if you're using InnoDB and MyRox and, and, and you're, you're potentially mixing other storage engines, you know that needs to be considered. Uh, but if you're just using um, my tile directly, we strongly recommend it. There can be a large performance improvement over just uh, traditional index scanning by allowing TileDB to fully control how and when to, uh, to batch out the reads. Now, multi-range reads provide a lot of performance improvement, but condition pushdown via the condition push API uh, gives us the ultimate flexibility and ability to push anything into TileDB. So the condition push API has been around for quite a long time. Uh, it's one of the oldest uh, uh, pushdowns um, available, and the Connect Storage Engine has long used it to push um, predicates and things from uh, MariaDB into the, the connected uh, other databases. And the nice part is that this whole API allows TileDB to take any part of the query that, that is supported and push it to the storage engine instead of MariaDB using it. So we use this um, to find any predicates that are on dimensions or attributes and push it to TileDB. There are many cases where MariaDB and the query optimizer might not use an index scan or the multi-range reads uh, because the condition is maybe not prefix-based or doesn't line up with, uh, with the, the, the uh, primary key quite exact. So, for instance, if you have three fields in a primary key and the condition's only on the first and the third, MariaDB uh, quite often will not use the, the primary key um, because it doesn't line up with the, the full prefix. However, in TileDB, um, we're not limited by these type of uh, these constraints, and you can push that down and achieve optimal performance. So, 
we can handle any combination of dimensions um, on you know con and conditions. It could be on one, it could be on three, it could be on all of them. It can be mixed and matched. It doesn't even have to be in the right order. TileDB uh, can facilitate all of that um, for the pushdown. And so we're not restricted by the traditional key structure at all in TileDB. We're a lot more flexible, and performance improvements can be had at a number of places. It might not always be the most optimal query, um, but there is definitely performance improvements. So we use the condition push API to to take and push all of that down. Um, condition push also expands to functions. So not just uh, fixed values, um, such as what happens with index scans, uh, but we can actually take entire functions and push them down uh, into TileDB through this a API. Another important thing too is that the condition push allows my tile to detect if ordering is required or not. So this allows us to figure out does the records need to be returned in the row major order or the key uh, the key order that MariaDB expects, um, or can it be returned unordered? Um, in many cases, an unordered result might be acceptable. For instance, if this is just a simple summation, the order doesn't matter, uh, or a count query, the order doesn't matter. Um, in those cases, unordered results in TileDB may have um, a large performance advantage and potentially memory uh, advantage. And this is because if we don't have to worry about the sort, then as we're doing everything in parallel, we can return the records as fast as possible to MariaDB without worrying about the sort um, on the TileDB level. Uh, and again, this is just a, an optimization which in some cases um, can add up quite nicely, and the condition push allows us to expand on all of that. There's also a newer uh, select handler and a join handler um, and, and derived table handler that was added in MariaDB 10.4, um, mostly to support um, advanced usage with the uh, the column store. Um, we are looking at expanding into using this on top of the condition push API. Uh, the condition push offers most of what TileDB needs at this point, but the select handler exposes uh, a tremendous amount uh, of value there, and so we're looking into that. All right, so. We've talked a little bit about how this works and how we do it, but let's look at some benchmarks for seeing the actual performance difference of the pushdown and comparing it to uh, some of the other storage engines. So we're going to run a benchmark, um, some benchmarks here. We, we used a, an AWS EC2 instance, an M5 4X large, 16 CPU, 64 gigs of RAM. Um, we have a variety of other uh, uh, settings configured here. Everything available, uh, everything on these benchmarks is available on the GitHub repo. We'll also include that in the Zulip chat uh, after this. And uh, anyone can reproduce these. You can see all the, the full details, including the full MariaDB config. I, I've highlighted some of the, the, the base config options um, here. The main thing on this benchmark is we're using the New York City yellow taxicab data set, about four years of the data, which comes in at about 40 gigs of raw CSVs and 337 million rows in total. So this is a, a decent sized data set um, to show some of the performance benefits uh, of these pushdowns. So first off, let's look at the size of the data on disk. InnoDB uncompressed comes in at about 95 gigs. Uh, Zlib compression for InnoDB drops it to about uh, 59 gigs. MyRox, um, being columnar there, comes in at uh, 19 uh, gigabytes. And MyTile uh, with ZSTD, which is our default and highly recommended, comes in at 6.2 gigs. So uh, huge, huge uh, space savings with MyTile with our columnar compression, our chunking and tiling, um, and the ZSTD compression. So the first benchmark that we're going to look at here is doing pushdown of, uh, of a single condition uh, on the DO location ID, which is not an index field. It's not a primary key. It's not indexed. Um, and so this is going to result in basically a full table scan for all of the storage engines here. There's about 295,000 records that match the where condition, which will be uh, included in the count query. I know to be uncompressed comes in at 17 minutes and 31 seconds, um, so it's the slowest of everything. I believe that's mostly due to this on disk storage size um, and the 32 gig uh, buffer pool size, um, causing uh, the, the performance decrease there. Now, uh, Zlib compression for INODB uh, drops it quite a bit to 6 minutes 20 seconds. Myrox comes in at 5 minutes 23 seconds. Myrox with mostly default settings, so there, there might be some wiggle room for optimization in the benchmark. Um, but my tile, we ran three different benchmarks here that I really want to call out. The first is a is my tile with local disk on the EBS volume um, without any pushdown. So no index, no range, uh, multi-range read, no condition push API. This is going to be a full table scan pushing everything um, to uh, MariaDB. This is the most uh, close example to inodb um, directly here. And here we have about two minutes and 45 seconds. So we're about two and a half times faster than inodb for, for this query. And again, that's without any pushdown. So we can already see that my tile with our parallelization, smaller on-disk size, um, 
can, can do quite quite wonders uh, with this size data. Now, if we enable push down, so we allow the condition push API to push this into our query um, our query condition API for attribute filtering. And again, this is attribute filtering, not a range push down. Uh, we drop the time to just under a minute, so 59 seconds, um, just just about a minute here on EBS volume. So about five times faster than my rocks, about six times faster than inodb. Pretty impressive if uh, if I do say so. Um, and I also wanted to point out that, again, my tile works natively with cloud object stores. So uh, because I ran the benchmarks on AWS, I went ahead and used an S3 bucket to store this exact same data set. And we can see that the time came in at 1 minute and 10 seconds. So about 10 seconds slower uh, to run the query on S3 than local EBS volume. But that's still about six times faster, uh, five to six times faster than INODB directly. So the condition pushdown has a large advantage in uh, my tile here. The last benchmark that I'm going to highlight uh, on this call, again, we have additional benchmarks in the GitHub repo and additional details there, but is a, is a similar account query, but we changed the predicates to include uh, conditions um, that are in the primary key of all the tables. Um, but we also still included a DO location ID uh, for one non, uh, non-indexed field. So it's not a complete um, a complete uh, lookup of the index, there will still will have to be some uh, some filtering in MariaDB. Now, this is much smaller uh, matching records. About 412 records match this wear condition. Um, INODB comes in uncompressed still at 21 minutes, almost 22 minutes. Uh, data the, the data size there is really just killing it. Uh, there's definitely room for optimization on the uncompressed INODB, but if you switch over to Zlib compression, which I'm sure most people would, would just turn on compression, uh, we drop the, the query time down quite drastically to 2 minutes and 59 seconds, uh, 56 seconds um, uh, there with the primary key lookup. So INODB works quite well with the primary key lookup here. Um, my rocks about 4 minutes and 7 seconds. Again, default settings, probably some optimizations um, that could be done to improve that. But the thing that I want to point out here, once again, is uh, on the MyTile side. With EBS uh, disk and without any pushdown, no index lookup, no primary key, no condition push, uh, we still come in at about 2 minutes and 47 seconds. So the full table scan uh, still beats INODB, even with INODB using the primary key lookup. Now, <laughs> the real magic comes in when we do turn on those condition pushdowns. So when we're using the, the condition push and the multi-range reads, um, the EBS volume is 1.8 seconds. Yes, 1.8 seconds to get all the records back. Um, again, the, the benchmarks are up. I encourage everyone to come and, uh, and take a look at that. It is quite impressive what we get. Now, if you move over to S3 instead of a local disk, it's about 4.2 seconds. Uh, latency of S3 uh, hits you a little bit um, with fetching these uh, such small records here. Um, but 4.2 seconds is still quite impressive to the, uh, the minutes it takes um, for the other benchmarks, uh, the other storage engines here. So the condition push down in my tile, massive performance improvements um, and, and works very, very well with how TileDB is laid out. Um, so let's talk a little bit about real-world usage. We've seen some benchmarks here, but but where have we actually used this and, and, and where have our customers used it? We, in particular, we have one customer in the AIS market, this is ship location data, who uses um, my tile through our TileDB Cloud serverless SQL offering. And they issue queries um, that are typically bounding boxes to view ships in an area. So they'll give a lat long query um, and potentially time um, for, uh, for a geographical region, say a, a particular port like uh, Shanghai. Um, they also usually include additional filters on like ship type, name, or nationality. So they might want to query for only oil tankers uh, or query for uh, a certain type of cargo ship. And when we added query condition push down, um, especially on the attribute filtering, uh, they saw a two to three performance improvement in the queries. Um, so quite a large performance improvement, and it works very, very well uh, for our users. Um, so we're very happy with the uh, the APIs that MariaDB offers to enable us to parse the parse the query condition and push down all of those predicates into a TileDB for maximum performance. Okay, so the last thing I want to highlight is just where can you try this? How can you get it? Uh, what What is out there? So we offer a couple different... Um, products in the company, um, TileDB Embedded is the open source software, and my tile is open source. We have it on GitHub. We're working to upstream it to MariaDB right now. Um, you guys can go install it. We offer Docker images. We offer Conda packages, um, a number of ways to, to get it. You can c compile it from source. Um, we have uh, an embedded build uh, in Conda that you can use with, uh, with Python to directly uh, query it there. So we have quite a few ways to, to go grab it on the open source side of the house. 
Um, we also have um, our title to be cloud SaaS offering. And in the SaaS product, we do have uh, my tile through our serverless SQL functionality. Um, so anyone can sign up for that. We offer you uh, $10 of free credit when you sign up. And you can run our serverless SQL uh, to experiment with my tile um, today. So you don't have to, uh, to, to compile or install my tile. You can use our serverless SQL to just dispatch the queries um, to the cloud and get your results back. Very easy way for you guys to, to run some quick tests. Um, and of course, Tyler the Cloud is also available for enterprise where uh, everything could be deployed um, if anyone uh, was interested. So that's it. I'd like to uh, I'd like to thank everyone um, for the time, especially thanks to the MariaDB folks for, for putting this all together. Um, we'll be in the Zulub chat uh, throughout the day and and for the foreseeable future. I'd love to discuss um, some of the use cases around my tile and some of uh, the uh, the push down um, capabilities um, that exist uh, for the different use cases. Thank you. So, good morning, Seth, and thanks for, for coming to the MariaDB SoraFest. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, my first uh, question is more of an observation than a, than a question. Uh, the world is full of storage engines that have found an edge case in which they compare better than, than InnoDB, and then they make that into something, try to make that into something generic. And, and that's the uh, eyes with which I'm looking upon most, most of the storage engines, including TileDB. But, but you convinced me in your presentation that it's not an edge case, uh, that this is not just a, a special case solution where, where there would be edge cases uh, where, where, where you will beat, beat InnoDB, although you beat in a DB quite well in, in, in the scenarios that, that you did. And I think that's, that seems to be something generic for particular use cases. Yes, well, I, I just want to start off and say, you know, InnoDB has been around quite a while, and there's a lot of use cases that it targets that it does excellent. And, and I agree with you that it's very easy to cherry pick any benchmark to make your stuff look good. Um, and so with that, you know, with TileDB, our main difference here is that we store everything as a multidimensional array. And that's really the foundational difference. And this works really well for, uh, you know, a number of use cases like I listed, including just basic tables. But one thing I want to be clear is that TileDB is not a transactional storage engine. We're based for large scale analytics, OLAP style queries. So if you have, you know, the transactional style, single insert workloads, you know, InnoDB still does, you know, fantastic there. And that's not something that we're targeting at this time um, today. So yeah, I think that's a very good thing that you're sort of uh, targeting the situation that we're talking about. So this, is, this is analytics. Uh, I'll go into what else to compare TileDB to separately, but there's, there's one item which I think is, uh, the key one push down that I'll try to explain in my words and then, then uh, ask for your brief verification is correctly understood. I, I think most of the savings uh, build, uh, boil down to two things. One is that you store less data. You don't store the gaps and because the gaps are not there, it doesn't take any time to read the gaps. So you save time by smaller size of data and then by the push down mechanism, which is equal to delegating the wear clause to the underlying storage engine so that the amount of data that you move from the storage engine up to MariaDB is smaller. So in a nutshell, is, is that correctly understood? Yeah, for, for the most part, that's correct. So the, the main benefit of the pushdown, like you say, is that for the predicates of the where clause, we can return less data to MariaDB. So in a columnar fashion that TileDB is, we can select the rows or records that match without pushing it all to MariaDB. Um, in the most basic case, the performance uh, improvements are, are quite large, as you saw, where we can actually return just less records. And a lot of this is because we can simply read less data, right? And if you read less data, then it comes back. Um, on the, the sparse side of the house, um, like you did mention, we, we do have a little bit of uniqueness in our arrays that you can actually not store those missing records. So some other array formats, um, everything's based on dents and those null fields get materialized. And then of course that's more data. And then when you read your are impact on the performance. So we work very hard to minimize the amount of data in a lossless fashion, of course, that gets actually stored and then returned to MariaDB to optimize the performance there. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you use the term sparse and, and dense. So one of the things I'm wondering about is configuration. Do I need to, what do I need to configure and what will be decided by TileDB itself? Yeah, great question. So first of all, everything is always configurable by, by the user. We expose all the different um, configuration parameters from TileDB and even through uh, the My Tile Storage Engine directly. But generally for the different use cases, uh, it's pretty common a particular format uh, or parameters that'll be used. In fact, most of our converters to go from particular formats, say uh, image formats like GeoTIFF, um, we, you know, we have a, a set scripts that users use with de facto standards um, to, to handle that. So most of it's pretty well self-explanatory um, based off the, the domain that you're looking at. So, uh, okay, I, I get that. So. Uh... Let's say I wanted to use uh, TileDB. Uh, there's, there's two things uh, that I'm worried about then. It, it's the configuration and it's the learning. So you can config configure everything as such sounds like a wonderful thing, but then also it has the uh, flip side of, well, if, if you can configure it, it might mean that you have to configure it. So what do I need to learn to get, uh, in order to get the type of performance increases that, that you demonstrate? Right. Great, great question. So uh, again, we have, uh, def we have a lot of default um, settings for the different domains. Again, if you're converting image data, if you're converting, you know, sparse uh, location-based data, um, and most of the common tooling that you use outside of the database, for instance, like um, in the geospatial domain, like uh, Poodle or, or Joodle, we have integrations there and people in those geospatial domains, you know, they're familiar with that. So they can just use those to convert to the optimal TileDB format without much configuration. Inside the database itself, um, you know, in MariaDB, of course, we support all the, the syntax people expect. If you're going to create a new table, you want to set primary keys, we convert those into the TileDB um, syntax on the back end, you know, changing a primary key to the dimensions, um, worrying about the sparsity or not, if duplicates are supported. So we try to take the traditional create table schema, map those into the domain of the arrays, um, and handle most of the cases for the user um, without them having to, to dig into the details. Okay, good, good. So, um... As for licensing, then, uh, uh, is it, I mean, you, you said it's open source, so is the GPL version 2, all of it, or, or is there part of it that is not? Uh, how does the licensing work? Yeah, great question. So most of TileDB is MIT licensed, um, including the, the MyTile storage engine we've released under the MIT license. Some of our integrations um, will be in different um, licensing based off the application and the requirements there, some GPL, some uh, Apache license too, and, and, and vice versa. Um, but all of, all of what we showed today in the demonstration um, you know, falls under one of the, the open source license, MIT or, or there, um, thereabout. Yeah, and, and uh, not everybody, I mean, you have a background in MIT labs and, 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 and Intel, but uh, the user base of, of uh, MariaDB comes mostly from a GPL version 2 background. They might not be as well uh, versed in, in, in what MIT license means, but as far as I understand, MIT license is completely compatible with GPL version 2 and, and, and gives you more or less the same freedoms. That, that that's true? correct. That's correct. The MIT license, and again, I should say, I'm, you know, I'm not a lawyer here, but uh, MIT license, it, um, it's compatible with the GPL. It is probably more similar to the BSD style license, which, you know, I think some of uh, some of the MariaDB code is under. Um, more so than GPL, it's more BSD uh, kind of you can do what you want without so much restrictions on it. Um, but again, yes, we, we came out of in, uh, Intel and MIT, so we picked the MIT license for a lot of things here. But it, but it's um, everyone should be free to use it for uh uh, general purpose, like they would expect from again, like like a BSD style license. Mm -hmm. So, um, one thing that I noted that you do not compare TileDB to in your presentation is the MariaDB column store, and and to me it seems like it's it's very related. Yes, you, you have features that it doesn't have, but but basically it's an analytic engine. So so how would you compare it? conceptually and also if you had run your benchmarks against a properly configured column store, how do you think it would have fit into the equation? Yes, and first off, it's a, it's a great question and I'd love to uh, to include some benchmarks on the column store there. And like I mentioned in, in, um, in the presentation, even the MyRox benchmarks I, I recognize are probably not super optimized. 
Um, as always with benchmarks, the, the most difficult part is the time to uh, to configure everything and, and agree upon uh, the settings there. I'd love to, to work with people to, to do that. Um, but from a conceptual standpoint, um, there are some similarities. Again, we are both column stores, right? We store the data in a columnar format, which helps drastically when you want to select uh, individual columns. Um, Column store also, I think, supports the most advanced computational pushdowns. Um, as I noted in the presentation too, there was even some advanced handlers added uh, into the main line for um, like select handler uh, and derived table handler um, for that. So there's a lot of similarities there, but but there are some fundamental differences. Again, PyODB is based around the ideal of a multidimensional array, not a tabular structure. Uh, of course, an array can consume um, tabular structures, but it also, um, you know, expands beyond that. Um, there's also, you know, the minor differences, different compression support at Snappy, LZ4, you know, both have a plethora of, of configuration options there. Um, but, you know, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to do some, some more specific comparisons. I think the biggest difference, though, that I just want to highlight is the, uh, the shared nothing versus shared everything um, architectural differences that really come into play. TileDB is designed around a centralized um, data store, whether it's an object store or a shared file system. Um, it's designed around keeping all the data in a single location. Um, where the column store has the, the data workers to, to shard out the data there. So that is a bit of a structural difference um, that comes into play and allows TileDB to support, you know, object stores natively, even slicing directly from MariaDB. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, those were my major questions. Is there something that you, uh, ah, with hindsight, forgot to tell during your own presentation or you would have wished me to, to ask and highlight? Uh, no, I, I think the, the main thing is, you know, um, I said this last year, but, you know, the pandemic's made things a little bit uh, tough on everybody here. But we are hoping to upstream um, the MyTile storage engine to the MariaDB um, uh, main repository soon. I've been working very hard to get it up to, uh, to the 10.6 um, uh, latest releases and uh, in the, the 10.7 um, branch that's going forward soon. So we are hoping very, very soon to get all of that documentation and whatnot together. So this will make it much easier for everyone to start running experiments and benchmarks against it. That sounds great, Seth. So I was thinking about how to start using it and that, that was the answer to the implicit question I had. So thanks a lot for being at the MariaDB server first and thanks for a great presentation, Seth. Thank you so much, I appreciate being here.
Hi, my name is Jorge Torres. I'm the CEO at MindZB, and I'm here to talk to you about database artificial intelligence and the fantastic work that we've been doing with MariaDB ever since we started with this idea and all the advancements that we've made so far that hopefully you will find super interesting and useful for your projects, your ideas, and to make better decisions, which jumps into the fundamental question that we ask ourselves, why database artificial intelligence? As you know, databases are fantastic decision-making tools, and it makes sense to power them with machine learning capabilities of today so that those users, those database users can actually leverage that power to make even better decisions. Database artificial intelligence is to augment the databases with AI capabilities. And we start with the machine learning capabilities. MyZB is the leading DBI platform today. And we are actually super excited to show you all the things we've done to tackle very interesting problems that you already have or that you probably have when you try to forecast from information that you have in your database. MyZB plus MariaDB provides this abstraction for the machine life cycle. Essentially, it allows you to do all the steps of machine learning all within SQL, the data preparation, the machine learning model, and the model deployments. Of course, the data preparation is something that you can already do with MariaDB because databases are inherently the most powerful tools to do data preparation. The concept that we introduce here is a concept called AI tables. Now, the best way for me to actually introduce you to this concept is to give you an example. Imagine that you have a simple table that has income and debt. If you were to visualize this table, you will see what you have on the left hand or the right hand side of this image. And every single row that you have in that table represents a dot. Databases are designed to give you responses to statements that match a record that you have in your database. However, they're not designed to give you approximations. So if you query for something like, what is the actual income for, um, or what will be the debt for an income of 90,000, you're going to get no results. Anyone that has done machine learning modeling understands that you can build a hybrid plane that fits that data. And the idea that we have is, well, it'd be very interesting if we could create that model or fit that line the same way that we actually, or with a syntax that is very similar to that that we use to create a view. In this case, you can tell it, you want to create a predictor, you want to name this predictor debt model, and you want to train this predictor from the table income table. And you actually want to learn how to forecast the column debt. Of course, this is a simple approximation of what you can do with MyZB. If your table is more complex, if the type of information you want to forecast is also more complex and the number of columns that you have, MyZB can handle this as well as if you know what you're doing in machine learning, you can specify what type of model you want to use, how you want to mix the data, how you want to encode it. But by default, MyZB uses super powerful AutoML capabilities, so you don't have to if you don't want to or if you don't know how to. Now, once you've trained a model, then you can actually query this model the same way that you query a table. You can select, in this case, income, debt, and the predicted value from the model that you want to have, where the income in this case is 90,120, and you get a, an approximation for this. You actually run the model with the input that you had on the word statements. This, of course, can be extended to much more complicated problems, and we'll jump into one of those. But the interesting thing here is that if you actually use AI tables for your machine learning capabilities, then you've accomplished to do all of the machine life cycle in SQL. Of course, if your data is in the database, you've figured out how to do the data acquisition. You've already figured out how to do the data cleaning and the labeling of your data, because MariaDB, of course, having a schema forces you to make sure that your data somehow is clean. And then, of course, after every single query, what you have is columns, and those columns are features. Then MyZB can take care of the modeling with that statement that allows you to create models the same way that you create a view, or in a similar way that you create a view, 
it can handle the model selection, the hyperparameter optimization, the ensampling, the model validation with its AutoML capabilities, but you can also specify that through the same simple syntax that we abstract for you. Now, the cool thing here is that in databases, the concept of deployment is very instantaneous. As soon as you do create table, create view, those objects are living things within the database. And therefore, the same thing happens when you do create a model or create a predictor. That model is real for you to query as soon as the training is done. You don't have to think of any deployments. And the only things that you have to care about are the same things that you care about when your data is actually changing. If the schema changes, you may want to create a new model. If your data distribution changes, you may actually want to update the model. Now, as we start doing this with databases, we start to realize that databases come with very specific problems that are hard even for very sophisticated machine learning practitioners. Where what you want to forecast is not actually a problem of taking into account just one single row. In this case, let's imagine that you want to forecast inventory from your database. The information that you need to actually forecast this is contained in a history of the inventory units that you have over time. And therefore, the information that the model needs to train, it's not actually contained in one single row, but in multiple rows. This falls within the category of time series. And the interesting thing is that in databases, they get a little bit more complicated than that. You usually don't have just one single column. It's just one to four inventory, but you also want to take into account a column, which is the price of the inventory at the given time, which is a usual thing that you find in databases. This turns these models not only into time series models, but also multivariate time series, which brings the barrier a little bit higher for those that want to build this on their own. Now, the interesting thing here as well is that these problems have a problem of cardinality usually as well. That is that your data is partitioned by, in this case, say a product ID. What this means is you could have in one single table thousands, hundreds, or hundreds of thousands of individual time series that are partitioned by the product ID. You will have as many time series as products you have essentially. And this makes it so, so that if you're going down the traditional routes, you may actually be inclined to train a model for each partition, which tends to be not viable when you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of those. MyZB is probably the most sophisticated tool out there for this type of problems where you have time series, multivariate, high cardinality, which are very common problems in your database. And therefore, we're very excited to show you how you can do this. Let's solve this problem. Now, MyZB allows you to create a model, as we talked about before, in a very similar syntax to that of creating a view. In this case, you want to create a predictor inventory model. You want to train it from the inventory table, and you want to forecast the units in inventory column. Now, you're also telling it that this is a time series problem, so you're ordering it by the column date, and that you're grouping by or partitioning it by the product ID column that you want to take into account for every single prediction, the last 20 rows of that partition, and that you want to forecast three rows in advance. Say you want to forecast the inventory for the next three days in this particular case. Once this model is trained, you can actually join that model with another table or the table you trained it from to actually make bold predictions or time series predictions. Let's see how this looks like. Imagine that you actually want to forecast for the inventory given you know, products where the date uh, was greater than 9, 2021, 20, and the product ID is iPhone. Let's do the left-hand side of the join, which is, you know, selecting from that table, just the usual things that you do when you select from a table, when you pass the constraints. And what you actually want to do here is you want to forecast past 9, 21, 21. Now, what you do here is you join the model with the query that you just saw, and MyZB does magic behind here. So you're telling it to join with inventory model that we just trained, and that you want to add a new column, which is the predicted value for inventory. And you get the results like this. This is super interesting because you didn't have to do any of the data preparation for the windowing, the moving window, and as well, having to run the model itself. 
all you have to treat is this model as another table that you joined with the table that contains the information for your forecast, and you actually get real-time forecasting capabilities on the fly with MyZB. So I hope that you can get to try it. And if you want to try it, uh, you can actually go to our GitHub repository, install it via Docker, or you can try it on our cloud, cloud.mysb.com. It's early, but we'd love to hear your feedback, and we'll be really excited to know and to hear what you're going to do and what you're building. Lastly, I think that one of the feedback that we've been getting from people is that most machine learning practitioners, they also have machine learning models that they would like to access through the database. That's why for the next version of MyCB, we'll be publishing a capability of creating a model as a table in the database, but actually allowing to, to point MyCB to a URL if your model has been deployed with Racer for ML flow into a single web service. And it, this brings the capabilities of you to bring your own models into the database as well. Anyway, we'll be looking forward to see you in our community. So please join us in github.com slash mindsb mindsb. And we'll love to hear what you have to say, your ideas. At the end, we're building this for you. And we will love to know what problems you have, that you want to solve in machine learning and that you would like to solve through MyZB. Thank you so much for joining this talk and we'll see you soon. Uh, hi, Costa, uh, and thank you hi. for a great uh, presentation from MyZB. Costa here will be filling in for Jorge that couldn't attend this, this Q&A session. Uh, uh, Costa, would you like to, to present yourself to the audience a bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Costa. I'm part of MySDB team, and uh, I'm taking care of community uh, here at MySDB. Yeah, okay. Uh, Happy to be here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Costa, it was a great talk, um, and uh, it's cool to see actually someone taking the, the lead into innovating on uh, with machine learning and AI for databases. Uh, could, could you please tell me what kind of users uh, uh, MindsDB is aimed at? Uh, what kind of, uh, of users will get the, the biggest benefit from, from, from using your, uh, your project? Sure, thanks. Uh, of course, that's a good question. Uh, actually, uh, we are building MindsDB with a, a mission to democratize machine learning. And... Um, this means that the users uh, who we are targeting uh, are like people who have their predictive needs and uh, who know their data, but probably they don't have enough uh, or, like deep knowledge of machine learning tools out there. And um, of course, they have SQL and uh, database where their data is uh, stored. Uh, so actually, MindsDB allows people um, to make those like, predictions powered by machine learning uh, for such people without even having to know uh, like, all the deep dives of machine learning uh, itself. So, uh, of course, you need to know some basic concepts like uh, what means the model training. Yeah, so you yeah. need to kind of feed the, the historical data into the model. But actually, that's all. Uh, you just do everything through SQL. Uh, but from yeah. another hand, uh, we also understand that there are um, people who might want to use this in a kind of enterprise environment, in a production environment where there are some data science teams in place, uh, uh, machine learning engineers, uh, some maybe existing models uh, people might have, and they want to leverage it from database perspective. Uh, today, um, classical machine learning approach is... Uh, treating models like an application. Uh, so you need to feed the data to this uh, model. So you need to not, usually people take some like data from, from where they store it uh, to append those data frames, like massage it, and then feed it to the model. And uh, during the whole life cycle of the model, you need to actually <laughs> keep this uh, ETL pipeline uh, also maintained. This is uh, one of the most, uh, uh, annoying uh, and difficult machine learning tasks for machine learning engineers. Uh, from another side of things, uh, deploying the model is also uh, requiring a lot of effort. You need to build some kind of integration or API from the model to your application. 
and uh, you also need to maintain it. And this is an extra work for your IT departments to actually keep this uh, <laughs> working. Yeah. Uh, and Smart City allows but... to do it uh, from uh, just a SQL perspective. All you need to do is just uh, you know query the model to uh, sorry uh, make a SQL statement to train and SQL statement to query the model. And if yeah, you... it, it 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 seems to have a pretty low entry barrier, <laughs> and that that's uh, what I like about it. And and I've seen it in in Jorge's presentation. But you, uh, also uh, Jorge also mentioned that it's possible to. To, to pick a specific model to customize it, so so that's uh, that's uh, some side of features you build for for uh, bigger companies that have uh, kind of a data science department, right? Exactly. So you can start with MindDB easily, even if you don't have data science skills. But actually, those who have, they have an option to improve their models, and that's what we are actually building, and uh, will, it will come in the next uh, release of MindDB. Uh, that that's quite cool. Uh, do you would you like to share like what kind of uh, machine le learning uh, libraries frameworks uh, you use behind the scenes to to implement uh, MindsDB? Sure. Uh, actually, we have a separate uh, repo on GitHub called um, Lightwood. And you can access it at github slash mindsdb slash lightwood. And this is the kind of engine we used behind mindsdb. This engine is built mainly on top of PyTorch. And it's uh, like the art uh, library with the Facebook behind it. And also uses some uh, other libraries like the LightGBM and, and so on. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is uh, what's, uh, what we have inside. Please welcome to visit this repo and tell us what you think. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, one thing I, uh, I, I didn't get from, from Jorge's presentation. Uh, so so I, I've seen him exemplify that. Uh, so you build a predictor, a predictor uh, model. Uh, that predictor model basically analyzes the data in a table to, to actually build the, the statistical model uh, and then you get the predicted data of course if you query it uh, what happens if you if the data underneath the the model changes do you have to perform any maintenance to the uh -huh. uh, to the uh, to the model itself do you have to do anything to 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 adjust to the changing data yeah good question uh, actually uh... Uh, sometimes uh, you need to retrain the model uh, exactly uh, because what you have mentioned, the data has changed. And um, like with MindsDB, it's easy. It's just a SQL statement. Uh, however, so you have to rerun uh, the statement again. Yeah, however, um, people might want to automate this as well. And we're also working on this feature that will come in the, like, one of the closest releases that would allow to automate uh, this model retraining based on certain behavior uh, in the data or like some uh, time uh, related uh, uh, rules, for example, uh, retrain each certain amount of uh, time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what, so, so I, I get this, but so once you build a, a model on a, on a, on a table data set, uh, so the model is created, uh, can you tune up the model after it was created, or you have to create uh, to recreate the model again and select mm -hmm. different parameters and, and things mm -hmm. like that? Okay, so if you really want to get into the, uh, your hands on into the model uh, performance, like tune it, MindsDB uh, uh, allows to do this. Uh, we just uh, announced a new feature called JSON AI uh, just uh, this September. Actually, this is part of our engine called Lightwood, as I mentioned previously. And so what it does is uh, for each model, it generates a JSON type configuration file. So you can actually get into this file and edit it, uh, edit some parameters of your data, features, or uh, encoders, and so, and so on, and actually tune your, your model. So you don't need to you know, create uh, tens, uh, dozens, of dozens of models to, to find the best performing one. So we just create a model, and you can tune it with a uh, kind of declarative machine learning approach using JSON type configuration. Yeah, I see. <clears throat> That's nice. Uh... I also saw Jorge mentioning that uh, the uh, uh, 
for, for mines to be helpful that uh, maria db requires a schema obviously for uh, for the data so data is uh, kind of has to follow some some consistency rules some 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 format which i know from my from my own experience the the quality of the data is it's it's quite quite important in in uh, easing the the work you have to do uh, but uh, uh, does the MySDB, uh, can, can MySDB perform any, any uh, data anomaly uh, elevation in real time for, for the time series data that, uh, for the time series uh, features that, that Jorge presented? Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a very good point. And we see several, uh, we have several customers who are really in need for this uh, feature and uh, this capability to get the anomaly detection in real time uh, from like, different sensors that might come or in streams or even in the database. So, uh, so this is some, some work to, to be developed? No, 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 it's, it's already in place. So actually uh, for this multivariate time series uh, detection with high, uh, prediction with high cardinality that Jorge explained, mm -hmm. uh, we have we are providing uh, confidence bounds, the confidence levels for upper and lower bounds. And uh, actually, when you make a prediction, uh, predictor understands what are the maximum and minimum possible for this uh, type of data. And it calculates uh, based on the actual data that you have for this timestamp, uh, if it falls within the bounds or falls outside. And this means the anomaly. It's an anomaly flag. So it's really easy to... Uh, do anomaly detection with MindsDB, and especially given this uh, high cardinality multivariate time series data, you can just do it in a one C SQL command, and uh, mm -hmm. it's I, it, uh, straightforward. Uh, it, it seems like a complicated problem to know what an anomaly is in the data, because from, from MindsDB perspective, you don't actually know what the data is. So it's, it seems like a complicated problem. Uh, but does MindDB uh, have any ability currently to let the user specify uh, what an anomaly is for the data? Yeah, well, actually how it works is that uh, you have a historical table uh, with your data and you train a predictor for this data based on like certain amount of time looking back and forward, uh, like prediction, how, how many uh, timestamps you want to make it forward. And then actually you'll do a left join of this uh, predictive data with your table. And it adds uh, kind of uh, for your historical data, it adds those uh, predictions like if they were done real time uh, some time mm -hmm. back, you know, mm -hmm. and it's uh, based on the historical data. It's uh, make a prediction, and if it falls outside uh, of the bounds, yeah, it flags uh, an anomaly. I, so I, it's uh, how it works. I see. You uh, can actually watch some demos we have on YouTube uh, and read I'll, our blog. I'll, I'll, our try, to, I'll try to, to to research more the the more project. Yeah, it seems pretty cool. Uh, Costa, you've done. Amazing work at, uh, at MindsDB, and I, I really like uh, the end result. Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, databases they usually have a habit to do this. They they put a lot of obstacles, you know, in 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 your work and building uh, like AI capabilities uh, on top of the of MariaDB. Is there something that uh, MariaDB community or especially the MariaDB Foundation can do? Uh, to help make your life easier, like in terms of features or in, ter in terms of bug fixes? Is there anything we can do to, to, to make you more productive in, in building your project? Well, we really welcome uh, any feedback and we are open source project. We're open to any feedback uh, and uh, our community is available. Uh, like you, you're always available to join our community and uh, like tell us what you think, uh, ask for help or anything like that and uh, just welcome to to the discussion any MariaDB users uh, what you really want uh, us to, to help you join with MindsDB what predictive needs you have and so uh, we'll come back to you just okay. get to our community okay okay thanks uh, thanks a lot and uh, this was a great chat uh, Nice to meet you. you. It was and my pleasure. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for okay. inviting me. OK, see ya. Bye. Bye bye. Bye.
Hello, my name is Valery Kravchuk. I am a principal support engineer working for MariaDB Corporation. And today I'm going to speak about DPF Trace as one of the tools that uh, MariaDB DBAs and developers may, may use to trace uh, different functions and different parts of MariaDB server code as well as any other software. So a few words about me for those who for some reason don't know me yet. I'm in this business for 16 years. I provided support for MySQL in MySQL AB, Sun and Oracle. Then I joined Percona to get more uh, positive real life experience in problem solving. Then eventually in 2016, I joined MariaDB Corporation to work on most complex and interesting problems so far. Uh, since I left Oracle, uh, I am a public person. I have a blog devoted to MySQL and MariaDB. Uh, initially, it was devoted mostly to MySQL bugs, hence the name MySQL Entomologist. But recently, it also uh, a lot about different solutions to all kinds of problems I see and document these solutions for myself in my everyday job. Uh, among other things, I work about uh, I write, sorry, about different Linux uh, and other operating system tools I use to do my job. BPF Trace is one of them. I have a Facebook page. Initially, again, it was mostly devoted to MySQL bugs marketing. Now it's more like a personal space, which is reasonable. Uh, I still write and speak about bugs. Uh, I write about them at my Twitter account that is named MySQL bugs. There I have a, a useful tag, bug of the day. And once in a while, several times per week, I write about some MySQL bugs. <laughs> this, my public activity in MySQL ecosystem was eventually noted. So in 2019, I was nominated and got the award as MySQL Community Contributor of the Year. That's the last year so far when we had the chance to get this award. Uh, as a public person, I write and speak about MySQL and MariaDB in public, mostly at FOSDEM conferences, uh, Percona Live conferences historically and uh, all kinds of MariaDB events. And I'm happy about that. Uh, from my past, what you should know is that I worked uh, for a long time as a trainer for DBAs, not MySQL DBAs. And from that time, I have a habit uh, of creating such a primitive and simple presentations that uh, may be used as a reference. So whenever you see some underlined uh, word on my uh, slides that are already public and will be available to you no matter what conference committee and MariaDB first, first organizers do or maybe forget to do. So my slides are always available. And when on my slides you see something underlined, it's a link. So you can click on it to end up uh, somewhere, uh, in this case, in my blog, for example. Uh, to summarize my experience over these 16 years, uh, I spent this time solving all kinds of complex problems, and I tried to share my experience. And basically, at times, I had to drink. Uh, I met and worked with many people as customers as, and colleagues. So as I put it, similar to Tyrion Lannister from, from the famous book and series, I drink and I know things. Cheers. What you should also understand is that while I'm uh, associated and work for MariaDB Corporation, I always speak for myself. I act as an independent consultant. I am my own private business owner. So uh, I try to do my best to uh, tell true things I believe in or I know. But uh, whatever I say, suggest, approaches, tools, comments, whatever are mine and shouldn't be considered as coming from my current or any previous employees or partners. So the topic today is uh, BPF trace, but is it the only way or the only tool that may be used to get uh, tracing and profiling information for software like MariaDB? MariaDB? No, not at all. Initially, uh, developers, uh, 
try to debug problems from the repeatable test cases. Uh, and when they do, they try to use uh, specially built debug binaries uh, where you know what? Debug printouts is embedded based on debug package, so they can be enabled dynamically. And in old part of MySQL and still inherited MariaDB code, you can find out that every enter and exit from the function is instrumented with uh, special macros that in debug binaries may be uh, enabled and so print whatever information was considered important at the moment. For DBAs, there are also other kinds of tools. Uh, normally in production, nobody uses debug binaries because they are too slow. So with time, a lot of tools were added, uh, famous show commands, show status, show global status, show engine in ODB status, show whatever storage engine in ODB uh, status, and many other things. So SQL level commands. Uh, eventually, thanks to contribution from elsewhere, ReadyB got uh, not just a slow query log. What you usually care about uh, as a DBA are slow queries coming from applications. And then you find out why they are slow. But that's the initial task. So they can be uh, written to a separate log. And the extended slow query log allows you to get a lot of insights on how the slow statement was executed, how many rows were read, what kinds of operations were done, uh, had it used temporary tables, and many similar things. Starting from MySQL, 5.0, uh, the information schema was introduced like a metadata about the, the server internal workings. At least this is supposed to be the place based on SQL standard. So there are different tables in the information schema, both uh, those that can be considered a part of the data dictionary and those related to performance, those explaining what kind of operations, how many, when were executed uh, at the server. So one of the tools to get insights of internal workings is surely, for example, InnoDB data dictionary tables exposed and even uh, such internals of InnoDB as the content of the buffer pool are, uh, is exposed uh, over uh, via the separate tables in the information schema with types. Additionally, due to contributions by the users who try to use MySQL and friends in production, uh, we've got another uh, important uh, tools. For example, the first uh, first uh, really well accepted and popular community contribution by Jeremy Cole is command called show profiles that allow to trace the time spent on different stages of specific query execution. So it's kind of query profile that can be written uh, down somewhere and then restored uh, queried with SQL statement or uh, with just show command. So you can see where the time was spent. Uh, when we speak not about just time, but uh, what does the application load mean for the database server? There was a user start edition, as far as I remember, initially by Google. And it was made popular by Percona and is available in MariaDB as well. So user start, again, uh, when you enable it, you get uh, three or so tables in the information schema additionally. Information schema is extendable with plugins, and that's great. So uh, those present uh, activities of specific client, activities related to specific tables, how many rows were read or written to the table, activities related to specific index. This way you can find out if any table or index was used at all. It's also tracing. Uh, eventually, uh, it was decided that we need a, a low-impact uh, but very detailed uh, tracing that can be used in production. And starting from MySQL 5.5, the performance schema was added, and it was supposed to be the ultimate solution for DBAs uh, for getting the insights of server working. But it depends on instrumenting the server code. And for such a complex code base as MySQL and MariaDB with uh, third-party storage engines and similar things, you cannot expect uh, proper instrumentation. And it's still work in progress, even though a huge wave was already passed. And if we speak about MySQL 8 or 5.7, it's largely instrumented by performance schema. Uh, it's less true uh, for MariaDB. Uh, MariaDB 10.5 finally is more or less similar in this regard to MySQL 5.7. Uh, and historically, the developers of MariaDB tend to use other debug and tracing facilities, and it's still the case. So performance schema was like not the first level citizen in this ecosystem. It's even disabled by default in MariaDB, and that matters because while it can be configured dynamically, it can should be enabled at start uh, time. One of the reasons, other than personal preferences of, of many 
core developers of MariaDB, why performance schema is not enabled by default, is performance impact that uh, in extreme cases in MySQL as well can be as high as dozens of percents of overhead. It depends on what instruments you enable or how you trace, what do you query. And there are many other problems related to performance schema, even though the idea is great. It's based on uh, collecting information in the memory buffers, and it's one of the best practices for, for low impact trace. So what I am advocating historically for probably four, almost five years already at different conferences, these days we mostly use uh, MySQL and MariaDB on Linux. And Linux as an operating system is getting a lot of uh, its own tracing and profiling tools that were initially created by Linux kernel developers. Uh, to solve performance problems of Linux kernel itself, uh, and we can just use them. So I suggest to use different tools from this uh, kind that are all available starting from Linux kernels 2.6 at least, so for more than a decade. It started with a prod file system, pro, sorry, uh, where a lot of internal workings and state of processes is presented. Then very soon uh, it came as an F-trace interface, uh, and very soon again, Profiling was added to this, uh, yet another profiling framework that we know and use via perf. And with time, starting from kernels 3 and kernels 4, and uh, eventually a very elaborated set of tools uh, is now available in Linux kernel 5, current ones. This set of tools is called eBPF tools, extended uh, Berkeley packet filters. It's coming originally from BSD systems. And packet filters means that this set of tools was initially created for uh, uh, flexible uh, to provide flexible way, way to do filtering, uh, network filtering, packet packages processing over network. So high performance and highly flexible ways to process information on the fly with minimal impact. So there was a set of tools with different Linux version, and of them, today I'm going to speak about BPF trace. Uh, so uh, other tools were already covered by uh, several of my talks at different conferences, so it's just about time to move on to BPF trace, and I will try to explain why. There is yet another way to study the way uh, what happens in uh, MariaDB server uh, that is also concentrated on things that matter uh, for the application for final users, and it's based on capturing the traffic, TCP dump analysis, for example. If you can capture every packet on the wire, you can see that it belongs to MariaDB protocol, and you can see that there is a query, and you can find out how fast you can get a reply, and many more details. So this is also one of the approaches. I'm not advocating it right now, but it's still valuable. So uh, basically, uh, while this session is about tracing, that is uh, understanding which function calls basically happened, and profiling, that is understanding how much time was spent per function call or uh, how resources were used per specific function call in general. Time is just CPU time is just one of the resources. Other resources include memory, for example. So uh, this session is about tracing and profiling uh, such a complex software as MariaDB Server on modern Linux versions. Specifically, I tested most of the recent examples, and I will show you how it works on Ubuntu. It's not the latest and greatest, but uh, recent enough. Uh, 20.04. Uh, basically, any Linux uh, distribution recent enough to include kernels 5 will perfectly work for the, for the tool and the approach. So uh, unlike in many other similar presentations from me and my colleagues and other people in the community, I am concentrating specifically on BPF trace tool. That is like a, a convenient utility for DBAs and convenient utility for uh, one-liner small programs, small quick scripts to prove the point or find out something that is simple enough and Unix way enough, uh, similar enough to many other tools to be easily used. So I will discuss some problems uh, that can be resolved by PPF trace, some problems to use BPF trace, and solutions to some of these problems. The uh, main point why I'm even speaking about BPF trace is uh, that it uh, allows you to do tracing and profiling in production with minimal impact. And we try to estimate what does it mean, minimal. 
So debug binary is a huge impact. And they are hardly practical. Tracing with tools like uh, Valgrind, for example, uh, and uh, related tools is also hardly practical. Uh, we need something faster. I do not speak about performance schema because of my current focus and uh, work for MariaDB for five years. So here developers would like to get the repeatable uh, test cases as everywhere and uh, performance problems or other problems presented with code insights, basically with the stack traces. So this is what you cannot get so far from the performance schema and it's not enabled by default and it's widely discussed elsewhere. Uh, Perf and BCC tools uh, were discussed in my other talks and uh, blog posts, so that's why I do not speak about them now. Uh, they are also a bit harder to use and may um, maybe less flexible, even more performant and more suitable. So uh, I suggest to use modern Linux operating system tools while troubleshooting MariaDB server, uh, both for developers and for uh, production DBAs and for support engineers, and I'm trying to do it myself. Of all these tools, I would like to uh, concentrate on BPF trace, uh, which is uh, put into the uh, context here in this picture uh, slide that I borrowed from Brandon Gregg's uh, blog that I suggest you to read. Here it is, you can see a link. You can follow it. Uh, so uh, here we have different layers of the uh, Linux operating system and applications working on it, different performance uh, sources of performance information, different part, parts that can be traced to monitor. And here you see a set of tools that cover the full stack from the application code to device drivers and everything. And BPF trace is one of these tools. Uh, it's not the first one, it's one of the newest, and there are other tools, Perf, Ftrace, and other uh, profilers historically, but PPFtrace is the latest and to a large extent is the greatest. I will try to show you why. Basically, if we speak about the applications, we are not going to uh, trace Linux kernel most of the time, or even though some uh, System calls are useful to trace, and S trace utility, for example, is uh, a popular tool among DBAs uh, used to understand what's going on, why something hangs, what happens. Uh, but basically, uh, when we speak about and try to deal with such a complex code base as MariaDB Server, we need the insights into uh, the uh, server code. So we need a way to uh, trace and profile functions in this code. That's why from all possible sources of information about uh, performance or about uh, the events, we are interested in so-called user probes. Uh, all kinds of uh, traceable uh, sources of information can be split in two dimensions, those in the kernel and those in the application, it's one dimension, and those that can be added dynamically and like appears automatically when you need them, and those that require uh, changes in the code. These are called manual annotations. So performance schema basically is based on manual annotations. You have to put something into the source code to be able to then uh, cure it uh, and access it through performance scheme. Uh, here uh, in this presentation, I will be mostly concentrated on user probes uh, for the application, in this case, MariaDB server. Over the time, support for all different sources of uh, information were added to to the uh, tools based on uh, BPF. So some historical remarks. Uh, so basically eBPF or extended BPF these days is it's usually again called BPF is a tiny language for LLVM virtual machine that can be, uh, uh, that uh, runs inside the kernel context and can execute some safe code. Initially, eBPF uh, was uh, invented as a more flexible way to do packet filtering, uh, stateful uh, firewalls and similar, similar things. Uh, basically, TCP dump is implemented that way. But as soon as we have such a, a safe way to uh, execute uh, the code that originates from the end user, it's not a part of the kernel itself, but in the kernel context, with access to different facilities, kernel already provides for other tools, uh, like, for example, performance events uh, that were created for profiler, for perf profiler. So as long as we have that, uh, it's very tempting to use these for other means. 
So how comes this is safe? Uh, first of all, it's a virtual machine. It's not a real code executing in kernel. It's not like you have to create a kernel module, compile it, and put it into kernel context. Then, to make sure the code is safe, when you first translate it into the byte code for this virtual machine, this byte code comes via the verifier. Verifier uh, tries to check, uh, basically, that there are no dead loops, that the code will always complete, that it's safe, it does not access any memory that it shouldn't. So uh, then, uh, if uh, the code generated passes the verify, it's executed by the virtual machine, and virtual machine can access different uh, facilities inside the kernel. As a result, it can uh, create, uh, collect the information same way as performance schema does for MySQL and MariaDB in uh, the in-memory ring buffers. In this case, it's they are called maps. Uh, basically, these are associative arrays in general. So some, some array that can be indexed by arbitrary uh, information by strings in general. So uh, these maps are named, and you can access them by index. And there is an efficient way to map specific index to the specific value. So ideally, this information is collected, uh, summarized in such maps, and then it's output uh, in asynchronous manner to the user land, to the user program, when needed or at the end of the execution in the form of statistics. You can surely also get uh, information from other sources, put it synchronously or asynchronously, uh, back to the user land. So the idea is that while processing happens in, it happens in kernel, there are no context switches in between user land and kernel, so it's super efficient. And as you have a virtual machine, you can do a lot of things here to summarize the information you need and return only information you need to the user land. So uh, the amount of information sent back and forth uh, exchanged via file system is limited compared to other ways. So that's why it can be efficient if used properly. So historically, uh, eBPF uh, was added to Linux kernels 4. Uh, it's still uh, available in uh, and distributions like Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, for example, and CentOS 7, due to the way they, they named their kernels three, but they backport features. So with time uh, till the uh, version 4.9, uh, all the features I mentioned before were already implemented. It was a process. So for some older Ubuntu, for example, my previous favorite was 16.04. Uh, it stopped somewhere here, so it was not a great uh, target for many uh, eBPF-based tools because it was lacking some of the uh, features. Uh, but basically, on any modern Linux kernel, uh, you can use eBPF programs, uh, and they are safe, easy to work with. And uh, while uh, basically uh, the virtual machine can uh, execute the code generated from many high-level languages like C, Python, or whatever, uh, in most cases, you do not need to, to program, actually, to code anything. Uh, you use uh, some exist pre-existing problems. So there is a lot of dozens of so-called BCC. BCC stands for uh, BPF Compiler Collection. So BCC front-ends that uh, already implements basic tracing, for example, uh, a lot of insights into the kernel. You should study them. But uh, each specific front-end, it's not... Uh, flexible enough to cover everything and eventually user would like to code something uh, by himself so uh, for users who do not uh, want to go to as low level as coding in c or python or whatever bpf trace was invented as a high level but still complete feature complete language similar to awk that can be easily used to to create quick and mostly efficient tools and check various ideas so what is BPF Trace? So BPF Trace is a front-end, programmable front-end, based on programming language that resembles AWK. Uh, the program is expressed as, as a sequence set of pattern action pairs, or more generally, filter pattern action. So uh, you uh, set conditions uh, when the pattern uh, or pattern sets the conditions uh, for the action to be executed, and if the MAT action is executed, and you move on to the next command. So it's like one-way path. Uh, it's feature complete and flexible. Uh, so BPF trace at the same time allows you to access all kinds of events, all event sources that I mentioned previously, kernel trace points, user probes, 
static uh, instrumentation in application code, uh, you can actually trace and do something at enter of an every function, it's user probe, at return from function, it's your red probe. Uh, there are special probes for that are executed once at the beginning and at the end, there is access to performance counters and everything. So BPF trace probe types covers full stack uh, and allows you basically to do everything. So, how to start with BPF trace? It's easy. You have to install it. Uh, it's easy, and at the same time, it's not easy because uh, BPF trace, while it's provided as packages in more than uh, Linux systems, uh, usually these packages are somewhat outdated. Uh, we can try to do something like this. Package minus L. So you can see that version that comes uh, with uh, my Ubuntu is somewhat older, or in case of BPF trace, so it's uh, much older than what I have right now. So it's very different, while uh, 0 0.9.1 uh, is already good enough for most cases, but it's still outdated comparing to what you can get uh, by building from source. So you need to get that BPF trace. And as soon as you get it and check that it basically works somehow, I built it from source as old as September 16, uh, so just like a week ago, less than a week ago. First thing to do is uh, call it with help option. Help shows you how to use the tool basically. Uh, it accepts some options and either executes the BPF trace program with minus E option execute or get it from the standard input or get it from the file name. PPF trace is the binary, so you can actually use normal Linux uh, practice of running the text file via this binary as usual. So there are many options and I uh, suggest you to study them. We can see how it works in reality. So here we have the options. I documented just some of them. Uh, uh, those that are surely used uh, often and uh, that will be useful for you. So main option is help itself, uh, execute a program. It's quoted, it's put in single uh, quotes uh, because it uses uh, meta symbols for shell. So you should care not to interpret them. So what else? Uh, in case of a uh, program that program that try to tries to trace uh, kernel internals um, or maybe some application code with quite complex structures, you may need includes. And there is a way that you can really use include directive similar to C programming language, but you need to know where to find your include. So there is minus I option. Interesting option is called list. So you can list uh, pre-existing probes that uh, matches some uh, template. Interesting stuff here is the number of probes for the Linux kernel itself. Just count them. Sorry, you have to run BPF trace as root of your sudo. That's also a problem for somebody. But that's true for all Linux profiling tools in general. So as you can see, uh, the kernel itself uh, provides like uh, 70,000 uh, different probes and trace points that you can use in your programs. You can uh, try to run uh, your programs while debugging, while working with them uh, in a move both mode with minus V or minus info option. So I will skip some of these. You have to study them. Uh, there are also environment variables uh, that uh, matter. I've highlighted three of them. Uh, the most important one probably uh, is this one. There is a limit on number of probes you can create with BPF trace. It's large enough, but for the purposes of this talk, I already hit this limit uh, while working on some of the examples. So if you will set the goal of tracing too many different functions, you will have to 
set the environment variable to a higher value. And there is a cost, surely, more memory used and maybe slower execution, so you should be careful. Another thing is that those maps or associative arrays by default are also limited in BPF trace to just four kilobytes of different case. Uh, if you will be collecting different stack traces of MariaDB, for example, you may need more. And yet another one is uh, less of a problem, but uh, by default now modern version of BPF trace understand mangled, not only mangled, sorry, but demangled C++ symbolic names for function methods, uh, function calls from classes. So this is enabled by default, but if you do not want that, you can disable it. There are some more, but I never uh, had a need uh, by now to change them. These three I played with, so I highlighted them. Now, how the program look like? So as I told you, it's pairs, probe, action, or uh, triples uh, in a more general case. So there is a probe. You set some action for the probe. You can set it conditionally. Uh, so if uh, this probe is hit and if this condition filter is true, then action is executed. Program consists of such sequences, one or more of them. You need at least one, otherwise there is no problem. Uh, so a probe, how you define probes? There are keywords and different kinds of probes that you may use. Here you have highlights uh, that uh, will refer you to the reference guide. So basically my point is that if you are going to use BPF trace, you have to read the reference guide. So uh, same as in, in AWK text processing language, there are begin and end probes. Begin is executed once before everything else and is executed at the end. Now, there are types of probes for the uh, sources of information for the traceable events that were already presented. There are kernel probes, kernel return probes, user probes, user return probe, kernel trace point, user static defined trace uh, points. Uh, there are probes for uh, profiling, sampling, with some frequency or uh, executing uh, at some time interval. There is access to software and hardware performance counters. Uh, this one, watch point, you can set watch point and conditional watch points if you need to the memory areas by address. I had not used it, it's highlighted for me. Basically try it, but it's similar to watch point in, in debuggers as well. So you can do something when uh, some uh, memory address is read, written or executed. It's cool. So these are basic types of probes. There are more. So I'm not going to uh, explain you the entire reference and it's not practical and it, one would need time and experiments to understand that. But the language is basic. So other language elements uh, that resemble uh, AWK to me, uh, action blocks in curly brackets, uh, filtering, uh, it's just a condition that can be very elaborated. There are comments, normal uh, two slashes or slash uh, star, star slash multi-line comments if you need, if you create larger programs. You can uh, use structures, uh, so you can define structures, you can get uh, used structures from includes you have, similar to C, but when you refer to structure members, uh, you refer to them via this uh, operator, not via dot like in C, but so like you dereference them. There are conditional statements, there are incremental operators, many more, there is also plus, uh, equal, minus, equal, and uh, you will see them used. There, are, there is a limited set of data types. Basically, everything is a string by default. So there are also integer numbers, there are no float numbers. Uh, eventually, uh, some uh, loops were added. Initially, uh, it was a problem because one has to make sure the loop ends. So verifying the loop was kind of problematic, but it's already done. It's maybe a safe function, but it works. You can, uh, that's important, uh, you can use not just uh, scalar variables, but you can use associative arrays, maps, and uh, square brackets is the way to index into the map. There are also tuples and stuff. So basically what I'm saying here, uh, yet another slide about the language elements, and then we have to dive into sample programs or write in your own programs, the, the best way to study programming language, actually. It's hard to read the manual for days and write code nothing. So variables, there are built-in variables. This is important. Uh, there are built-in variables for most common things you will need in your tracing or profiling programs. Process ID, thread ID, user ID, group ID for current process on which CPU we run, which uh, command executable file we are running, what is the return value from the function, what is the function name that you are currently probing, what is the full probe name, random numbers, uh, when we work in containers and try to limit things, which C group we 
uh, belong to. Uh, we have some way to work with positional arguments of the traced functions. By default, sorry, they are not strings, but numbers, but they can be interpreted as strings. There are also some interesting built-ins related to times, uh, nanoseconds, time spent since the program started, elapsed, uh, nanoseconds, sorry, it's a timestamp and elapsed, uh, starts to count from, from zero. So there are variables. There are global variables that are available in different probes starting with add. If you uh, would like to limit uh, a variable to a specific thread, you can use a map. And there are thread-specific uh, local variables uh, with uh, dollar prefix. Uh, there are associative arrays, and they can be multidimensional. For example, a uh, single-dimensional array for start time uh, indexed by thread ID, and we uh, assign current timestamp, and two-dimensional array memory. So, uh, in this array, this uh, thread ID from this uh, stack got this return value. Uh, there are predefined variables that return associative arrays themselves. So k stack and u stack, they actually aliases for functions. And we can even deal with command line arguments in the same way as shell. So you can write programs that will be uh, that can be parameterized and can be applied to MySQL D and MariaDBD if you want, for example. So it's doable. We will see maybe examples of most of this. So uh, I was lying to you. There is another slide uh, here for uh, functions. Uh, languages like C relies on a library of predefined functions. I cannot say it's a library, but typical functions are here. Printf, C style, print, printing something, something converting to a string, zero terminated, uh, executing system command, uh, preliminary exit from the program, so it's completed. Uh, getting stacks in various format, uh, getting size of, of different structures, comparing strings up to the nth element, and many more. So just read the reference. So maps or associative arrays. So this is the most universal type of, of storage. So it's a memory area that can be indexed. Uh, one, more, one important point about the BPF trace is uh, so several actually related to maps. First, uh, you do not declare anything, you just use it. By default, uh, maps are empty. If you define some index, you have the element. By, by default, this element is zero if interpreted as integer. So uh, at the end of the execution, if the map is not empty, it's printed. It's the default way the BPF trace works. You can rely on it to output the information you need, or you have to deal with it if you do not need these maps. Either they should be cleared, or you need to exit preliminary, do something. There are several map-related functions. Count is a basic one. Uh, there are some typical uh, aggregation functions. Uh, two kinds of histogram, uh, logarithmic and linear histogram. So what about histogram? Uh, the histogram uh, is uh, representing the range of uh, values that we see in the map in, in a different way. So we can uh, see how many uh, times the function, for example, was executed for one millisecond comparing to 10 milliseconds. So you can create a histogram of execution times of a function. If you need to delete specific key from the map, there is a delete function. Uh, there is a print uh, function, it also applies to map. If you want to clear, delete all keys from the map, there is a clear function. And if you would like to set all the values in the map to zero, there is a zero function. There are more probably. I just never care to find out. So the language is simple enough, but not so simple to just start writing programs. Uh, I suggest you to start with studying one-liners uh, that are not uh, MariaDB or MySQL specific, but uh, those specific to Linux kernel and useful for DBAs as well. So go here and check this tutorial uh, that uh, will give you some uh, insights on which trace points and, uh, are provided by the kernel. So some simple examples. I've already shown you BPF trace minus L, but you can apply some filter. So uh, in total, there were 69 thousand different probes, but you can uh, give a name. So basically a probe is named kind of probe, uh, then uh, if it's in the kernel, it's among syscalls, and this is a specific syscall. Uh, it's a template for the name. So with syscall name that starts from sysenter. Uh, 
So you can trace file opening, as you know, system calls, uh, you can trace specific uh, trace point, uh, you need to check the source for the for this. You can count, for example, here is an interesting one-liner. So it uses, that one is also interesting. It uses printf format, a uh, command name, uh, converting uh, argument to zero terminated string for printing. Here we have a map, a map uh, with command as an index and how many times this specific system call, uh, each specific system call was uh, executed by each program. So uh, how large are read uh, commands in this case, uh, uh, read requests from specific commands and the histogram is built. So you can literally uh, run that, that as well. So just copy paste it and see what happens. It's a great way to study the tool. Uh, in the tool subdirectory in the source of BPF tracer that you can get from GitHub, you can find a more elaborated, not one-liners, but more complex programs, which are very interesting. Uh, I had written a separate blog post about this. Uh, they are a great way to study how larger programs are coded in this language. Let's consider one of them as an example. Block IO snoop BT. So this is how BPF trace is usually executed. This way you uh, run the, the version of BPF trace that is pointed out by your environment. This is a, the way to include something from the kernel sources. You definitely need this source um, to be on your system. Now we have comments. Now we have a begin probe. At the beginning, uh, one of the things you can do, you can either print some instructions on how to use uh, the program, or you can print some header. So here we print some header for the information and format uh, define formatting for the information we provide later. Now, here we have a kernel probe for block account IO start and kernel probe for block account IO done. There are actually two kinds of ways uh, you can deal with kernel functions and many library functions. Either there is enter to the function and return, or there is one function that uh, is executed at the start and the function that is executed at the end. So here we have such a pair of functions. We see that different maps, four different maps are used. So arc0 is actually a command that was executed. So we store when the process started timestamp, which process by ID, which command it was. And we uh, get uh, the uh, information of uh, what uh, now we do it at the uh, enter to this call. So what disk IO block disk IO call was executed. So this call has an argument. So, and for this argument, we store uh, specifically which uh, disk we uh, requested. So when the IO is done, we check that we are actually matching this enter probe for this. We are checking that uh, for this specific argument, uh, we have already stored something, something in our maps. And only in this case, we uh, compute time spent and then we uh, put some information of, of how much time was spent on specific request, uh, when it was, which request it was, and things like that. Then uh, to uh, clean this information, we delete the key from the map. Now what we have at the end, at the end we clear everything so that the remainings from the last maybe incompleted system call are not printed upon exit. So it's the way to have a clean uh, BPF trace probe. Other option, what you can uh, do uh, differently at the end probe, in the end probe, sorry, you can uh, print some summary information. Specifically, you can print specific map in a way you like with print function. This is a quote from syscount, counting system calls per process. Also one of examples. So, coming back to our business of uh, SQL database, MariaDB specifically, Okay, we can trace system calls. We have a, a flexible way to replace S trace if we prefer. We have almost 70,000 trace points uh, in the kernel to work with. But coming back to MariaDB, what we can do? We can define a user probe. It's, uh, that's the very basic thing that I start with uh, while uh, dealing with every new dynamic tracing tool that I try to add to my toolbox. So specifically for this case, uh, what we're interested in is DBAs. We are probably interested in, in queries that are executed by the application. So one of the basic ideas I try to implement is to capture the query, uh, not on the wire, but somewhere in the code and maybe print the query and uh, ideally uh, measure how much time is spent executing this query. 
So the query I know this from code review. It had not always been the case in all versions. It changes, but in recent versions, it's true that normal, simple, non-prepared statement uh, is executed inside dispatch command. So you will see it in every stack trace of every thread that is executing user query. So when you enter, it's uh, your start of executing the query. When you create from this function and return from it, uh, it's the end. So basically, if we would like to measure time of query execution, we can measure time or should measure time spent in dispatch command. This uh, command has uh, three arguments in the recent MariaDB version. One of them is thread, very complex structure. We are interested in the third argument that is basically a packet. Uh, and usually for non-prepared statements, it does include a SQL code, uh, SQL statement that is executed. So I end up, I ended up uh, on all the Fedora some time ago, maybe a year ago already, with such a uh, BPF trace uh, program, not a one-liner, uh, but it can be put into one line as well. So I am executing something quoted. There are two probe, user probe for the binary. So I define the probe specific binary that I built from source and installed here. Here I've used a mangled name of dispatch command that I've got from, from I can get from different sources actually. I can get it from pair, from ftrace, from object dump. Uh, there are good news about it. Anyway, so I know the mangled name for dispatch command. Uh, now I use a map, a map called SQL. So I will store a SQL statement executed by a specific thread, and I get it as, as a zero terminated string from the third argument. Arguments start with arc zero, so it's arc two. And I have yet another map called start, so I uh, store the timestamp when this thread, by this thread ID. Each thread executes at most one query at a time so far in MariaDB, so there is no parallel query execution at the moment. So this trick works. Upon return from this function, what am I doing? It's the same probe, but for the same function, mangled name, but return. I am checking that I am actually return from uh, the function that I managed to store the start of. So I am checking this is not zero. And then I am printing what SQL statement was executed by what threads and uh, try to convert timestamps into milliseconds. How the result looks like. It looks like this, basically. So unlike uh, I do this trick with ftrace, I do this trick with perf, it can be done with other profilers, it can be done by many tools, uh, but uh, the way I can do it in BPF trace is very simple. I do not need to code anything. I, even with modern BPF trace, I do not need that mangled names. It's a historical thing, but if we can check what I did here, here I did the following. Let's try BPF trace, BPF trace. One button. Yes, so eventually I'll find what I'm looking for. Yes, so here I uh, have a command uh, where I use it, apply it to MariaDB 10.6 that I have up and running right now. And I used uh, not a mangled name, but a real name of a function. So what if I'll run it via sudo? My version is all newer than 0 0.11. So, and then what if I go to a different terminal like this and run some statements like and exit from the session. So what do we have here? I have the result of my uh, sorry, BPF trace command. Uh, so I see the following. First of all, upon connection, uh, there was a request for version command. Uh, I had not connected to any specific database, otherwise there would be some other commands. What I see is that that same thread ID, this one, uh, executed one plus one over zero um, milliseconds and executed uh, sleep three over three thousand milliseconds, three seconds exactly. So it was all run from the same thread. If I have a multi-thread load, I will get different outputs per different threads. The point of this demonstration was to show that in modern BPF trace, you can use demangled uh, names. So that's really the case. That's why, that's why I care to upgrade to recent Ubuntu and try to use recent distributions. 
So uh, this is quite flexible, and I've had shown you just a demo that uh, the tool evolves with time. I can capture the queries. I have a slow query log with a lot of details that can be printed if I want them uh, on the fly, whenever I need in production. And then I stop my BPF trace, and trace and stops. There is no impact when I'm not tracing at all. I do not need to write anything. I can collect, uh, summarize, and do everything. So uh, we can trace functions in the MariaDB server code. One of the ideas we discussed with one of the developers of uh, MariaDB was, uh, is there any way to use dynamic tracing tools as a way to check code coverage by some tests? So basically, which function, functions are executed when we run the test? We can try to use BPF trace this way, and I did it for this presentation, but there are surely problems. So when I did this lame attempt, try to trace every function and just print it, I found out hard way that there are uh, 34, almost 35,000 different functions, traceable functions in MariaDB. And I hit a limit, BPF trace max probes. I try to increase the limit on my uh, Ubuntu system, but I hit yet another problem. Yes, we ca you can get uh, the, uh, the way to try to create all these probes, but you may hit uh, different problems of different kinds, eventually segmentation fault. You were warned about this, actually. It might lead even to a system crash. So what we can be sure about that by default on my Ubuntu, lame approach, just trace everything, does not work. Is it the end of the story? No, it isn't. Because, uh, first of all, we can try to be more selective. We can run not one uh, code coverage test, but multiple. And we are supposed that this uh, code coverage test covers specific functions, for example, some functions we do in their names, and check. So for do, we ended up with just about uh, 1,100 of different probes. It was doable because I changed the environment variable, but we hit yet another problem that I had not debugged uh, yet. So it still doesn't work. But if we uh, try to be even more picky and uh, try to trace a different uh, set of functions, it's doable. For example, it's easy to set 70 probes for uh, various functions with command in the world, uh, in, in the function name, and it works. Moreover, I will show you yet another example here. So we have a bit extended idea here for the BPF trace uh, and probes which is, sorry, again, I'm typing something wrong. Let me find it. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, I will have to change it because it was some lame attempt attempt to do something. So we can just uh, try this. Mm, uh, assuming from the experiment that I have not more than 1,000 uh, different probes for function names starting with HA, its handler interface, I can try to count how many times the function is executed. Here is plus equal statement. So let's try to do it, and we probably hit some problem, but we will, we will be able to resolve it. So as soon as we run this, or well, maybe not. Uh, in this environment, probably uh, the problem we might hit, uh, oh, yes, there is a limit. OK, too many open files. Yes, I was looking for something like that. So we do not do unsafe things. We hit some, some problems. Uh, too many open files. OK, what we have here with the number of open files? Uh, too small. What if we do this? Limit minus n, for example, 10,000, and then try to repeat. Oh, it kind of works, and we can put some load here. For the load, I will try to, sorry, to run some sysbench, or LTP read write test, for example. I let it work for, for a few dozens of seconds. It's not a big deal what it does or what it shows. Uh, yeah, the performance impact is not huge, so it does matter. I, I know that from experience, but uh, if we eventually Sorry, go here and stop execution. Eventually, maybe not immediately, we will get some useful output. So let's continue. Uh, thing is, there are lim limits, but we can deal with them. You can hit problems, you have to deal with them. Uh, you cannot trace every function uh, of MariaDB server. It's too complex program, but you can uh, trace something like a thousand of functions. Let's see, let me just see what was collected in this file, how maps are, are printed and what is inside. It's interesting, by the way. 
So what we can see here is, is the following. So we see here, yeah, let me scroll. So in total, there were uh, a bit less than 1,000 probes. I knew it. And the map is printed in increasing, uh, sorted by the uh, by increasing uh, value of the key. So we can see how many heap engine uh, calls we had, and we see that eventually the highest number of calls was for multiple range read and uh, next case can uh, call in in ODB. So that's already cool and it worked. And the performance impact, just trust me or check yourself, is not that huge. And we will see the result a bit later on one of the slides for a different test, but still. What else we can do? As I told from the very beginning, the developers of MariaDB are actually interested uh, in many cases. They're interested in stack traces. So what was cool that there are uh, a way to get a stack trace uh, in a probe. And here is a poor man's profiler uh, based on BPF trace. There is a profile probe. You can say how many times per second it's Hertz argument. Uh, this, in this case, 99 times per second. We would like to do something. We sample the stack traces of MariaDB process only. We can sample everything, by the way. And we are printing stack trace uh, in the format that is similar to perf. By default, uh, BPF trace has a bit different format. And we put it into a new stack. And this way, we can get stack traces. I have a blog post showing uh, how uh, well, if you have a stack trace, you can do many things with it. If you have aggregated stack traces, as, as in uh, this my blog post, you can create flame graph and do many other things. Thing is, you stack just provide a way to capture this stack uh, in many places, but for example, at specific rate as a sampling profile. That's already cool. So speaking about the performance impact, uh, depending on what you trace, it can be notable. Here you can see somewhat similar uh, sysbench uh, test running, and you can see that eventually we have a two times like drop in uh, queries per second. Why is it so? Because uh, in this case, uh, the case is from a real life uh, set of not even debugging, but studying sessions uh, with one of the MariaDB developers uh, who studied weights. And he invented, uh, suggested different way to trace and represent weights. So one of his initial suggestions was to trace p-thread mutex log calls and see uh, where they come from. So for this, uh, where there is a request, I have an immediate uh, solution. I just checked uh, where our threads come from. It's a library, and I've put a user probe for the library, for the mutex lock, but I fired it only if it was coming from MariaDBD. And I counted, uh, so I needed to find the most popular uh, stacks that end up with the thread mutex lock for, for a flame graph. So the performance impact of this tracing was already notable, two times decrease in uh, queries per second and transactions per second. Why? Because the thread mutex lock is often called. So even with BPF trace, the uh, number of probes matter and how frequent, uh, frequently the probe is uh, fired also matters. So it cannot be uh, just trace everything and be happy and get the results without impact. No, the impact is always something to care about. After we studied the result, uh, the developer got the idea that uh, mutex lock call is not something to trace actually because Calling mutex and waiting on mutex are different things. So then we tried to trace LLL low level lock weight with BPF trace uh, in that same library. Uh, so we ended up with a bit more elaborated program that I uh, tried to run for predefined uh, number of seconds. It's the first argument of the program, how long it runs, like 10 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever. It's not the first attempt, and there is a whole story in several blog posts behind it. So basically, what we are doing, we are doing more or less the same, uh, but we are storing so-called futex stacks, and we are not storing in them forever, because they, there may be a lot of them different, and it's slow, but we are printing them immediately. So we are doing a kind of opposite thing to what is typically suggested for BPF trace. We are not summarizing the information in kernel context. No, we are outputting it for summarization later. But this way, the performance impact is smaller. So we collect stacks uh, that lead to uh, a low-level lock weight, and uh, we count how many times this stack was noted over the runtime past the first parameter. 
they are summarized externally, and the, uh, we found out it's great for performance, actually. And uh, some specific uh, problem was resolved. We found a good point of contention in that case, all with dynamic tracing based on BPF trace. Well, maybe in reality it was based on, based on perf events, but it's doable with BPF trace as well. So what else? Uh, it's tempting to trace everything with BPF trace because whenever you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you try to nail it down. And uh, well, recently and even today I had to deal with uh, problems that look like memory leaks. So it was interesting to check if BPF trace may help us to trace memory allocations, and it can. There is another library that implements malloc, so we can trace malloc calls. It's a one-liner that shows that we can really get a probe fired for every allocation, which thread allocated how many bytes. <clears throat> One can elaborate uh, based on this idea uh, and try to save, uh, for example, stack traces that caused uh, this memory allocation. And this sample program worked, but it started to output uh, the map, uh, which is collected, printing stacks. Uh, like five minutes after we stopped collection. And the performance impact on this bench load was so high that I call this a template. Uh, I found out that actually the most of the time is spent on resolving stack traces. So BPF trace, when we use uStack, it tries to resolve stack from addresses to function names. Not only it's a bit less flexible than perf uh, in this regard, so it cannot resolve everything perf can. Uh, the time spent is notable. And it's a huge performance impact. So what I'm looking for right now is a way to get uh, maybe not resolved stack traces. Uh, and if I cannot get it from BPF trace, I have to use other tools. And I did use other tools, uh, BCC tools, and it's one of the cases when all the BCC tools are still needed because of efficiency. Speaking about the efficiency, uh, a long time ago, several years ago, when I started to use BPF trace for real, uh, I made this experiment. I compared poor man's profiling based on GDB once per second with perf profiling with BPF trace based profiling 99 times per second. So I've collected stacks and counted stacks this way. Uh, the details are represented in a separate blog post. It was tested on a different box and on all the Fedora. Thing is, uh, absolute numbers do not matter. Uh, GDB-based PTPMP tracing had a notable impact, like twice uh, the decrease of queries per second. Perf has smaller impact, like 2%, and uh, BPF trace is even less, less than 1%. And here comes the power of aggregation at the cost of CPU use, but still uh, aggregation inside the kernel context. So I was counted and collecting information in the map, and I've outputted only counted information that is much smaller in size than raw perf data. And that fact uh, in that specific system mattered a lot. So a lot of time was spent on writing to disk. And here I write twice as uh, few data, so it comes with less impact. It may be the case for many test loads and for many tests as well. So BPF trace is a more lightweight profile than perf itself in some cases. So is BPF trace a universal answer to any uh, profiling needs? Uh, it's something to try. There are problems. Problems that are not yet resolved uh, and are essential is that you need root access. You, you've you already seen from, from, from my lame test that as soon as I forgot about pseudo, it does not work. But it's true for perf as well. So we need to care about performance impact. Uh, it's uh, uh, detailed in several items here. We should uh, do aggregation in kernel context if possible. We should output only histograms. We should not share a lot of information back to the user space unless uh, processing in kernel is a problem by itself, as we had with uh, our attempt to trace memory allocations, for example. So there is some technical problem like how to uh, add probe to some line inside the function. It's doable same way as in perf, basically. I had no big need to do it, so there is no blog post yet, but it's doable. Uh, mangled names, class members, and everything is a uh, largely resolved problem by now, but you may need access to headers, or you may have to define structures of the arguments you work with. So in case of uh, MariaDB, uh, it would be a huge problem to deal with thread internals, for example, if I need them, because it's a very complex structure, so I need its definition somehow, or I have to play some tricks. 
Uh, I need new Linux. Uh, these days, Linux kernel 5 are quite common already, so uh, the time for BPF trace has come. The binaries, if we speak about user probes, probes had to be built with a uh, no omit frame pointer, otherwise we will not be able to resolve addresses. In case of MariaDB, uh, this symbolic information, if we speak about packages provided by MariaDB Corporation or foundation it's separately provided so it has to be installed uh, it's still the case that bpf trace is so dynamic that ideally you have to build it from source but previous my version uh, stayed for like half a year it's just still more new that what ubuntu provides in package so it's a minor problem and major problem problem for me is that so far uh, while i use bpf trace to work for our developers to help them to show them the impact uh, and do the trace in their life like I had no chance yet to apply BPF trace for real support issues. Perf is applied, F trace was applied, BCC tools are in the process of applying right now. I have a huge hope. But BPF trace is a bit too new, so I had no chance to use it. So the main problem is getting a practical experience with it. So, uh, still it was already used. I made a quick check as a person who comes from bug verification team and is like a bit bugs oriented in everything MySQL and MariaDB. When I try to find out if BPF trace is used, I just curious bug, curious bug databases. And I rechecked this information initially obtained a few months ago for my previous related talk. It's still the same. So we have at least four different bug reports where MariaDB developers, uh, foundation developer, uh, great guy, Daniel Black, and one of our InnoDB developers, Eugene Kosov, used BPF trace to prove something or make some point or build flame graph and everything. And there are great uh, one-liners, simple examples of BPF trace used to prove the point uh, on what happens in the kernel and everything. So in MariaDB, BPF trace is already used internally. It's not the case in Oracle MySQL. It's not the case in Perform in Percona, unfortunately. So I would like these guys to also use BPF trace uh, more openly, at least, and write about it. I suggest BPF trace as a tool for MariaDB DBAs and not only developers because you can trace everything. You can check your uh, idea. Uh, is that function in the code executed? What was the statement executed? You can capture everything as soon as you know the code. And I'm the only one, and basically, I see no good reason for an open source database management system like MariaDB. Not to uh, use uh, dynamic tracing tools, and of them, BPF trace is the easiest. This is true, uh, at least unless every other line of the code uh, is instrumented by performance schema, uh, it's hardly going to happen for MariaDB at all, and this is not yet the case for MySQL as well. So BPF trace is easy, BPF trace is cool, BPF trace is kind of a future. Uh, the last but not the least, uh, when you find something that looks like a bug for you in MariaDB, report a bug to MariaDB. If you found some problems with uh, BPF trace, check known issues. It was the case for me just for last attempt to build it. I always forget to recursively update models, but there is an issue for that. So bugs databases are great sources of knowledge, and I ask you to please use them. Thank you for your attention. Use BPF Trace, use MariaDB. Cheers. All right, Valerie, thank you very much for the talk. This was very in-depth and you covered a lot of topics. So I'm uh, very excited about hearing of, of, about all of it. Uh, so the, the first thing that comes to mind is you mentioned that uh, uh, neither Percona nor um, uh, Oracle MySQL make use of BPF trace. Um, do you do you know why this this is, or um, do you have any ideas of how we could convince them to start using it more for the um, best of the ecosystem as a whole? Yes, I can try to imagine. First of all. Uh... Uh, Oracle MySQL is obsessed with and promoting performance schema. So they are implementing it and they are working on it for a reason. So when they identify uh, some known problem, they try to instrument the code for that. So in their case, it's clear. Percona should be more, uh, you know, uh, solution oriented. So they should not wait. And I believe they uh, actually use it based on uh, things people from Percona are talking about. I had not found the evidence in the bug reports, unlike with MariaDB. So uh, maybe internally uh, they have so great test cases coming to the uh, table for the developers, repeatable test cases, that they just do not need 
uh, lightweight tracing in production. They already have the result of somebody else did that for them. So uh, then probably developers uh, do not have much need for, for BBF trace for uh, their uh, job. Uh, another reason is still uh, the tool is new enough to use it uh, in a full capacity, you need Linux kernel 5. While the majority of production is probably still not there, just switching towards recent uh, versions of, of Debian, Ubuntu, and Red Hat, whatever. So, uh, and uh, the lack of information as well. Uh, and yet another reason probably is uh, that, you know, to, to use BPF trace, you need to know the source code. So unlike performance schema, it's not an official API. It may change with minor versions, function names may change. Nobody guarantees that uh, some functions stay for, for decades, but others may be introduced and there is no uh, official API. Uh, it used to be there in the form of D-trace probes, what I call USDT, user-defined static probes, but they were removed from MySQL 8 entirely. In MariaDB, they are, uh, at least can be enabled if one needs them, uh, but it's not the case already in MySQL land. So they either have to rethink this or maybe uh, eventually they will have a stable enough uh, set of functions so that everybody in, in community will know where things happen. It's like a pluggable uh, storage engine API, for example, it's stable enough. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the internals? They are changed a lot. So this is also theoretically, it's an obstacle for, for anything, any tool that does dynamic tracing. So that would be an obstacle for wide acceptance of the approach, no matter which tool is used, uh, but for BPF trace as well, long term. So we have but to work your, on it. Uh, and we should explain how, how it's useful. We should show examples. I myself has probably have probably to rewrite a dozen of my blog posts that were based on GDB in the past, so that I show how to use BPF trace in production in non-debug binaries without stopping things from happening to still get the insights of how MySQL works. So it's like a set of tasks for, for all of us. From your experience, what were the hotspots that you tend to always investigate in the server? I'm well, in, in many cases, uh, everything about weight, where the time is, most of the time is spent that we do not expect. We expect some things to work slow if we read from disk, okay. But what happens in concurrent environment? Why we are waiting? Why we have a normal performance and suddenly things go bad? So why? It can be one slow query and usually that's the case, for example, with InnoDB that uh, makes uh, history list length longer and slow things down just everything. In some cases, this is obvious. There are cases which are less obvious. So then we need profiling and even sampling based profiling may not be good enough. So then we need tracing. And then there is a problem how to get a reproducible uh, test case based on limited time we can really spend tracing in production. So that's a huge problem and huge problem for me as a support engineer, because you know developers would prefer to get a repeatable test case, a clear understanding where things are coming from, what they are waiting on, and studying that for you, if it's not repeatable, is not something they can and should do efficiently. They should better spend their time elsewhere on a problem that are easy to reproduce, can be presented with a test case, or that will be included into regression test case unit and everything. So without this, it's a huge and complex task. So that's what, what I have to study. Uh, there are surely simple cases. So BPF trace specifically can be a good replacement for S trace we all use just to understand what, what specific thing we may be waiting for at startup. Mm -hmm. So these are yeah. simple tasks. Just more lightweight, another thing is just uh, whole system profiling, like why everything is slow, how to prove that it's not MariaDB specifically, but maybe lack of total system memory or some load coming from elsewhere, some uh, bad device, for example, 
you have to, to show this with specific yeah, uh, I understand. And, uh, and it can be uh, easily done with BPF trace as well because it just has has the sampling profiler like embedded there, among other things. And it can be enabled conditionally and very specifically. You can do it for specific thread if you're interested. You can see where the whole system spends time or where the specific thread is spending. Yeah, I, I found it quite interesting that you can. Uh trace a dynamic library without actually starting the Yeah, uh, well, you program. do not run it in any specific environment. Like to trace uh, memory allocations, you do not need to, to have it instrumented for everything, for every problem. You mm -hmm. should not start your MySQL D or MariaDB D process in specific environment. You just may have it running and still you can find out where things come from. That's very convenient and probably very unusual. You know, because for developers with a with, uh, uh, quite well understood pro problem, they just have everything in their debug binaries with all the instruments with GDB. They can get uh, all that GDB attached when needed to their test case and just see the problem. The real uh, hard part is to isolate it to this stage. And this is where the tools may help. It's not the only way. Dynamic tracing is not the only way. There are other ways, but it uh, it's targeted to solve a very specific subset of hard to reproduce production problems. And that's why it's attractive for me. Yeah, it feels like developers should actually learn to use this tool more, not just yes, support yes. It should come for, for for me. It's clear that it should come from developers who do not have the problem with knowing which function to compose this or that part of the server. They have all the proper expectations. They know what to trace. They know what to suspect. They just need some way to get the evidence to, to test their theory quickly and to get a hard proof that really something is called or not called or never called or called less often or more often than expected and get the stack trace whenever they need. So yep. like, like, like they can do in GDB, but without all the overhead of running the system under GDB, which uh, means different timing for threads and in multi-threaded environment, totally different sequence of events. Yep, and, th and then it gets very hard to reproduce the yes. exact problem. Exactly. Yeah. So if somebody can reproduce something easily in production, then dynamic tracing is the tool you need because you can just insert your probe, insert your recording to the very specific place you suspect and see if it happens or not. It's not even sampling, it's just tracing exactly where it's needed and when it's needed. And then you can disable it and let people work without restarts, without on all, the, all the performance impact negative one that may happen. Even if, if you just attach GDB once and spend too much time there, everything is stopped at this point. Yeah, yeah, and that's, uh, well, I, I think that's actually that the best. More uh, than one, so you should be very specific. You need to know what you are doing. If you suggest GDB and, uh, well, uh, I am very uh, not excited, but uh, positive that uh, BPF trace and dynamic tracing will work just because we already have customers who who really attach GDB to live servers and execute comments we suggest to them. So it's not like a, something not acceptable now at this stage. It took maybe five years to, to, to get there, but many are already there and it will be a relief for them. A lightweight tool that allows to get the same and more actually. So well, as soon as Linux kernel 5 will become a, a typical environment, I hope it will be in this next year, really soon. Uh, I expect uh, huge progress with everything related to dynamic tracing, and specifically BCC tools and BPF trace as the quickest way uh, to do something that is not covered by generic and already written tools, which are not MariaDB specific. I think that's a, a very good, uh... Uh, uh, thing to look forward to. And I think it's the, one of the key takeaways here that uh, BPF trace is effectively a, 
like an oscilloscope for your uh, kernel. Ah, basically. you just yeah, you just attach live, and you change nothing in your schema, but you can still observe some things happen. You change almost nothing. Not not, not yeah. really. You still have another secure. Uh, but you know its impact, you can measure it, and you know the impedance and whatever uh, details of your oscilloscope in general, so you can understand the impact of your observation to the entire system. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Valery, for all this information. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about BPF Trace in the future. Hopefully, we get it used by uh, both support engineers and developers. And thank you very much for spreading your knowledge to all of us. Yeah, I should do it more often and better. But yeah, thank you for attention to this topic, which is like not very obvious for, for the community in general. Why should we discuss some Linux specific tool, not database related at all, just because it, it's what? suggested by some guys. So the more uh, people will hear about that, uh, the more uh, they try to use it, the better I think we will understand the limitations as well, which also present. It's not an absolutely answer, absolute answer to every question. Uh, no, it's not the only tool that will be ever needed by the DBA in the long run, no. It's a bit more complex than that, but it's a really powerful and useful tool. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you very much, Valery. And uh, let's uh, keep inter interacting with the audience on Zulip channel. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your efforts to organize this event. Bye. Bye. -bye. So that's it. That was the MariaDB ServerFest 2021 edition. Thank you for watching. Allow me to come with a couple of observations and a couple of questions for you, you the attendee. Content-wise, I want to thank our great presenters for sharing their insights with our various audiences, developers and managers, DBAs and DevOps. Monty hopefully opened some managerial eyes to migrating off closed source databases to MariaDB. Peter Zaitsev compared MariaDB 10.6 and a bit of 10.7 to MySQL 8, and in the Q&A session said that MariaDB should free itself from comparing itself just to MySQL, or even Postgres, Mongo, or Oracle, and just concentrate on solving user needs in a simple way. From Marco Mackela, and Krunal Bauskar, we see that low-level improvements are making their way into the server and that improvements are being made. When Steve Shaw of Intel talked about HammerDB, we learned about the importance of planning benchmarking and how HammerDB is a great way to exercise and measure benchmarks. Having a community developed cross-based database benchmarking tool presents opportunities for ensuring that as a community we continue to remain competitive. There were so many other interesting talks by Valery Kravchuk on troubleshooting, Federico Razzoli, Sergei Petrunia, Richard Bensley, Dan Demeter, Alan Cueva, Seth Shelnut, Jorge Torres. Thank you to these presenters and thanks also to the interviewers who asked tricky questions. Which brings me to my question to you. What's your opinion on Q&A sessions versus the presentations? We were quite happy ourselves with the interactivity and energy level of the Q&A session and plan on putting more emphasis on them. Do you agree? Can you share your opinion with us, please, with foundation at mariadb.org? Also, please share your suggestions on new topics for future server manifests or even individual presentations you would like to see. Give us feedback. And we want to make it easy for you to give feedback as opposed to merely making it easy for us to receive it. So hence, you just drop us an email 
at foundation at mariadb.org. Stay tuned for the next MariaDB server, Minifest, later this year, and do remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more visual updates by MariaDB Foundation. Thanks for attending MariaDB Server Fest 2021, and see you next time. Bye!